from Northport High School. The Tigers, who are looking for their third straight win, oppose a first-place Statesman club coming off their first loss in 15 games. It's next on Cablevision's Long Island Sports Network. So, about ready for the kickoff here between Northport and Sachem. The Tigers of Northport with a record of two wins and four losses. It'll be Frank Bordanello kicking off. He's number 80. Bordanello is six foot, 168 pound senior. Likes to squib kick it. Three men back deep for Sachem as they're dressed in the white uniforms and the black and gold for Northport. Here's the squib kick. Bounces around, it's fielded down there at the 15-yard line. Picked up by Don Bauer. Bauer breaks, tackles Bauer out the open. He's across midfield stripe. He's down to the 30, looks around. He'll be curtailed, finally brought down. A fine return by Bauer as he brings it back. Deep into Northport territory on the opening kickoff. So it'll be first down and 10 for Sachem in a good position here to really set up shop, Emerson Boozer. And this is a good way to start the ball game off. But not a good one for Northport. As you'll see, number 23, Don Bauer, takes it and gets good blocking straight up the left side of the field. Looks as though he'd go all the way, but you'll know number 12. You'll notice number 12, Jenkins, comes in and saves the day from a touchdown. First down and 10 for Sachem is that they have it at the Northport 24-yard line. And a penalty will also be assessed to move it deeper into territory. A big one. Takes it down inside the 10-yard line, and that's what you call adding a little cream to the cake on this one. After such a fine return of 55 yards by Bauer, face mask call gives a first down for Sachem at the Northport 8-yard line. Make that the 12 they mark it at. First down and 10 from the 12. The quarterback is Mike Johnson. He gives it to Body. We said he is the franchise. Mike Body, 6'1", 180-pound senior. Body averaging seven yards per carry is stopped by Dan Campbell, the other man we featured in the pregame show. The right tackle, six foot, 210 senior. There you see the officials, Bob Safranek is the referee. John Campbell, the umpire. Mo Maloney, the head linesman, and the field judge is Ted Pollock. So it's second down and four to go from the six yard line. Sachin with the football. Body up the middle. He stopped shy of the goal line. Didn't take him long to get on track, did it, Em? No, it didn't. Uh, the, big, the big return by Bowers, then the ensuing face mask penalty puts him well inside the 10 yard line, and the first carry by Don Leo, number 34, now Mike Body. Uh, we've got the ball resting approximately around the two-yard line. Mike Bonney on the year has carried the ball 98 times for 687 yards, eight touchdowns. He had a big day against Brentwood when he carried for 145 yards and two TDs. Body is 6'1", 180 pounds senior. As a junior, he rushed for 1,375 yards in eight games. The coach, Fred Fusaro, calls him the franchise, and well he is because he's certainly a candidate for all county. First and goal to go for Sachem as they knock at the door. Body is 31, 35. The other running back is Don Leo. Full house backfield. Call again to Body. He keeps driving, gets in the end zone. So in three plays in scrimmage, very quickly, Sachem has gone in front by a score of six to nothing. Well, this is what Northport didn't want to happen. They needed to get on the board first, the way we figured out, Emerson, for them to really uh, be very highly... ...next two ball games. Absolutely. Uh, they cannot allow this six points opening drive to uh, take their confidence or their steam or their full week's work uh, on six points. They've got to be ready for it. The point is good, as we see. Sachem a 7-0 lead. We take another look here. You'll see uh, number 31, Mike Body. He's going behind the likes of uh, Vinny Yakino and Mark Wojciechowski. Up for six points. The big guy, Mike Body. So a drive that was set up on a 55-yard kickoff return by Bauer. Three plays, 12 yards. Body in from two yards out. Now it's Northport's turn. And we, I think we can look for Northport after talking to their coach, Bob Macaluso. He said, 
we cannot overpower the station defensive line. This is where we thought the big key in this football game would be. Northport's offensive line against Sachem's defensive line. He's going to try, is Macaluso, to manipulate the Sachem defensive line. Hey, he's going to have to manipulate it in as much fast as he po finesse rather as he possibly can because uh, number 74, Mark uh, Bozierowski, is the anchor of that five-man line along with Butel, Sullivan, Weinstein, and Fitzpatrick. They're awfully tough. Sato will kick it off. The return man for Northport is Craig Clare. He's number 33 in the middle, but it does not go to Clare. Taken on the wing instead by number 82. He tries to take people with him as he comes across the 30-yard line. Running with the football is McNeary. 5'11", 165-pound junior, and so Northport will have pretty good field position for their first offensive series of It's a good way to open up there. Uh, they're at their own, I'd say, 39-yard line, so that's not bad field position. Not as good as Sachem had in the opening kickoff, but I'll take this any day. Quarterback for Northport is number 44, Keith Vanderbur. The running backs, the tailback is Craig Clare, 33, and the fullback is James McCabe. And they like to run for the I formation. Here's one of their favorite plays, right-handed pass to throwing from the left side as Vanderbur could not connect with that as he went to Steve Gatlin. Covering the play was Jack Johnson, the safety man for Sachin. It's what we thought here at... Uh, Northport opening up with roll-type play-action play. Vandenberger got outside in good form, just could not make the connection. Vandenberger was a good passer last year, but had a lot of trouble the first few games of the season making connections. His technique was off. He lost some confidence. But the last two games, which Northport won, he started to throw the football a lot better. And we see the slot formation, which they like to run from strong left side out of the eye. Both uh, flankers to the left. There's the option play. Running up the middle. James McCabe goes up the middle, and Adam Weinstein and Gary Wojciechowski. Wojciechowski is a nose guard. He's a junior, 6'1", 230, makes the stop. Look down in the middle of your screen there. You'll see number 74 as we get in. Number 28, James McCabe carries in. But the, the stiff front of Weinstein, Wojciechowski, and Butel, that's the heart of that defensive front. So the ball out to the 43-yard line. And here they come with a big third down play, third and six, Em. Gonna have to throw the ball here. Vertebrae has completed 42% of his passes this season as 81 comes in motion. Again to the left. Getting some pressure. Incomplete. So he's 0 for 2 throwing the football today. Coming there again was Jack Johnson, the safety man. And so on their first series, Northport is unable to move the football and they will have to give it up. Early in the ball game, St. Tim in front 7-0. 936 left in the first period. Double safeties. Here's Bonero's punt. Good punt. Chasing back inside the 15-yard line. It is taken there, making no room that time is Mike Matlock. Unlike the kickoff, where they brought him back for 55 yards, this time good coverage for Northport. And that's something Northport prides himself on ever since their special teams doing the job. But they certainly didn't do the job on that kickoff to start this football game. No, the big breakdown, opening kickoff, Byra taking it some 50-some yards, and uh, Northport just didn't get down. I think because the ball was not kicked down the center, kicked off to the right a little bit, and uh, Byra was able to get it upfield. So Sachin with the football, Mike Johnson is the quarterback. And again, going back to the deep man, Mike Body. But that time, the defense reacted well to make the stop. Body found no running room as Dave A. Busher, the nose guard, 6'1", 230, a senior. Key man in this football game from Northport is that nose guard. You look at number 31 here. He's uh, the bread and butter guy for Station. Number 31, Mike Body. But the guy that likes of Greg Pollard, uh, Ain, Ain Bisher, and uh, Campbell, they were able to make the stop. There you see the coach of Northport, Robert Macaluso. In his eighth season as the head coach here. He's back to throw is Johnson having trouble and a very nice defensive play coming across to make the stop for Northport when they got good defensive pressure was Dan Campbell, their standout defensive tackle. Six foot, 210, a senior. Came in this game with 32 tackles, a one fumble recovery, a two-year starter. 
Watch again. This is the guy we, we featured in our, in our pregame show here. Number 51, Dan Campbell. He's their top uh, pass rusher. He's just an outstanding athlete. So Six now, Sachem faced with a third and nine situation. There's that play action that they like to go it over the linebackers, and it works as they pick on the linebackers of Northport as they hit the big man over the middle, Mike Pasatino, 6'1", 200-pounder. Frank Fortanero, who's made five pass interceptions for Northport, is the man who makes the stop, but the key on that one, first down for Sachin. We take another look here in our replay. You'll see number 11, Mike Johnson rolls away, looking for number 38 coming underneath. Mike Pasantino makes the big reception, bulls his way for extra yardage, defended by number 80, Bolonero. 21-yard pickup in the play. First down and 10 now for Sachin from their own 43-yard line. Again for that eye formation. There's that rollout again. They pick up the linebackers. A flag on the play as again the pass goes to Mike Pasatino. 6-1, 200-pounder. Pasatino with the reception, and then to make the tackle is Fred Musamichi. 5'8", 145-pound senior. But, as we said, there was a flag dropped on it. So, Sachem loses that pickup on a holding penalty. Northport is going to have to defend a little bit better, Ed, because uh, of the last two plays we've seen, number 38, 38 Pasantino, uh, worked his way to the outside from his tight end slot, and the linebackers were nowhere near, not even a corner. No, and that was the spot that uh, Coach uh, Fusaro at Sachem had said to us before the game he thought he could do some business as picking on their linebackers with play-action passes, and certainly they have done that early on this football game. So yeah, the holding penalty puts them back to their 28-yard line, and they've got themselves in a big jam on first down. First and 25. Body, who uh, is the man, that time does not find running room. It's good reaction. Northport defense, uh, interior line, moving well, pursuing well to the ball. And the man who does it so well, who did it so well against West Islip in that victory, was Peter Miller. As uh, Mike Johnson goes back and hands off to Mike Body, number 34 off to the right of your screen there. Gets in, plays the play very well, and uh, stops uh, Body before he can get rolling. So far, and they've done the job on Body. He has only gained 14 yards and five carries. On the field, we said Fred Fusero, who has had five league championships and four conference championships while at Sachem. Again, the play action. We're seeing plenty of that all day to throw. And again, he finds the receiver over the middle. A very fine catch, and that sets up a good reception by Chris Casco, making the stop. The linebacker, Gavin Byrne, 5'9", 165, a senior. But the ball comes out to the 48-yard line for Sachin. And this is basically the same kind of action. Number 26, Chris Casco moves away and gets in front of Mike Johnson underneath the linebackers. As you'll see, number 40 there in the trail position, uh, Brian Gavin, Gavin uh, Byrne, rather, uh, to make the tackle. So now they're faced with a third and five for Sachem on their second possession of this football game. 6.24 left in the first period. Sachem leading north for it 7-0. And we've got a timeout. And it's called by Sachem, the first of the three they're allotted for each half. This copyrighted telecast is intended solely for the private, non-commercial use of our audience. Any publication, reproduction, retransmission, or other use of the pictures, descriptions, and accounts of this game without the express written consent of Cablevision is prohibited. There they are, Sachem on top as they're going for their sixth league title overall and their fifth in the last seven years under their coach Fred Fusaro. West Islip's in on the hunt. Should Sachem lose today and West Islip win because they beat Sachem, then uh, West Islip would be seated number one in the playoffs. You can bet that Coach uh, Fusaro has gotten his ball players well aware that this is a must ball game into a hot box here. It's homecoming here at Northport, so you've got to play ball. There you see the uh, teams that will not make the playoffs. First four teams at each league make the conference playoffs, and uh, there are three playoff games to determine a conference winner. Both coaches tell me before the game, they said they would prefer a county championship rather than a conference. I think a, a county setup would give you a truer champion, uh, getting, to, getting a better look at the stronger clubs in the county. Third down and five for Sachin. Johnson again, throwing a lot here early in the ball game. And again, he makes a good connection. 
Dancing inside the 50 to the 40, down to the 35-yard line is Chris Gascon, who has his second reception of this football game. So for St. Chip, a first down, Emerson. This is a tough play here for Northport. As you see, number 11, Mike Johnson delivers well to number 26, Chris Gascon. And once as he catches the football, he makes a beautiful cut back inside and looks as though for a moment here, he'd go for six. And now Mr. Johnson is three of three in this ball game for 50 yards passing. This is Body. He likes to bounce it to the outside, but he can come back to the inside, but he's not finding much running room so far in the early going. As obviously, at this point, Northport's defense is king on trying to stop Body, which is opening up the passing game. I think that's exactly what's happening yet. Uh, they are very much concerned about number 31, as you see in our replay here, Mike Body. He just could not find running room to the outside. The Northport defense stiffened as they have to against number 31 because he is an outstanding runner. Second down and seven three yard pickup for Body. James McKay, the left dead made the stop on that last play. There's a little running room as he drives off the left side. Again, Michael Botti carried the ball. A Division I football player, I think, at the college level as both Maryland and Penn State would like to give him a full scholarship. And it was Jeff Bracey, the uh, Tiger back, the Rover back, the man who plays linebacker and defensive back and shift around depending upon the situation. He was the man who made the stop. Strong run here, but uh, number 22, the Tiger back, as Ed mentioned, comes in to make the hit. So a first down again for Sachem as they keep it rolling, picking up seven yards in the player's body. First and ten for Sachem at Northport's 25-yard line. We have five minutes and six seconds left in the first period. Sachem leading by a score of seven nothing over Northport. Once again, the big guy bottom fighting a little running room to his body as he cracks it inside the 25-yard line and across the 20. As they're finding some straights off the left side there, Emerson on their running attack now. Things are getting pretty tight here. They're coming right back to number 31, Mike, Bo Mike uh, Body, and uh, number 45, the, the little guy, 5'8", 145 pounds, Fred Musumisi, comes up with a big tackle. So a pickup of seven yards, and the play moves it down to the 18-yard line, where it is second down and four to go. Sachem again on the move. Again, it's Body, but a nice defensive play. That time, the man who was so active against West Iceland, Peter Miller, the six foot, 170 pound junior, leads the team in tackles with 42. He's done an outstanding job. He's a good athlete. He's quick, an honor student, and a baseball player. Did a good job on that play. And our replay here, watch to the right of your screen here. You'll see number 34, Peter Miller, shedding a block just about here. Miller is being blocked, but he gets a hand on number 31, Mike Body, to bring him down. So a loss of one yard in the play makes it third down and five. Body now has carried the ball nine times for 30 yards, well under his average of some seven yards per carry. And we get another timeout. Sachem calling their second timeout as the quarterback and uh, Body both wave to the sidelines, the coaches. So it has been, so far, all Sachem. They took the opening kickoff. Got themselves in marvelous field position. You do that when you return a kickoff 55 yards, as Don Bauer did down to the 24-yard line. And uh, a penalty for a face mask, put it down to the 12. Three plays later, it was body bouncing in from two yards out. What Sachem is doing right now, uh, Ed, uh, after receiving that punt, they have gotten the ball and put together a, a fairly good drive at this moment. Uh, the ball is now resting somewhere around the 20-yard line. And uh, it would be interesting to see if Sachem can go on from here to push in for another six. If they do at that point, it's going to be a long afternoon for Northport. Yes, because Northport has had trouble scoring this year. That's been their, their weakness. Their defense has been their strength. But the problem was early on when they lost the first four games for Northport, their defense was out in the field 75% of a game. Yes, uh, Coach uh, Mascaluso thinks that this club is just starting to come around. Uh, took the most of the season to get their feet on the ground. So third and five for Sachem down at the Northport 19-yard line. This is Johnson, who has hit his first three passes. He's now hit on four in a row. Whoops, he coughed it up. Bob Ventura had it, but a good hit by Jeff Bracey. Bracey only 5'7", 150, a senior, but uh, he hits hard. He's a hard-nosed kid, throws his body around. He has 36 tackles, as they say about Jeff Bracey. He weighs 150, but he plays with a heart of 210 pounds. And that's what you need as we watch in our replay. Number 11, Johnson goes out. He finds a receiver, but uh, watch number 22, Jeff Bracey comes up, delivers a blow. The ball pops away, and uh, a tough break for Northport. They weren't able to recover the fumble. So for Northport, it's now a fourth down and five situation. Rather, for Sachem, fourth and five at the Northport 19-yard line. They will go for it from the I formation. Body is the deep back. 
Johnson looking for room. Still looking. Good pursuit, but poor tackling. He finally throws it, and it's knocked down. Well, the good thing for Northport was that they had terrific pursuit. The bad thing for a moment was they didn't, couldn't make the tackle. Sloppy tackling, but they get the football back. Outstanding play by number 81, Kerry McGowan, and just a super play by number 11, Mike Johnson, for getting rid of the football because he almost lost it, yet there was almost an interception. As we see again, watch uh, Johnson. He goes out, cannot find a man open downfield. Now he takes off. You see number 65. Try, trying to bring him down, but uh, is not able to. Now um, Johnson wings the ball away. Number 81, Kieran McGowan, barely comes up with the interception. So Northport holds and gets a first down and 10 situation at their own 19 with Keith Vertebra. Number 44 is their quarterback. Finding some running room and breaking tackles with the football and running very nicely, picking up yardage. Number four to get the first down. Jack Johnson was the man who finally brought him down as Gavin Byrne, 5'9", 165 senior, who is the backup fullback, makes some good yardage, a tough runner. Outstanding play right here by number 40, Gavin Burns. He pops into that secondary before anybody knows he has a football, and this guy was off for the races if they don't come up with a tackle. 12-yard pickup, so Northport has its first down of the afternoon to the 31-yard line. First down and 10. Now they've got James McKay back in at fullback. Vandenberg throwing one deep. Oh, he slowed down. He, that was a perfect pass. John Farrell was the defensive man on the play, trying to defend against the pass, but the intended receiver, number 12 for Northport, Eric Jenkins, slowed up when he had a chance to make the catch. Eric uh, looked back and uh, just did not get the step. I think a high school player sometimes have a tendency to do that, not uh, knowing how, how strongly the ball has been thrown, and he kind of missed his steps a little bit by slowing, slowing up. Had he kept in stride, the ball would have been right there on target from number 44, uh, Vertiberger. Well, for Northport, half the bad news was the pass was incompleted. The other half of the bad news is they're being penalized back to their 16-yard line, a 15-yard penalty. So they'll have to go to work with second and 25 and a holding penalty. Puts him in bad position as Vertibar, the incompletion, made him 0 for 3. Of course, that's nullified by the fact that the Sachem team took the penalty. It sets up a first and 25 situation for Northport at their own 16-yard line. Tough situation. McCabe and Claire, 33 other running backs. Put given there to James McCabe, but there wasn't much running room as he tried to go inside, but... Very tough situation as Scott Crean makes a stop, the linebacker for Sachem. Tough situation for Northport because they are trailing in this football game. First and 25 deep in your own territory. And when you don't have that much confidence in your offense, you really don't want to air it out. Well, right now, uh, the Northport's defense has uh, done an outstanding job, I think, thus far. Uh, the first play was almost not so much of a gimme, but a breakdown in special teams. We'll, we'll continue after this play. So it's second down and 23 now for Northport. And there's the draw play as the tailback, Craig Clare, who's averaging a little more than four yards per carry. A shifty runner tries to go up the middle, but the man he runs into is the heart of the Sachem defense in the middle, Gary Wojciechowski, 6'1", 230. Tough, aggressive man, uses his hands well. He's the guy who can stuff the run up the middle. Brings up a third down situation. Emerson, to, to pursue what you were saying in the previous play. Well, the, the, the defense for Northport has, uh, I, I think, done an outstanding job. They were able to stop Station from scoring on the last series. Now it's up to the offense. The defense has done what they had to do, and that's not allowed the six points. Now the offense has to move the football. Third down and 22 as they go into a flanker slot formation to the left side out of the I formation. Here's that roll back to the left. Dropped. Vertiver threw a good pass rolling to the left side out of the hands of his receiver, but he could not hold on to it. Now, this is a tough play here. As you'll see, number 44, Keith Vertiberger, gets out, throwing the ball to number 81, uh, Karen McGowan. McGowan just cannot hold on to the football. Jack Johnson was the man defending on the play. That sets Frank Bordinello back to kick. He's averaging 36 and a half yards per try on his punt, and his average will go down with that one unless he gets a very favorable bounce, which he does. 
But, again, good field position for St. Jameer Emerson as they lead the ball game 7-0 over Northport with 105 left in the first period. The ball goes out right at the 50-yard line, Ed, and this is going to make it pretty tough. St. Jameer is a good offensive unit, and you don't want them starting down your throat already at midfield. So a 33-yard punt. But St. Jim setting up shop in a very good situation. First down and 10 from midfield. Mike Johnson has been their quarterback. Uh, he can throw, he can option, can do a lot of things. Ken Johnson, good athlete, good spread out thrower. For Sachin, averaging oh, about 56% of the season is pass completions. For the I formation, again, the deep man is body. And again, they send the man in the motion. A lot of times I like to run to the motion side, which body is doing right now. And he just has to power his way ahead because there's not too much blocking on that side as he picks up four yards in the play and into Northport territory to the 46-yard line of Northport. Four, we take it again, number 31. This is the workhorse. You'll see uh, him get outside. Not really getting enough room to run because Sachem is really shutting that thing down outside. Uh, body has a lead back in Leo, Dan Leo, but uh, they just can't get through. Second down and six situation now for Sachem. The North Fort 46. Nice faking again, the play action, which has worked very well in this football game. Under throw, but coming back to make the reception very nicely. The man who has caused him trouble all day in this ball game, as far as the passing game is concerned, Mike Pasatino with another reception. Pasatino came into the ball game. Well, he had a big game against uh, Lindenhurst. He had four receptions in that game. And that puts... Sachem in excellent field position again as they take it down to the Northport 26-yard line. Pick up a 20 yards in that play, Emerson. I think uh, on that side, number 81, Karen McGowan, turned his back somewhat, uh, looking back into the sun, and didn't know really where the football was. I thought, I think he thought the ball was being thrown much deeper, so he turned to run, to be deep, and uh, the ball was underthrown somewhat. Pasatino now has three receptions for 46 yards in this football game. He is one of the players that they consider an all-county candidate. He is a veteran from last year, one of the three veteran offensive players that Sachem had back on this football team. And uh, Mike uh, is having a, a fine afternoon right now, and, and if uh, Northport doesn't really tighten up, we'll see him in the end zone. So first down and 10 for Sachem. Body that time looked like he had a little bit of trouble either hanging on the football or knowing where to go because that play did not go anywhere to speak of. And then to make the stop, was Dave A. Busher, the 6'1", 230-pound senior nose guard. It looked as though uh, Body had trouble handling the football at that moment. All right, first period is history here at Northport Tigers Stadium with the score of the St. Chimaro 7, the Northport Tigers nothing. And you're watching this game on the Long Island Sports Network. This is Ed Engels along with Emerson Boozer and Carl Warner. We are at Northport Tiger Stadium where St. Jim is on the move, leading by a score of 7 to nothing as they have the ball at the 24-yard line of the Northport Tigers. Back to throw is Johnson. The long one. He's got Pasatino open, but just a little bit too far. Threw it out of bounds. Even if he caught the pass, he would have been out of bounds. Mike Pasatino falls incomplete. So Johnson now is 4 of 7 on the day throwing the football. Pretty good coverage, too, by the Northport Tigers because number 45, Fred Musumisa, Musumisa was back there uh, covering on number 81, I think it was. Was it Caputo on the last play? Uh, an 81 for Northport defensively. That is their uh, left cornerback, Hinn and McGowan. No, no, no. We're talking about uh, a station, the intended receiver in the last play. Oh, that's Pasatino. He's uh, Musumisa. Yeah. Pasatino's caught three passes in the football game. That one he could not get to inbounds. All right, a second down and ten now for Sachin. Again, Johnson with the play action. It's worked successfully at picking on the linebackers. Now he's going to run with the football. Gets across the 20-yard line, drives down inside the 16-yard line. A good play by Johnson, who looked like he was going to get nothing out of that play at all, but picked up eight yards before he was stopped in there. After getting a very good block by Vinny Akano, one of the captains, and Gavin Byrne, number 40, the linebacker made the stop. Right now, uh, number 11, Mike Johnson, looks downfield, and, and just about everybody is covered. You watch him scramble to the outside. An outstanding block there by number 34, Don Leo, giving uh, Johnson a little more room to work to the outside. But we've got a penalty in. See a Sachem coach enjoying himself at this point because his team is leading and uh, he doesn't look too cold, though it's a windy day. Clipping call coming against uh, Sachem. We'll back them up. 
And a big break for Northport. As that back sates him all the way back to the Northport 48-yard line. That might have been the big block that uh, I was mentioning from number 34, uh, Don Leo, and trying to free uh, Mike Johnson. Leo, a fine blocker, but uh, paid the price for that one for a clip. This sets up a tough situation for Sachin because they've got a third down situation now. And a ton of yardage to go here. They started from the 24-yard line, so they're now faced with a third down and 35. Johnson wanting to throw. Down the middle and broken up again. He went for Pasatino, but that time Pasatino got good coverage over the middle. And the defensive back, Frank Bordenero, who has five pass interceptions. As we told you in the first period, he has been really the excellent pass defender on this club. He makes, he covers for everybody else in the secondary. Yes, uh, uh, just a good, good play here as you watch Johnson delivers downfield. Well, watch number 80, uh, Frank Bordenero, come up almost with the interception here. Bordenero is a great signal caller. As far as defense is concerned, covers for his teammates well, makes the big play, and now back as a single safety is Craig Eclair, and Mike Pasatino will do the punting for Sachin. There is a flag. Whistles blow. We're going to do it all over again. <laughs> till we get it right. And you know, sometimes when the guys, uh, they get down, they get into that stance, and they want to come off that ball as soon as it's snapped, and uh, you, you reach back at all your energy, get off the ball, there the whistles, start all over again. Tough game for that reason. You gotta psych yourself up to do a lot of things with a lot of energy, and then sometimes it's all for naught, and somebody says, wait a minute, that's too much energy. <laughs> Use that much energy, it's gonna cost us in penalties. That's right, the last play was a uh, legal procedure, or illegal motion by uh, the Northport uh, Arrows here. Are they called the Arrows? Sachem Arrows, yeah. Sachem, I mean Sachem Arrows, Northport Tigers. Well, they started, you know, they took this ball down to the Northport 24-yard line, but now they're back to their own 46, so the Sachem Arrows, and again, Mike Pasatino will try to punt it away. 11-18 left in the first half, Sachem 7, Northport nothing. Again, the whistle. This is quite a rehearsal. They better take this play to New Haven and try to work it out. Yeah, at that time, uh, Northport was faking, faking uh, a blitz or a charge, and number 28, James McCabe, He's one of the captains, too, got a little bit uh, over-anxious. Stepped beyond the point of the line of scrimmage. Another five yards the other way. So now Sachin back in North Port's territory like a soap opera. He goes back and forth, a cliffhanger. You know, usually it takes a soap opera about a week to develop the plot or a subplot. That's what's happening on this punt. Not taking as much more than about uh, maybe an hour here to get this punt off. <laughs> so Pasatino, the 6'1", 200-pound junior, will try again. McCabe came through, tried to block it, but could not. The ball takes a good bounce, hits up on Clare. He's going to have to pick it up inside the five-yard line. Doesn't get back very far as he crosses the 15-yard line, where he's brought down at that point. So Northport will not have it in good field position. Making the stop was Dave Arno, 5'11", 175 junior for Sachem. Now, Northport with the football for the third time today. They have uh, yet to move into Sachem side of the lawn in this football game. First and 10 for the Tigers at their own 16-yard line. McCabe is the fullback. Claire is the tailback. He's the deep back. McCabe, the man up close. Vanderbilt now pitches back to Claire, but not much running room as he tried to turn the right side. But the safety man, Jack Johnson, and Kelly Smith, the two-year starter, Smith, who is uh, the guts of the Sachem defense, he hits a ton, was there to play that run well, which is his specialty, stopping the run. This is the option coming down as uh, Werderberger moves down, pitches out to Craig Clare, and watch the number nine, uh, John Piero, and number 80, Jack Johnson. They, they just come up and wipe things out here. So a second down and eight situation from the Northport 18-yard line. Tigers try to get it moving. They go three wide receivers on this set. But going nowhere. That's a play that was stopped very nicely by Gary Butel. He's 6'3", 230. He's only a sophomore, Butel. He's only 14 years old, and he's gained 15 pounds since the summer. He's a real good future in football. Come on, Ed. He's only 14. That's what they tell me. 
That's what they tell me. There's a look at uh, Mascaluso. I'm sure he's not uh, feeling too well at this point unless his offense can get on the roll. Third and seven now for Northport. The up back is McCabe, the fullback. He is their bread and butter runner. The deep back is Claire, the tailback. Vandenberg tried to throw the football in a little bit of distress. Threw it when he should not have thrown it. Intercepted by Sachem. The man who made the interception was Kelly Smith, the 5'10", 155-pound senior, as Vandenberg made the mistake of throwing under pressure. We'll take another look at this, Ed. Uh, Vertebra gets outside. He's got a man open going up on the up, but just did not get the ball downfield with enough steam. He had Karen McGowan in the lead, but just under through the football, and number 36, Kelly Smith, comes up with the interception. Big difference in this football game other than the scoreboard is the fact that Sachem has had uh, excellent field position. Northport has not. Sachem goes to work here at the Northport 37-yard line, first down and 10. This is Body. Again, they're stacking that play pretty well on the inside. The uh, Northport defense doing a good job of stopping the inside off tackle plays by Body. Body now has carried the ball 12 times for 38 yards. So for a man averaging seven yards a game, Everson, he's averaging just a bit more than three in this game. And so Northport has done that well to stop him. Northport knew, uh, knew coming into the ball game that they didn't have to stop number 31. But what they haven't been able to do so far is to contain Sachem's passing game. Only a two-yard pickup as Body again. This time he gets across the 30-yard line, off the left side again. That's the strength of the Sachem offense, their left side. Running behind Adam Weinstein, 6'0", 240-pound senior. And Vinny Yacono, 5'11", 192-pound senior. And the man make the tackle was John Bassinet. This is a, just a pitch back to number 31, Mike Body, and he turns it up with all the steam he's got. And the big guy picks up a good, uh, I'd say, five yards on that carry. So they're now faced with a third and three situation for Sachem at the Northport 30-yard line. A little different formation, full house. But the same man carrying has been carrying most of the time is Body, but I don't think Mr. Michael Body got the first down on that one. It's going to be tough. That was just a super play by number 75, Ed, Greg Pollard. He came across that uh, offensive line right now, is able to get a hand on number 31, Mike Body. Just an outstanding play. Pollard is a veteran from last year, 5'11", 185 pounds, senior, very solid, consistent football player. And there you see Body officially with 14 carries for 44 yards in this football game. So we're now with a fourth down situation in two from the Northport 29-yard line. Here's Body again. And again, he is stopped. He does not get the first down as again the right side of the Northport defense led by their veteran, Dan Campbell, the six-foot, 210-pound senior, makes a big stop. Now, this is a big play here. Watch again. Watch number 51. He comes into play. There he is right there. Bingo comes in and hits the big back. Number 31, Mike Body, holding him to, from the first down. So, as we said, going in Northport, strength was their defense. And it's certainly been the strength of this ball game as they again stop Sachem. Now it's up to the Tigers' offense to try to get cranked up from their own 29-yard line. Quarterback is Keith Vertebra, and he wants to throw. He has the man open out here on the sidelines. It is completed, and gets out across the 40-yard line. And a very nice throw. Vertebra, a quick pitch to Frank Bordinello. Makes the catch. Bordinello came in the game with five receptions for 42 yards. This is an excellent throw here by Vertebra. He gets the ball out to number 80, Frank uh, Bordenero, and it looks as though at one point here, Bordenero almost broke this thing. If he could have gotten to the outside, he would have been off to the races, Seth. Well, they picked up 12 yards in the play, making the tackle was Jim Isernia, 5'8", 145-pound senior member of the National Honor Society. First down and 10 for North Point at their own 41. Tripping his vertebra, but gets some nice blocks in there as he cuts it back to the inside and goes across the midfield stripe and gets a first down as Jim Isernia again comes up to make the stop. Nice play by the quarterback considering uh, he tripped and is blocked and saved him on that one. This is one of those plays. Now, this, I think, is, is a design run option type as uh, Vertebra stumbles as he's coming out, but he gets an opening right here, turns this play up, and gets tremendous yards crossing the 50-yard line for the first time for timeout. Northport this afternoon. So a timeout call by Sachem. And first down and 10 situation for Northport at the Sachem 48-yard line. 
best situation they've had, as you mentioned, Emerson, in this football game. And that may be what we're going to see more of here as the, we're talking about the finesse style of offense that uh, coach for Northport wanted to run here this afternoon. Uh, talking to him before the game, Robert Macaloso, and talking to him during the week, he said, we have to manipulate, we have to finesse because we can't overpower their defensive line. And I think we're seeing that, a little bit of that manipulation on that last play. I think right down the last couple of plays, uh, Northport has had the football uh, on their right hash mark, and they start throwing the ball to the wide side of the field, and that time coming back into the short side with the option run with a quarterback, uh, Verdeberger. And so far, they've seemed, they seem to turn the page with their offense, and it uh, appears to be working. Bob Macaluso played as a defensive back for Adelphi in the late 1960s. He served in the Marine Corps during the Vietnam War, came back east in 1971, coached at Holy Trinity High School in Hicksville as an assistant. In 72, he went to Herrick's High as an assistant for five years. Then in 77, he came to Northport, both as the head football and the cross coach. Their football program was down at that time because soccer was very big here. It still is very big. And in the first 15 games at Northport, his teams were 1-13-1. and one. But since then, Northport has been very competitive since that slow start. That time, it did not work for Vertebra. That was basically the same play, Ed. Uh, not exactly the same play, but that kind of same action. Uh, as we'll see in our replay, you'll see Vertebra take a pivot step here, turns around, and mm, all of a sudden, number 78, Gary Butel, he's all over number 44. Boy, he really stacked him up, didn't he? That's, I told you he's a big guy. There you see, I told you, 230, 6'3", <laughs> 14 years old. <laughs> no gain on the play. Second down and 14. This is Claire, the tailback, and he's not going to get the run room because, again, a very hard hit. This uh, Sachem team, especially their defense, is very physical, as we saw. Paul Fitzpatrick, the left end, defensive left end, 5'11", 180 senior, come up to make the tackle, and Fitzpatrick has already had seven sacks this season. Claire trying to find some running room, but uh-uh, number 39, Paul Fitzpatrick, stops him at the corner. So for Northport, they're at their own 49-yard line, faced with a third down and 13 situation. Trailing in the ball game to Sachin, seven to nothing, and we're now to 6-13 now left in the first half as Vertiber wants to put it up. Having some problems, as you can see, and uh, his problems follow him because two Sachin defenders were there led by Paul Fitzpatrick making the big stop. A loss on the play brings up fourth down. Also, Todd Drost was in there, 6'3", 215-pound senior. He's an excellent uh, lacrosse player, an excellent student, and uh, Drost would like per perhaps to go to West Point. I like what uh, number 44, Keith Verderberger, did that time. If you remember the series before, he ran basically the same play, looking for something deep through the ball in a crowd, interception. This time, let your punter get you out of the hole. Took 11-yard loss as Frank Portadello will boot it away. Nice kick taken at the 32-yard line and running with the football is number 33 as he takes some yardage along the far sidelines. Running with that football is Mike Malat. Matlack. Matlack makes some yardage, too, and again, we see Sachin with good field position. That time, there was really shoddy tackling by the Northport Tigers uh, special team squad here because they had uh, uh, Matlack pinned back there, allowed him to get out outside and make a decent return out of it. And mention again that uh, one of the strengths of this Northport football team over the years has been their special teams. They're not quite as solid this year as they have been in the past, but their solid teams, uh, their special teams twice today have broken down. Johnson wants to throw the football. Intercepted at the 35 yard line with a very nice interception. Brady by running the football across the midfield down the 41 yard line. He goes with the football. Kieran McGowan, the 6'3, 190 pound senior, comes up with a big play. Pass was intended for Mike Pasatino. I think uh, right now, uh, this could be the boost that uh, Northport needs as we saw number 81, Karen McGowan, comes up with a fine interception. They have to have something happen. I think right now they need a big play, and that's uh, somewhat of a big play as we watch again. Number 11, Mike Johnson, uh, it's got the man open, just overthrows, and watch number 81, the big guy goes up, and he's 6'3", 190 pounds, fine uh, interception, almost breaks his play. It's the kind of play I think Northport needs. Good field position. First time today they've been this deep to the 38-yard line of Sachem. Looks like a busted play or else a very delayed draw. Good pitch back. A nice ball handling by Furtabar as he's brought down by Kelly Smith and the pitch back going to Craig Clare, the tailback. 
And that what? wasn't really a busted play, but I don't right. think... Uh, <laughs> It looked like one at first, and then that's the field. I don't think Vertiberg would want to stop like that in front of some of these big guys. I think he stopped in front of maybe uh, uh, Sullivan, number 46 Sullivan, or if you tell, he's going to have to watch that. Sure was a great delay. Yes, it was. You could have had a meal with the time he took with that football. I think that was by, de by design. I think you're right. To get the ball outside to number 33, Clay Clay. Second down and three. North Point on the move. They put McCabe back in at fullback. On the last play, Gavin Byrne was in there, but now McCabe, their meal ticket, gets the football off left guard, and he drives straight ahead. McCabe can drill. He's not a big man. Gary Butella, who is a big man, made the stop. Butella, 230, makes the stop on the 5'8", 190-pound McCabe, who's averaging just a shade, less than five yards a carry, is considered an all-county candidate. Cheerleaders of Northport try to spur their team on. The Tigerettes. Well, Northport is on the move to the Sachem 30-yard line. They've got a first down and 10 situation. McCabe is the up back. The deep back is Claire. This is Claire. Some running room. Gets a good block on the interior line. Goes inside the 30-yard line. Where he's pulled down by Jim Isonia. Making the stop. I just saw an outstanding play here by number 28, James McCabe. He got a hold of number 53, Ray Curtin's. And Curtis was filling. As we'll take a look here in our replay. Look off to the no replay, but uh, it, it was a shot that number 53, Ray Curtin, was trying to fill the gap. And number 28, James McKay, was leading for number 33, Claire. What a collision. Won by number 28, McKay. So Northport on the move to the Sachem 24 yard line. And the quarterback rolling out is Keith Vertiber. He throws in a nice catch inside the 10 yard line. A marvelous reception. Going high to pull it down. Number 81 made the catch. Was Ken and McGowan in there to make the stop. Ray Curtin was one man along with John Pirro. But McGowan made a beautiful stop of a leaping catch. He had to stop, go high in the air to pull it down. The man injured down on the field is James McCabe. That's the guy that uh, we are looking for here. You see the guy go up, McCabe, number 28. Takes some hit right on the helmet as he's going down. But an outstanding catch, great concentration, good delivery by Vertiberger. These guys here going wild, huh, Vert? You got to be going wild with no <laughs> shirt on today. It's pretty chilly out. <laughs> you better move a lot. Looking at uh, McCabe, I think his bell was rung quite a bit there. Uh, he's got his helmet off. Uh, I think maybe the trainer or a doctor is checking him to make sure he's all right. Ken and McGowan went into the game with nine receptions for 122 yards. He's a big target at 6'3", 190 pounds, a senior. He's very strong. Uh, he's considered to have only adequate speed, but he will catch the ball in the crowd. McCabe coming off now under his own power. McCabe has carried the ball in the game four times for only eight yards, so they've done a good job as Sachem is shutting down the inside running of James McCabe. First down and goal to go from the 10 as Vertiba is going to put in the end zone, but it's incomplete. Threw it over the head. Jim Isernia was there to cover over the head of Frank Bordenero. All right, let's go down to Carl Reuter on the sidelines. Thanks very much, Ed. And uh, the alarm clock has gone off here on the Northport sidelines following that uh, last interception. Uh, for some reason, uh, after that opening kickoff, the emotional level went, was dead here on Northport. They picked it up, and now they're driving, and uh, once again, we have a ball game if they could punch one in. Ed? Big opportunity call, because they've got a second down and 10 situation. The ball is resting on the 10-yard line. I think you can't make a first down. I think they'd be in the end zone. I would think so. Yeah. It's so about at the 10. Nice pitch. This is Claire trying to get outside. Gets inside the 10 and wrestled down at the HR line. Good, very good pursuit by Sachem. They had three defenders there to make the play. Covered the play very well. Jack Johnson was there. Jim Isernia was there. And Kelly Smith, the three defensive backs all making a stop. Vertiberger comes down with the option, pitches out to number 33, Claire. And the race is on, as you can see. It looks as though Claire would win the race at that point. But Fitzpatrick gets there. Uh, Isernia gets there. And I think Kelly Smith gets there. James McKegg had been checking up now. Checks back into the Northport lineup. Third down. Goal to go from the Sachem A. yard line. The up back is McCabe, the deep back is Claire, the quarterback is Vertiber. And this is McCabe off the left side. He gets inside the five-yard line. Before Gary Wojciechowski makes the stop.
And this is just uh, tough running here by number 28. Coming off the option type play, you see a number four, 44, Mark Wojciechowski, making the big play. So a timeout is taken with uh, 2.52 left here in the first half. Sachem is leading seven to nothing, but North Florida is certainly knocking at the doors. They are down to the four yard line, but North Fort faced with a very crucial fourth down and four situation. 252 left in the first half. Fred Fusaro says he is the coach of Sachem that going into this season, he didn't know whether he had a title contender. He's had a great reputation as a football coach out here, but he lost his entire offensive line. But should he win this ball game today, then he would have another league championship. His sixth. It is 14 years at Northport. Northport has a big advantage. I mean, Sachem has a big advantage. Uh, Sachem has an enrollment of 4,600. Emerson, that's the largest enrollment on Long Island for high school, while Northport has only about 2,100. Yes, it is. Uh, I was out watching them practice this week, and they've got a slew of good-looking athletes out there. They, they're the young players that want to play the game, and they, it shows. All right, it's fourth down, goal to go for the four-yard line, but they will go for the field goal attempt. Frank Mortonello will try it. He just got that one away, and they signal good, no good. One official signal good, the other one signal no good. Look wide to the left, and that's what it was. So, field goal try by Mortonello from 21 yards fails, and that has to take a little steam out of Northport because another thing... Many people felt out here going in as Northport, when they got the opportunity to score, would have to score on Sachin. Right. Uh, but I think right now Northport is hanging tough. Uh, we've got two minutes and 49 seconds approximately the, in the first half, and they're only down seven points. So uh, I think they've done a, a pretty good job in keeping uh, Sachin down. Well, you know, this game is following a pattern a bit of Sachin's only loss last week when they went down to West Islip, six to nothing. Sachin on the first series looked very good offensively. Here today against Northport, the first series because of the kickoff return made their offense look very good. But since then, though they've had good field position, Sachem's offense has not moved the ball that well. And this is uh, Body who's had trouble, but this time he's breaking tacklers. He's out in the open. They're going to have trouble pulling him down, but finally they wrestle him down. Number 81 makes the tackle for Northport. The man who made it, Keenan McGowan, made the stop on Mike Body, but Body with his biggest gain of the day. And there is a look at the all-purpose back, a um, back that many call the top tailback in the country as we watch our replay, coming here with a power play. And uh, watch the big fella here. He breaks tackles. He rips. He's got that long stride, high knee action, and uh, took number 81, Karen McGowan, uh, to save the day here. Body picked up 28 yards in the previous play, but that time he goes nowhere as the defensive left side of North Port is there to stack up that play. John Bassinet with 24 tackles coming in, a lacrosse player, 5'8", 175-pound linebacker, a senior makes the stop on Michael Body. Body in the ball game now, 17 carries for 76 yards. I think right now that front line of uh, Sachem, uh, number 76, Todd Gross, number 54, Yacono and uh, Weinstein, Von Ficino, they're all moving the football right now. Wants to throw, does Johnson, incomplete. Johnson pitching out there to 33, Mike Matlat. Covering on the play was Steve Gatlin. Number 82, Gatlin with 34 tackles, a captain on this team. Missed a couple of games because of an injury, but now back playing full time. This is just a good play here. Uh, trying to get the ball to number 33, Matlat, but uh, Gatlin covers him very well. And I think uh, had he got a little bit closer, he might have gotten past in the first because he was reaching for the shirt. Brings up a third and 11 situation for Sachem with 157 left in the first half. The Arrows of Sachem leading the Tigers of Northport by a score of 7 to nothing. Suffolk County League One football game. Ed Ingalls along with Emerson Boozer and Carl Reuter from the I formation. Johnson wants to throw. That's the play they like to throw. The screen left. Pasatino catches the football, but that's a play also Northport was looking for because before the game, Robert Macaluso, the coach of Northport, said, I kind of think they're going to throw some screen passes against us. <laughs> that time, I think uh, in the week of preparation, as we watch again, you'll see uh, Sachem set up their screen off to the left there, but didn't our fool number 40, uh, uh, Gavin Byrne, because he was there to make the big stop. Byrne, good football player, solid player, a baseball catcher, 16 tackles going in, 5'9", 165, also helping him out, Peter Miller. Miller and Byrne are the two most active defenders for Northport. So, Northport turns away, Sachem, at the Northport 49-yard line, and they're going to have to kick it away. 
This is Claire waiting for the bounce. Takes it at the 20. He's got a little bit of running room. 25, 30, out to the 32-yard line where he stopped. Mike Matlack made the stop. As Pasatino putted for Sage himself with uh, only 58 seconds left in the first half. Northport gets the football back, and they're getting it back now in a little better field position than they were getting in the first period, Emerson. That's what you like to see, uh, especially if you're an offensive player. You say, geez, we've been backed up all afternoon. You start picking up three or four or five yards here on the exchange of the football. That tends to uh, give you a little juice, too. The cave of the game has rushed five for 13. Claire, six for 17. Vertebra is two for eight rushing. This is Claire with the most running room he's had today as he rips it up the middle across there looking for the pass with the clock winding down. They're playing pass and not rush is Sachem as Claire runs it out to his own 45-yard line. This is a draw play here from Vertiberger to number 33, Claire. And Claire gets lots of running room here and almost breaks this thing. Kelly Smith made the stop. Vertiber throws the football, but he throws a little bit too far, trying to hit Frank Bordenero, his wide receiver, incomplete pass. John Piero, the 5'9", 160-pound junior for Sachin, their quarterback, was covering on the play. I think right now, uh, Northport will have trouble throwing a football because their receiver's got to look back into the sun. Unless they throw a little short stuff, uh, because uh, to turn him into the eating sun, you lose the ball momentarily. Before you can find it, it's gone by. Good point, Emerson. With only 42 seconds left in the first half, uh, Northport faced with a situation of having to go 55 yards to score a touchdown or try to get it close enough to try another field goal attempt. There's a draw with Claire carrying not much running room because Todd Drost, 6'3", 215, senior, made the stop. Moving without the huddle from their own 47-yard line, Northport. Third down and eight. Clock is down to 20 seconds. Vertiba throwing the sideline pass again, completes it, but it is inbounds at the 45-yard line of Sachin. And that should about there to call a timeout. But they had used all their timeouts, but they still have one left, and they take it with 11 seconds left. So they have the ball at the Sachin 46-yard line. And they have a fourth down situation, too. Mentioning Todd Drost, I was speaking uh, Ed with his father, Drost Sr., earlier, and he was telling me how strong his kid was, bench pressing 325 some pounds. He says, I'm afraid to even get near him nowadays. <laughs> That's a guy you don't want to hug. No. You, know, you got, got broken ribs if you hug him. <laughs> oh, yeah. Emerson, let us tell us the scores uh, this year for the Sachem Arrows. They over the season with two touchdowns in the last four minutes of the game, a come from behind 13 to 7 victory over Lindenhurst. Coach uh, Fusaro says that's the reason this team already got moving. That built confidence. From there, they beat Ward Melbo 14-7. Sachem also in a high-scoring game had to come from behind to beat Patchogue 48-28. Then they beat Connetqua 14-7. They took on Brentwood, defeated Brentwood 28-7. So they won their first five games of the season. Stretched their unbeaten streak to 15 games, 14-0-1. But last week against West Islip, they were defeated 6-0. Uh, that was a game where I think uh, they started to feel our oats a bit, and uh, uh, West Tyson had lost to this same Northport club, and it ended up knocking the arrows off. Fourth down, a yard to go, 11 seconds left in the first half. Running inside, but that will not get you what you need, which is a touchdown, but you weren't going to get that very easily anyway, so that's a safe play. They're going to try to run it again from the 40-yard line. Clock is stopped with the first down at the Sachem 41, and there's a whistle. Because the chain gang had moved along, too. The chain gang was trailing on the play. Right. The uh, referee has to make sure that everything is set to go. But uh, Northport wanted to get the ball off in a hurry. And I don't blame Mr. Vertiberger because he's got to try to get a score. So six seconds now show as a second one off the clock on that aborted play. It is a first down and ten situation. Little equipment problems out there. One of the Northport players tying the string of the shoulder pans. Sachem up seven to nothing. They're gonna reset the clock to Emerson because they took a second off on that play and there was no play. So instead of six seconds, we should have seven seconds left. Nice. Now we'll see how good the clock man is because he started in the 60s and he's now winding <laughs> his way down. <laughs> there he We've is. Got it. He recovered Didn't quickly. Take long. Seven seconds left. Northport football at the Sachem 41 yard line. Clock is running. Five seconds left in the first half. Vertemar wants to throw. 
will not be able to throw the football as the first half will come to an end on a fine defensive play by Jeff Sullivan, the defensive right end, six foot, 180 pound junior, who's been improving all season long, comes in to make the stop. And so at halftime here at Northport's Tiger Stadium, the score, the Sachem Arrows, seven, the Northport Tigers, nothing. We'll be back. You're watching this game on the Long Island Sports Network. Ed Ingles along with Emerson Boozer at Tiger Stadium here at Northport with the Sachem Arrows leading 7 to nothing over Northport. Here are the first half stats uh, pretty close, except in total yardage, Emerson Boozer. It's uh, not uh, what we expected coming into the ballgame, so you must give the Tigers respect. Getting ready for the second half kickoff, and it will be Sachem with Peter Sato kicking off to Northport. Sachem scored first time they had the football. Don Bauer returned the kick 55 yards from the 12-yard line. Three plays. Mike Botti going in from two yards out, and that was it. Craig Clare is the deep man down the middle, waiting back at the 11-yard line for Northport for the opening of the second half kickoff. Here it comes, and it is Clare back at the 10. The wedge is formed in front. But he does not go too far as he's upended across the 25 to the 26-yard line where Northport will set up shop at that point. First down and 10. At their own 26-yard line, Sean McKenna and Mike Matlaff made the stops for Sachem. What must Northport do here in the second half, Emerson? Uh, Northport's going to have to throw the football as they did uh, in the second half to move it well. And then they're still going to have to run, too, with the quick hitters. In the first half, their quarterback, Keith Vertiver, was 3 of 9 for 36 yards with one interception. McCabe is the up back. Flair is the deep back as Vertiver tries to go with the option play, something they've tried to work today, that time testing his own right side, where Jeff Sullivan is there to make the stop. Individual stats for the first half. The quarterback showing for the arrows. Mike Johnson started out hitting his first three passes and then cooled a bit. Mike Body averages seven yards per carry. He's under his average in this ball game. Passing Vertebra has that one interception that was costly for rushing. Well, a good job by the Sachem defense as they've stopped McCabe, but Claire, the tailback, who is shifty, has picked up some yardage on the inside the first half. They have done a pretty good job running the football because I didn't think uh, Northport could run that well against Sachem, but uh, just before half, they got a couple of big draw plays off. And on this first play of the uh, third quarter here, uh, Vertiver moving inside, picked up a strong foot. That's a good opener. Second down and six for the Tigers of Northport from the eye with a slot on the left side. They go again with the option play as the big guy who is not that quick as Vertiver, but he is a strong runner. Averages almost five yards per carry going this ball game. Ran into Paul Fitzpatrick, who came in the game as the second leading tackler for Sachem. He had 34. Also in to help out of the tackle was Todd Drost. Uh, now at uh, Vertigo, as you'll watch, number 44, he's running this option the way it should be run right here. Make that pitch man go. If he doesn't go, you turn it up. And that's what he did there. Uh, Fitzpatrick didn't go outside. He waited on the quarterback, turned it up, picked up a nice two yards. Vertivar, known for his decision-making, considered very cool, a very smart decision-maker. On third down, throwing the football, has the man open, has the first down. And it is complete to Frank Bonadero, who came in the game with five receptions. He's got two this afternoon. John Pirro, the cornerback, makes a stop, but Northport hangs on the football with the first down. This is exactly what uh, Vertiberg is going Vertiberg, Vertiberg is going to have to do. Number 44, he gets the ball out to Bonanero, and Bonero, Bonanero picks up the first down, an important first down, because uh, Northport has to move the football. So unlike early in this football game, when Northport could not move the football, they have moved it the first time here in the second half, moving for first down, their own 43-yard line. They trail 7-0 with 10-16 left in the third period as the Tigers moving against the Sachem Arrows. Again, off the option as they go inside to McCabe, who had trouble in the first half. He wiggles and squirms across the 45, but runs in the grasp of Ray Curtin, the 5'10", 185-pound senior linebacker, who does a solid job for Fred Fusero's arrows. Second and seven at their own 46 for Northport. Three yards, uh, excuse me, yet. Three yards is not a bad pickup at this point here. Uh, in, the, in the first series that they picked up four here they pick up three so let's see what they do in this next series here 
The up back is McCabe. The deep back is again the tailback, Craig Clare. He's been in all the way on the offensive side. Again, the option play. And the big, strong guy gets running room as he crosses midfield out inside the station 45 to the station 43 before Kelly Smith and John Pirro make the stop. But it's another first down for it's, Northport. It's a big first down here. As we see, uh, Vertiva comes back with his option. He has it somewhat of, in his pivot. And we'll see this pivot here. Watch this pivot here. He gets outside. Now he wants to force the pitch man to come and get him. And that he does. because Patrick misses here. And Vertiber turns it up, picks up the first down. That's nice execution. We see Vertiber running with the football in the second half where he did not in the first half. And he is a good runner. Not very fast, but he's got good feet. He's strong. He's six foot, 180 pound senior. Two year starter. Going to throw the football if he gets a chance. He gets a good block from McCabe. And now he unloads a long one. It's up in the air off the hands of Frank Bortonero. Defending John Pirro. Pirro's 5'9, Bortonero is six foot. So that was a case where the receiver did have a three-inch height advantage. Yes, it is, as we'll see in our replay. Nice move here by Vertiba. He fakes the pump here, gets a good block, rolls outside. Now he's looking for number 80, Frank Bonanero. Gets the ball up downfield, both uh, number nine, Piero, and uh, Bonanero go up for the football, but neither can come down with it. Coach Fusero of Sarishim had uh, expressed some concern before this game by the fact that his defensive secondary was a lot shorter than the receivers for Northport. On the draw, the tailback, Claire. Grab from behind on good pursuit on that play. Coming up to make the stop, the nose guard. Gary Wojciechowski, 6'1", 230. Good stop by the junior. Nice fake here by Vertebrook. Gives the ball to Claire. And who else but number 74, Mark Wojciechowski. Third and five from the station 39 for the Northport Tigers. Early second half. Sachem on top, seven to nothing. Slot on the right side. Again, the option. But that's not going anywhere because oh, Gary Butel on a fumble on a loose ball that's recovered by Sation. They got the football back. It's why the quarterback, Vertebra, quickly turned around. He sets the fumble, but it was too late because Gary Butel, the 6'3", 230-pound sophomore, was there to claim it for Sachem. There we go. As he puts the ball into McCabe, you see McCabe gets hit immediately. The ball pops out. He was hit by uh, number 76. I think it might be Todd Gross that uh, created the fumble. You tell recovers and so Sachem has the football at their own 42-yard line. First down and 10, leading 7 to nothing with 7.52 left here in the third period and breaking for the good game is Leo. Only the second time today he's carried the football. That time it was a fullback, Don Leo, lugging it. Nice play, the man made the stop was Frank Bortonero, who also is a safety as well as the wide receiver on this team. But there was a case in which they fooled the Northport defense. They were looking for a body to carry it, and they went to the fullback, Leo, who is 5'11", uh, uh, 175, a senior. So it's all the way down to the Northport 31-yard line to pick up on the play of 27 yards for Leo. And the Sachem Arrows. Back to body, the work cross off the left side. Boy, he keeps twisting and turning, doesn't he, Emerson? You look like you, you feel like maybe you got him stopped for a no gain or a yard, but even with three people on him, including Dan Campbell, the six foot, 210 pound senior, he's still tough to take down. Yes, he is. Uh, watch number 31 here, uh, Mike Body. And also watch number 82, Steve Gatlin comes in right now, fills the hole as you see, bingo! But the big guy keeps twisting and turning, gets somewhat away from number 82, Steve Gatlin. Sachem on the move. Second down, five yards to go from the North 426 yard line. This time for the standard pro set formation instead of the eye, but the same uh, system with body carrying the football as he owns the right side. Most of the running going off the left side early on, but it was Dave Ambusher, the uh, nose guard, who made the stop for Northport. Ambusher, big guy, 6'1", 230. Yes, yeah, Ambusher moved in very well at that time. Uh, was able to catch the, the uh, running back, Leo, right in the hole. Body now has carried the ball 19 times for 82 yards. It's a third and three situation for Sachem at the Northport 24-yard line. Sachem leading seven to nothing. And uh, I sense a big series of downs right here. This game, the complexion of this game could be determined right in this series. His body trying the right side does not get the first down. <coughs> well, they're running body back more to the right side than they did early on. 
Steve Gatlin, number 82, 6'1", 185 senior, who makes a lot of tackles, 834 this season, though he missed two games because of an injury and as a captain of this team, made the stop. That will bring up a fourth down situation and a yard to go for Sation at the Northport 22-yard line. Sation is 0 for 2 in this game, Emerson, on fourth down situations. And that shows you the strength of the Northport team. They have buckled down when they've had to. And they have to do it right here. Big fullback, Leo, I think that's the first down. And he cracked off the left side. The place they've been going when they really needed yardage is to run their own left side behind the good blocking of Adam Weinstein and Vinny Yakano. Yeah, this is a good surge here by the station line. They really got off. Number 76, Droz, Bono, BCO, and Weinstein. Yakano, they all got off the mark very well at that time to get the first down. Looks as though there's a flag, though. Yes, and it's against Northport. Face mask penalty, so that'll put the Tigers back deeper in their own territory. And Sasha moving here midway through the sec third period. 5.31 left in the third session. Sasha over Northport, 7 to nothing. So like they did the first time they had the football in the first half, Sasha moved in for a touchdown. Here they're trying to emulate that here in the second half, the first time they get their hands on the football. And it moves it down to the 10-yard line. So now Sasha with a first down and goal to go situation. The nose of the ball just inside the 10-yard line. In the early series here, uh, Sasha has been going toward Yakano and uh, Wojciechowski. And in the last uh, crucial play, they went to uh, Montesino and Weinstein's side. Yeah, that's the left side, which they consider their stronger side for blocking purposes. So now Northport will try to dig in again and stop Sachem. The Sachem Arrows trying to clinch the League One championship with a victory today would give them. For Fred Fusaro, it would be his sixth league title in 14 years at Sachem. Northport, not a playoff contender, but this would salvage a lot of the uh, heartbreak of this year with a victory over Sachem if they can pull off. First down, goal to go, just inside the 10-yard line for Sachem. Now they're going to try to get the big guy body outside wide, and he drags a tackler with him as he goes down to the five-yard line. Boy, he is tough to pull down because getting a free ride there for Northport was Keith Vertebra, the quarterback who comes in and plays defense, usually in pass situations, but he's in there in the running situation, obviously, this time. And then this is really tightening things up. You'll see uh, Vertebra, number 44, come in and save the day because uh, uh, Body looked like he wanted to stretch out, but was nabbed right at the corner by number 44, Keith Vertebra. So it's down to the five-yard line, and it's second down and goal to go for Sachem at the North Port Five. The up back, the close back is the fullback, Leo. The tailback in the deep spot is body, and it's body who wants to get the football. He just gets down close to the goal line, but stopped at the one-yard line. Body picks up four yards on that carry, and it was Gavin Byrne, the linebacker, 5'9", 165 senior, who made the stop. Gives him a third down situation. They mark his knees at the two-yard line. So it'll be third and goal from the two. Again, the deep back will be body out of the eye. The up back is Don Leo, the six foot, 175 pound senior. And quarterback Johnson. Johnson wants to throw, now he wants to run. Now he's gonna throw. And let's see if they rule it. Yes, they signal touchdown. Nice throw, Johnson rolling out to his right side. Throws the TD pass. And he went to his clutch receiver, Mike Pasatino, the tight end. Well, Johnson gave you a couple of looks there. First, he faked the throw, then he went to the run, and then he finally on the run, which he does well. He's a good sprint out pass, as he showed there. Hit his number one receiver in this football game, Mike Pasatino, with a two-yard toss, and now Sachem leads it 13 to nothing, as Peter Sato will come on and try the extra point. So the first time they had the ball in the game, they scored. The second, first time they had the second half, Sachem also scored. Extra point is good. And Sachem has built a 14 to nothing lead over Northport with four minutes left in the third period. As you'll see, uh, we're out, our, our monitor is out, but uh, Mike Johnson finds his favorite receiver, number 38, Mike Pasentino, uh, rolling out to his right. Pasentino barely keeps his feet in bounds, and some of the fans here are questioning whether he kept a foot in bound at all. 
In fact, one of the officials was unsure, too. We had to wait. One official seemed to touch down. The other one seemed to be in question. But it stands at a two-yard touchdown pass on a drive that station started from their own 42-yard line. They went 58 yards on that drive in eight plays. Eight plays, 59 yards, you want to say, Glenn. Okay, 59 yards and eight plays. But now Northport in a hole here, down 14-0 without an offense that is not, you know, an offense that hasn't been explosive this year. They have only scored the six points their first game, six points second game, third, eight points third game, shut out in the fourth, and then they scored 14 and then 21 points. And with the football, is Claire coming right back up the middle. But he has stopped as he gets across the 20-yard line, and so Northport will set up first down and 10 as their putt return man, Craig Claire, their tailback, brings it back. He returns punts and kickoffs. Northport with their work cut out for them with 3.54 left in the third period. First down and 10 from their own 25-yard line. Quarterback is Keith Vertebra. The tailback is Craig Clare. And the fullback is James McKay. Station plays that 52 defense. Most of the time, they'll go to a 5-3 in the obvious passing situations. Well, back to the straight-ahead drive series, which they had used early on. Kelly Smith making the tackle on the tailback, Craig Clare, assisted by Todd Drost. Sets up a second-down situation for Northport at their own 28-yard line, second and seven. Uh, the Tigers must crack up their offense. Down two touchdowns here in the third quarter. They'll go to a three-wide receiver formation. But as the cornerback, Vertebra, with the option, makes a bad pitch, Claire has to dive for it, goes out of bounds. Northport will retain possession. And that, of course, is the danger of the option series, Emerson, that uh, you can make the mistake running that kind of series. But that's the real danger when you run the option play. Your quarterback has to know where he's pitching the ball, and he has to know whether the back is in the right position for the release. And uh, sometimes the ball can get uh, thrown around rather uh, wildly. So now they're faced with a third and seven for Northport at their own 28-yard line. They have to get something going offensively. Keith Vertiver comes in the game, completing 42% of his passes. He started out the first four games. He was throwing poorly. He was in a slump, doing technical problems last two games. He did improve on his passing, and they feel he is a threat to throw the football. As we'll see here, but now he's going to run with the football. He will get the first down as he slides forward. Yes, the first down goes up across the 35-yard line. Ray Curtin and Jack Johnson were waiting for him. Curtin, a 5'10", 185-pound senior, solid defender. Jack Johnson, the 6'2", 180-pound senior. Vertiver gets back to throw the football, finds nobody open, so immediately decides to take off, stopped by number 80, Jack Johnson, and number 53, Ray Curtin. So first down and 10 from the 38-yard line. Vertiver in the game now has rushed six times for 33 yards. Claire has nine carries for 38 yards. They come in that slot formation to the left from their own 38. Here comes the option. There's that same pitch that went away the last time, and uh, again, it goes out of bounds off the bad pitch. John Pirro, the cornerback, was pressuring on the play. And there again, uh, at Vertiver moves out very well, and as Claire is coming down in the trail position, or the pitch position, as we might call it, and uh, the ball is flipped outside, this time a little bit too far out in front of number 33, Craig Claire, uh, resulting in a fumble football, but luckily recovered again. Look for Northport to throw as they sent Frank Bornaro back in as a wide receiver. Number 80, he's their leading pass catcher, and they're faced with the uh, situation here where they've got to pick up some yards as the quarterback, Vertebra, goes off the right side. They had a lot of people running downfield like it was an obvious passing play, but uh, instead the quarterback just banged off the right side. Paul Fitzpatrick, the defensive left end, 5'11", 180, a senior. Steady football player, made the stop. Puts the football up across the 40 to the 41 for Northport, where they're now faced with a third down and 12 situation. And that's a lot of yards to pick up on third down. You want to try to keep the ball in, in the, the four, three, four yard range on third down, but unfortunately, they're needing 12 here, which means you've got to throw the football or possibly a draw. 
Northport shuffles their wide receivers carrying in the plays on each down to the quarterback, Vertiber. Well, he likes to roll up when he's going to throw that football and off the fingertips trying to make a diving catch. Very difficult pass to come up with. Very hard to get your hands on as uh, Scott Cream was over there making the defensive play. The receiver's still down on the field. It's shaken up trying to uh, catch that football, diving for it. From up here, we really can't see how he got hurt, but uh, Verti Vertiba rolled out to live the football and uh, looks as though he was going down. He trips, uh, as we see, and uh, hits the ground, but I don't know what could be wrong. They're examining him up top or talking to him up top. Uh, let's hope it's not too bad. Bring up a fourth down situation for Northport and a fourth and 12, forcing them either to kick it away or fake it. Getting helped up on his feet now is the fullback, James McCabe, who was shaken up for the second time in this football game, but he's a tough hombre, 5'8", 190, a senior. Frank Bordinello will punt it away for Northport. Hangs on high. This is Don Bauer watching the ball. 23 goes out of bounds. So Sachem again will have good field position, which has been the story of this football game. The Arrows of Sachem most of the time with good field position. The Tigers of Northport with not such good field position. And that generally happens when one team is better than another football team you've observed, I'm sure, Emerson. Yes, it, it does. Uh, plus, uh, that, that was not one of the one of an arrow's better punt, a punch rather. He got up uh, the height he wanted, but it just didn't get any distance. Then it goes immediately to the sidelines and out of bounds. They put a lot of pressure on their punter, though, that's Northport, because uh, their coaching staff wants him to angle everything to the sidelines. Well, yeah, he's that's a little bit respectful play. of uh, the run back, but sometimes you've got to get it straight away and uh, see what you can do what you can do with it. You want to try to pin them back as far as you can, but that all comes down to philosophy. Coach uh, uh, Macaluso prefers angle shots and uh, uh, to pin it into the corner or kick it out of bounds, but I'd like to see the ball return. Well, that's because you were running back. Well, I, think I like the excitement, too, uh, <laughs> I know, I'm to see right. the blocking formations form as you set up the return and the little scat backs coming out from back there. Well, it's an action game, and you want to see action. First down and 10. Station trying to get some action on a nice fake off there by Johnson. Breaking through his Leo for the second time today. He's going to give himself a big gainer as he stumbles inside the 30-yard line of Northport. And there's one that uh, Leo went for 29 yards. And now, this is a piece of running here by the big fullback, number 34. Uh, Don Leo. Leo gets into the secondary before Northport knows he's there. And the big guy is rolling and rolling. He cuts back. He gets a convoy. And uh, thanks to number 45, Fred uh, Musa, Musa, Musini, uh, he saves the day. Well, Leo has decided that there's only one way to run today, and a good running football. That's a handsome piece of day's work, and uh, it's got to make him feel very happy. And that will improve your average. He is primarily the blocker, but what they do, the station arrows, is when uh, you key on their number one running back, Mike Body. They'll run Body at you a few times and say, okay, now that you think he's coming at you, let's give the ball to Leo, the blocker, and he goes for good yardage. Don Leo, six foot, 175 senior. A wrestler and a lacrosse player. Again, Sachem in good field position. There appears to be somewhat of a walk-off. Yes, a five-yard walk-off to the 25-yard line of Northport. So sets up a first down and 10 situation for Sachin leading in the ball game 14 to nothing over Northport. We are down to 115 and counting here in the third quarter. A game in which Sachin scored the first time they had the football and the fir first time they had the football in the second half, they scored their second touchdown. Quarterback is Johnson. Gives it to Body. Body trying that left side, trying to hang on is Peter Miller along with Dan Campbell. Miller played an exceptionally good football game against West Islip. He was all over the field, very active. He's six foot 170, a junior. Good athlete, uh, is quick, honor student, also a baseball player for the Northport Tigers. Sets up now a second down and eight at the 24 of Northport. Arrows moving. Full house backfield. Here's the option play with the pitch to body. They want to get him outside. 
Gets a little yardage as he carries with him the man who twice has been shaken up in this game, but keeps coming back, James McCabe, who made the stop. McCabe is a tough ball player. He plays that uh, defensive end slot out there, and he plays it very well. Uh, they, they, they blend very well together. McCabe, Pollard, uh, Aim Bisher, Campbell, and Miller, they do an outstanding job for Northport up front here because many times they're overmatched. Yeah, and size, as far as the size is concerned, Sachem has a big weight advantage on their offensive line over Northport's defense. You look at Northport's defense uh, from end to end, 190, 185, 230, 210, 170. So the third quarter is now history with the score. The Sachem Arrows on top of the Northport Tigers, 14 to nothing. We'll be back with the fourth quarter action right after this message. And you're watching Miss High School Football on the Long Island Sports Network. Third and five situation. His body is going to throw the option pass broken up very nicely by Frank Fornaro. The defensive back in there to break it up. He's got five interceptions this year. You can see why he's the big play man for them, Emerson, because he was not fooled by the option pass from Mike Body to Chris Cascone. No, I think they were looking for it. That uh, Cascone had got good position, and uh, Bonero recognized the play right away, came down, and made uh, an attempt to really swat it down. They intercepted, yet he ended up swatting it down. We got a penalty coming up against the Sachem Arrows holding penalty, which will set them back. They are leading in this ball game 14 to nothing, and they have never lost to Northport. Uh -huh. Nine times, and they've had two ties. The good news for the Tigers is that they've tied the Arrows. Those two ties coming in the last four years. They've got uh, 11 minutes 55 seconds to go here in the fourth to try to get on board and and. Uh, overtake station but uh, that is to be seen and there are two big ball games going on this weekend on Long Island for for the first place play of League Four Huntington is going against Comstock and in League Five Riverhead is playing at Bellport or Bayport rather for uh, first place all right we'll keep an eye on those football games Single back offense, some confusion, though, as people running around in the backfield for Sachem. Confusion seemed to be Don Leo, the fullback, wasn't sure where he belonged. Now, see, that's a little bit of a mix-up in your week's work, and I'm sure that uh, formation Sachem had not shown probably all year. It is the kind of formation that uh, the Rams used with Eric Dick Dickerson. Uh, body has taken that position as the long setback, and uh, Leo just got a little bit confused because it's new. Fred Fusaro has coached 14 years at Sachem, five league and four conference championships, 1977 Rutgers Cup winner, symbolic of being the Long Island champs. Fred coached the line at Hofstra for four years. He played for Huntington High School, was a 5'8 nose guard starter for two years at Ithaca College, where they were unbeaten both those seasons. Let's go to Carl Reuter on the sidelines. Thanks, Ed. You'd never know that there were uh, some 12 minutes left in this game. Northport seems a little bit defeated. They're down 14 nothing, but the guys are getting down on themselves at this point in the game. Ed? Well, that's easy to do because uh, you haven't built that much confidence with a 2-4 and four record. When you're used to losing, your confidence uh, goes pretty quickly. And although they've won their last two games, Northport, they came in and knowing they were rather a fairly large underdog to say in this game. All right, here is the uh, third down and 20 situation. Johnson wants to go over the middle, throws it nicely out of the hands of Mike Body. Threw the ball well, did the quarterback, Mike Johnson, who came in with a 56% completion average in this season. And that was kind of new, too, here. You, here you look at number 31, Mike, Mike Body coming back, uh, and uh, Johnson looking at him is to say, uh, why didn't you hold on to it? But Body appeared to be lined up outside, working his way back across underneath the linebackers, and Johnson watched him all the way, deliver the football, but Body just could not hold on to it. Johnson in the game is now 5 of 12 for 71 yards and one pass interception. 11.38 left, fourth down and 20 for Sachem at the Northport 35-yard line. And we have another timeout being taken. Emerson, I think that uh, we ought to touch on the subject here about Long Island football. It seems the seat of power in Long Island football high school action has moved from Nassau County to Suffolk County. Nassau County has so many schools, uh, which kind of dilutes the talent. And while soccer's make big inroads, there's another problem faced for Nassau County high school football coaches. That is the law of economics. A lot of uh, would-be good athletes are turning to part-time jobs and not going out for football. Now, that's a very interesting point. Uh, one wouldn't think, but because times are a little bit tough in some areas, some of the kids are turning to afternoon jobs. As we look at our rankings here, with C.I., Huntington, Bayshore, Comswalk, and Sayville as our top five. 
the station really had St. John the Baptist, but Whitman and Bayport. Well, it's a situation out in Suffolk County. They are concerned that uh, that trend will continue to come out this way. And they also know nothing about football. It takes a lot of people to practice for a football game. You have to have a lot of numbers to practice each weekday. It's not a sport that requires with baseball, you can do it with 18. Basketball, you can do it with 10. Football, you need about 40 players. And practice, as you know, is very grueling. It's not a lot of fun, but there's a man having a lot of fun. Peter Miller, we told you about him, the right end, how quick he was in the last game. He came through in a fourth down situation, teed off, and sacked Mike Johnson. So, Northport turns away station, keeps their hopes alive, and they get the football back in good field position. We watch again here off to the right of your screen. Number number 34 will flash. His name is Peter Miller, and he's got dead aims on number 11. Mike Johnson puts him on his seat. Well, this, this should lift up the spirits a bit of the uh, Northport Tiger fans because uh, they've got good field position here. They get the football back. They're on 48-yard line. They've got time. 11:32 left. They trail Sachem 14-0, but they do have time to get back in this football game. And they're going to try to do it in a hurry. At least that's what Vanderbilt had in mind. Makes a very nice throw. Looked long, but steady came back and threw short. Man who made the play was very nice play in there by the North Point offense. Number 45 with the reception. Gets him in good field position. Well, that was an outstanding uh, play. Getting open uh, by Fred Musumisi and uh, Vertiver scrambling outside to find uh, Musumisi for the big gainer. Puts the ball down at the 34-yard line of Sachem. A 16-yard gain. So first down and 10 for Northport at the Sachem 34. And the big pass by Keith Vertiber. Let's McCabe carry it off the left side. He takes it down into the 30-yard line. Scott Crean, the linebacker, makes the stop. 6-0, 195 senior. Solid football player, clean. Coach says if you saw, he's pleased with him. Gets the job done. Right now, Coach uh, Macaluso's uh, offense is going to have to hurry up as we see plays being shuttled in by Coach Macaluso. But they're going to have to throw the ball quickly and uh, run short stuff. You can't waste too much time on the clock when you want to get on the board. So they're down to the 31-yard line with a second and seven. And here's the deep drop by Vernerberg. He wants to go deep. Hits his man. Good throw inside the 15-yard line. Made a very fine connection. Frank Bordenaro makes the grab. John Pirodan to make the stop. And so it is Northport on the move. And our replay, this is something we hadn't seen all day. You see number 44, Vertiber, in a drop back position. Gives him time to look downfield, set up, and throws the ball extremely well. Turning inside. Fine reception. First down and 10 to go, Emerson, for Northport at the station 14-yard line. Out of the high formation, the cave is the up back. Vertebra wants to option, but feet just went out from underneath them as Gary Butel, the big defensive tackle, was waiting there for him. Vertebra is going to have to push that thing a little bit further, but he wanted to turn it up inside in a hurry. But you've got, with the, with the option play, you've got to string it out, open up those cavities, create your own cavity by moving the ball outside, then turning up. He didn't move as far as I'd like to have seen him go before he tried to turn up losing his footing. So it's second down and 10 to go from the 14-yard line of the Seychelles Arrows as Northport with the deepest penetration of the afternoon. Treading 14 to nothing, 9.59 left in the football game. We'll run from the I formation again as they have most of the afternoon. Pass is in and out of the hands of Frank Bonanaro. Covering there was Jack Johnson, the safety man. So now a little pressure is on the North Point offense because they're faced with third down and 10. And this is just a quick step by Vertiba here, and he tries to get the ball down outside, but Jack Johnson alertly swats it down. So big, what has to be considered big third down. That's something that gets overused a lot of times, but here third down and 10 when you're down by two touchdowns and deep in your opponent's territory is a crucial play. As big as the one we had in the first half where they had the ball inside the five and didn't hit. Wants to throw, does Vertiba. Great catch by Bonera. Excellent grab. Big play right there. Making the stop is Jack Johnson. So they have a first down and goal situation. Inside the five, down around the three. That was an outstanding catch. I didn't get the number on this uh, receiver, 
It appears to be 80, 81. 81. It was Kiernan McGowan. We said it's ball McGowan, and arrow. Yes. McGowan made the reception. Down to the three. First and goal to go. Northport with their best threat of the afternoon. That's Claire, the tailback, tried to take it in, but does not get to the end zone. Because Ray Curtin, the linebacker, was there to make the stop. Here is where Northport is really going to have to have to dedicate themselves, dig in, settle down right now. Uh, you, you don't want the linemen or backs or quarterback or receivers getting over anxious. You want to make sure they're settled, come with your best play, your best short yardage play, whatever that might be. But I would think it would be, would be number 28, James McCabe, a strong little power runner. Or you give it to your big uh, quarterback uh, at 6 feet, 188 pounds. He's got good size to him, but you don't want uh, things moving too far outside or inside. Attack power with power. Ray Curtin, the linebacker for a station that made the tackle on that last play, was the leading tackler this season. I assume he still is today because he went in with 50 tackles. That's 16 more than the runner-up on this station team. He also had one interception. He's a fine defensive football player. And you talk about McCabe, the running back for Northport. James McCabe came in here averaging almost five yards per carry. Today he's picked up nine for 30 as the station defense has done a good job on McCabe. Uh, I think Coach Macaluso is doing exactly what we were talking about here. He wants to get his offensive unit settled down. I'm sure he's discussing a play that he thinks is best at that position, probably their best uh, or number one play that they have in short yardage situations. And this is a very important short yardage play here. The ball resting uh, inside the two or on the two yard line. With 9.05 left in this football game, the St. Chamarros who need to win this game to clinch the League One Championship are leading Northport Tigers 14 to nothing. Tigers need a victory to get their third win of the season. Would be their third straight victory. All right, here they come. Driving down close to the goal line. Power football. That's what uh, Northport is going with in this situation. Up to make the stop, Scott Crean, the linebacker. I think uh, Station was thinking as I was thinking. You give the ball to your fullback, number 28, um, McCabe. McCabe was blasted right there by the Station front. Curtain. And Curtain's closed. Gets tough down around that goal line. That real estate gets very dear. It's not cheap. Third down, goal to go from the two. McCabe gets the call again, and this time he gets in the end zone. And Northport has scored for the first time today. Northport Tigers, James McCabe, 5'8", 190 senior, goes in from two yards out to cap off a 52-yard drive for the Tigers. Now that was the second best uh, the uh, second best drive they had all afternoon. They had one that went inside the three in the first half. They went for uh, the three points, failed there. This time they got it inside the five and punched her in. So plenty of time left at 8.23 for this game to be, uh, to go either way as we see uh, the coach, the North Fort Tigers. Bob Macaluso. Extra point try is blocked, and that is very, very big. Extra point try was smothered by Jim Isernia, the 5'8", 145-pound senior. He lacks size, but boy, he gets around that one in a hurry. He moves well. Uh, earlier, when uh, Northport went for the extra point, Isernia almost got in to get a piece of it. This time, he goes in, lays his body out there, makes the big kick, and that could be a very costly, costly play for Northport. Yeah, because now you got a position where he's going to take more than a touchdown to win this football game. You yep. can't even tie it with one touchdown. Well, it would take a touchdown, and they would have to go for a, well, a two-pointer. Yeah, the two-point play would, would get you back if you get the eight, but he puts the pressure on you now to do a lot more than you could. Yeah. Take another look here at the touchdown. Number 28, James McCabe. The little guy powers his way in. Bingo, six points. Nine plays, 52 yards. So now to Sachem, 14, Northport 6, 8.23 left in the football game as the shadows lengthen. On an afternoon uh, ideal for those that love football, especially to play it. Crisp, windy. I see, though, you are bundled up. <laughs> a little different being a spectator and playing this game, isn't it, in this kind of weather? Blue skies, <laughs> blue skies, nothing but blue skies. All right, kicking off for Northport, Frank Fortanero. Thank you. 
There's that squibber that they try to use. It bounces around to the 20-yard line where it's claimed by Mike Malat. He steers his blockers, and he gets some good yardage. And again, Sachin will have good field position. So it'll be first down and 10 for Sachem. They've scored two touchdowns in this game, one in the first half, one in the second half. An official is down, was knocked down along the sidelines on the return. He's up. Boy, that's tough to get hit without any padding, and especially you're no longer a teenager. When you get hit, once you get past 22, 23 years old, you feel everything. And you're not in shape to take that kind of pounding. So from the 33-yard line for Sachem, first and 10. Game in which they've led from the early outset, never trailed. But now Northport is back in the football game, and here comes Mike Body. Try to bounce it to the outside, so he goes back to the inside, that tough, tough runner, who now has carried the ball 25 times, and he's gone over 100 yards in the day. And that's a good opening uh, play right here. Body bounces this thing outside, picks up roughly nine, a strong nine yards, we'll call it. James McKay it could be a first down. Makes a stop for Northport. It's been body left and body right. Body inside, body outside. Body must be approaching the 100-yard uh, rushing yes, day. Yeah, we just mentioned that. That's all right. You don't want to pay attention he, to what I'm saying. I'm going to pay attention to what you're saying. Is he there yet? He's there. He has 107 yards. Okay. That's right. But it shows, Emerson, you have a great feel for how many yards a ball carrier gets. And uh, that's obvious because you had a lot of times. Well, did you, was, do you ever add yardage in your head when you were a young kid playing no, football? No, never, never, never bothered never with that. Bothered right? with it, no. okay. I, was, I was cheating somewhat, though. I, I, I heard you <laughs> looked over at the, at, the, at the paper there. I see that the 85, 95 yards. <laughs> well, we don't want to keep it away from you. I want to make you look good, Em. First and 10 for Sachem from their own 43-yard line, leading 14 to 6 over Northport. This time it's the fullback, Leo, who in two carries had picked up 58 yards. This time he will not equal his 29-yard per carry average in this football game. Okay, uh, Northport is going to have to tighten up. If they want to get back uh, into the ball game with a closer score and possibly go for the tie, they cannot allow Leo nor Body to, to clip off four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten yards per clip at this point in the ball game. James McKay made the stop, pick up of five yards. It is second down and five from the Sachem 47. Another hole, they're finding running room as Mike Matlack carries the football across midfield down close to the 45-yard line of Northport. And with the yardage, of course, they kill off the clock to run the clock down. That's what I'm talking about. You watch again, you'll see number 33, Mike Matlack behind the guys that uh, the likes of Dros, Bonfacino, Weinstein, and Cap Caputo. Seven-yard pickup. In with a stop, Steve Gatlin and Peter Miller. So it's first down and 10 for Sachem at the Northport 46. And this is body, but with body and making a very nice initial stop in there for Northport was Greg Pollard, veteran player, two-year starter, had 22 tackles coming in the game. Very solid, consistent, considered better on the pass rush than the ground game, but there he made a very fine stop. Tiger fans still hanging tough. You keep moving on a day like today, too, to keep warm. Absolutely. You've got to keep that old adrenaline going. The blood, that's Coach uh, Fred Fizarro. I'm sure uh, he might be getting a little, little bit worried. Might be reminiscent of last week. Second and eight for Sachem at the Northport 44. This is the Matt Latt as they go to a three-back offense here. Mike Matt Latt, 5'7", 145, junior. Into the grasp of Jeff Bracey, who comes up from his safety spot. Bracey, 5'7", 150, senior. Now, here's a case of getting it on. We see uh, Mike Body come up and give him somewhat of a nice little shadow block, and uh, Matt Latt turns it up inside. Third down and sixth situation now. For Sachem at the Northport 41-yard line. Clock is down to 5.58 left in this football game. Here's the meal ticket. Body goes inside the 40-yard line, but that will not be a first down. Stopped by Kiernan McGowan, the safety, who is a Division I lacrosse prospect. Uh -huh. Body again, he picks his way. He's got that long stride. 
He piles any twist and roll here, but just not enough for the first down. Where do you think they'll play body in college football? I think, I, move him? I think uh, you look at him first as a tailback, but I think he would be better as a defensive ball player. Maybe at a strong safety uh, slot, or even a linebacker. Fourth and three for Sachem on the option. Johnson pitches to body. He will get the first down and more as he runs over people. Still on his feet as he goes down inside the 20-yard line. But there is a flag back here thrown in the neighborhood of the midfield stripes. The man who finally brought him down, Peter Miller, who had a lot of chasing to do from his defensive end and a lot of dragging to do before he pulled down body. There was a flag dropped uh, approximately around the 45-yard line, so it looks like this thing will be coming back. A clipping penalty, and that sets, that's a big play for Northport because that erases a 20-yard run by body means that it'll set up a fourth and long situation for Sachem and means that probably they're going to have to turn the football over on a punt. Northport will get it back, trailing 14 to 6. On the option here, you, you pitch out. We're going to look for the clip. As we see Body weaves his way, we really don't get a clear look at it. See where it was, but it was upfield. Somebody made contact from behind, negating an excellent run by Mike Body, number 31. So it means Northport will get the football back with Craig Clare going back in the single safety position. He averages 12.8 yards on return as they mark the penalty back into territory for Sachem. So for Sachem, they have to give it up for Northport. 5-11 left to go. A chance to tie this football game now. They'll have a chance to get the football back and do something with it. Sachem will have to kick it away from the 41-yard line. That's right. You want to get it here, you go ahead and score. And once you score, you've got to go for the two-pointer, and then you've got yourself a tie ball game. Just that simple. But is it that easy? I don't think so. Mike Pasatino going to punt it away from his own 30-yard line. Short kick. But gets a favorable bounce for Sachem, and will die at around the 30-yard line for Northport. But as far as the Tigers are concerned, the big thing for Robert Macaluso, his team is still alive in this football game with five minutes left to go. Quite frankly, going in, he wasn't sure his team would be alive at five minutes left in this football game. We're going to go back and see if we can pick up that clip on the 20-yard run by Body. It'll be on the right side, top right of your screen, and it should be coming up right about here. Yep. There it is. There it is. Yep. Not easy to see, but there it is. So Northport with the football running back up the middle from the 31-yard line is Craig Clare. In to make the stop, Scott Crean, the linebacker. 432 left in the football game. Sachin leads Northport 14 to 6. The Tigers of Northport do have the football back at their own 34-yard line with a second down and six situation. What might we look for, Emerson, from Northport at this point? I think we'll see more of uh, Vertiber, Vertiber dropping straight back, delivering the pass. We didn't see much, but we saw him late. You are a prophet in your own time, because there it is, and it is completed. A nice throw up the midfield, but then dropped. It was in the arms, but breaking it up was Kelly Smith and John Pirro there, able to break up that pass very nicely. Good defensive play as Fred Musimichi had his hands on it but could not hold it. And take another look here. Uh, Vertiber drops back, finds uh, number 45, Fred Musimichi, and Musimichi just could not hold on to the football. I, th I think we have here, though, a penalty. I don't know which way it'll go. Some of the guys from Sachem are waving this way. Some of North Port are waving that way. So let's let the officials on. Yeah, players aren't very good about telling you what's going <laughs> on. I love when you see two players and opposite teams pointing the opposite way. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Think with your heart and not your head. Yeah. These guys will make the decision. They've done an outstanding job all afternoon, and I'm sure they'll come up with the right decision. Been impressed the way they've controlled the football game. The penalty is against holding against Sachem. Discussing it now with James McCabe, the captain of Northport. With 4.06 left in the football game. They will mark it off against the Sachem Arrows. A nice break for the Northport Tigers because they had it faced with a third down and six situation, but the 15-yard penalty, or the out to the 44-yard line, up close to the 45, and there's a man enjoying himself. You've heard of uh, many dancers. There's the dancing tiger. Oh, the tiger. Well, that's what Sachem's trying to do at this point. <laughs> but the Tigers are on the move. That penalty gives them a first down and 10 situation. 
at their own 44-yard line with 4.06 left in this football game. McCabe is the up back. Craig Clare is the tailback, the deep back. Nice faking by the quarterback. Vertebra, there goes the ball. We're ready to see. Got He's got open. Jenkins, but he can't hang on to it. Eric Jenkins was the intended receiver down the 10-yard line. But goes as an incomplete pass as Kelly Smith and John Pirro and John Driscoll were all back there. Three de defenders for Sachem. Jenkins on the year has only caught one pass. Vertebra gets the ball out in good fashion. Sachem was expecting this kind of thing. It looks as though it was almost picked off by Sachem. Well, they had good coverage. Sachem Arrow's uh, secondary is very active, and they play the pass rather well because they look for pass first and run second. In this situation, they're certainly looking for pass here. Second and 10 for Northport at their 44. They trail 14 to 6, late fourth quarter. The quarterback, Vertebra, looks long, throws it short, and makes a nice connection. Good pass to Gary McGowan. Jack Johnson made the stop for McGowan. He came into this ball game, big target with nine receptions for 122 yards. And that is at least the second pass he's caught this afternoon. That was uh, well executed by Vertiba. He was getting pressure from his right, I think, from uh, Sullivan. Vertiba steps up into the pocket, finds uh, number 81, Karen, downfield wide open. First and 10 for North Point at the Sachem 34-yard line. 3-37 left in the football game. The Tigers at North Point on the move in the last quarter. That's McCabe trying the right side, but right into the grasp of Gary Wojciechowski, the 6'1", 230-pound nose guard, who uses his hands so well, and a quickly improving football player, who as a junior, with one more year to go, should be a, a big force in Suffolk County football next year. That was somewhat of a, what I call a wasted play at that moment. They're doing very well throwing the football, and they run a little one-yarder into the line. Uh, you've got to come here and throw the football. Well, it's second down and eight to go now for Northport at the Sachem 32. The clock is under three minutes. Up back is McKay. The deep back is Claire. Here's that play option. Vandenberg got in pressure, but eluded it. Makes the throw, and it's incomplete. Covering on the play was Jack Johnson over there. Nice defensive play by Johnson. The 6'2", 180-pound senior. So it brings up a third down and eight situation for Northport. We take another look here as Vertebra gets outside and kind of uh, soft pedals it down and it's almost intercepted by number 80, Jack Johnson. Well, another crucial play. Second time we've used that word today, but it certainly is for Northport. Third and eight at the Sachem 32, and they trail 14 to six in the game with 246 left. You've got to put it in the air, Vertebra. Vertebra, we'll see. That's uh, Coach uh, Macaluso. I'm sure he's going to play to throw the football. Two wide receivers on the right side and rolling to that strength is the quarterback, Vertebra. There goes the bomb. Nice catch. A fine throw and Kenan McGowan with the reception over two defenders. Vertebra, the quarterback who struggled all year with his throwing. First four games, he threw the ball poorly, had technical problems, lost his confidence. But in the last three games, he's gained it back. And they're knocking at the goal line, the Northport Tigers right down there. And we take another look at it here, number 44, Vertebury gets the ball down to number 81. Great concentration by Karen McGowan because he's got two station defenders right around him. He's near the sideline. He watches the ball into his hands, out of bounds, right around the two-yard line, isn't it? Yeah, McGowan with five, uh, three receptions for 53 yards now after that 29-yarder. At the three-yard line, they go back up the middle with McCabe carrying with 2.31 and the clock running. McCabe has stopped. As again, that Sachem defense, very tough in the middle, stopped the play on McCabe. Again, the ball is given to the fullback, 190 pounds, 5'8", 190. And number 53, Ray Curtis comes in, makes a fine tackle before McCabe can get fully get into the hole. So it's now second down and goal to go for North Point at the Sachem two-yard line. The clock is down to 2.05 left in this football game. There's a very concerned Coach Macaluso. McCabe is the up back. They give it to McCabe again as he tries to find running room down very close to the goal line. McCabe uh, showed some uh, shifty moves there, tried to go inside his guard, saw that closed, made a little step to the outside. He stopped short of the goal line, though. Now watch it again here. 
nice little step there by McCabe, uh, on, a blitzing linebacker. Now the guy works his way all the way down to approximately the one-yard line. Third down, goal to go for North Port at the Sachem one-yard line. We have a timeout with 132 left in this football game. So the complexion of this game changed rather dramatically here in the last quarter. Sachem was favored going in because they lead the league with a 5-1 and one record. Northport came in with a 2-4 and four record. Form seemed to be prevailing when Sachem took the opening kickoff. Don Bauer ran it back 55 yards down to the 12-yard line when a penalty was tacked on. Three plays later, Mike Body went in, and it was a 7-0 lead for Sachem. But as we see, the coach of Northport, his team very much alive, Robert Macaluso talking things over. Macaluso has a record in Northport in his eighth season. 23 wins, 36 losses, and three ties. Let's go down the huddle. No problem there, okay? I got that in my mind. All right, so we're going for two. But, all right, slot, you got it now. Okay? So we're going to do slot right, uh, uh, slot left, ram, 10. Okay, slot left, ram, 10. Slot left, ram, 10. Now, I would say, and I was playing ball, a 10 would be somewhere right up the gut. You would probably figure between either Tim Spolin, Tom Lynch, or George Perkis. Oh, in that area. Here they come. Third and goal from the one. McCabe is the up back, but it is the quarterback keeping it. Vertebra goes down very close to the goal line. We wait for them to unpile. Boy, a hush falls over the crowd. Still waiting for the signal. Still waiting. Clock is running. Well, it's not a touchdown, limping back in the huddle, limping hard and very uh, heavily on that foot. Number 44, Keith Vertebra, the quarterback. And he has a bad foot, and he tried to take it in there, could not get into the end zone. That ball just shy of the goal line. Emerson Floyd will be fourth down and looks to here just inches away. It looks as though Vertebra will uh, stay in the ball game. He's walking a little bit better, but I'd like to see those quarterbacks when they're going for that little, what we call a quarterback sneak, uh, just to somewhat take a little jab step back as if you're coming out, and then you push off and get up into the air. Yeah, you get a lot more leverage. You get a lot more right. strength. You get a lot more altitude and power. Right. And now you're faced with a fourth down situation inside the one-yard line for Northport, trailing 14 to 6. They were down 14 to nothing in this football game. Now they've got a chance in fourth down and inches to go to punch in a touchdown that would bring them within two points, and then they could go for the two-point play. And uh, should they convert that, we'd have a tie football game. Of course, that's moving along rather swiftly. Yes, we heard Macaluso, <laughs> Coach Macaluso, say if we score here, we're going to go for uh, the two-pointer. All right, here they come. Fourth and goal. McCabe is the up back. Claire is the deep man. Furtiver is the quarterback. He's going to let McCabe carry. McCabe goes down. Touchdown. McCabe on the right side, pushes it in for Northport, and they're jumping for joy on the Northport side of the field as it now is a 14 to 12 football game with a minute and five seconds left. And Northport will go for the two-point play. Now the big miss extra point up into the fourth, top of the fourth quarter by Northport takes a big part forcing Northport to go for the two points and the tie. Yes, when it was blocked, that extra point try, they also missed a field goal from 21 yards in the first half that at this point is even more costly because that three points should put them in front now. Right. Had they made the one before, they could be going for the lead. So a lot hanging in the balance here for both clubs. Here comes the two-point play. McCabe is the up back. Claire is a deep back. Vertebra wants to throw. Arching for the corner. It will be incomplete. So Sachin will hang on to their lead of 14 to 12 as Vertebra tried to throw a pass over the defensive back to his big, tall, wide receiver, Keenan McGowan, who is 6'3", but it goes incomplete. All right, with the score, Sachin 14, Northport 12, 105 left. You see the coach, Robert, for Northport. Wants some uh, help on that. Let's go back. We'll be with you in just a moment. You're watching this game on the Long Island Sports Network. Robert Macaluso, the coach for Northport, was upset over something on that two-point play that did not convert for Northport. That leaves him two points back. Fred Musimichi will kick off. You've got to look for a squib kick here, Emerson. I, I think uh, you will see it here by Coach uh, Macaluso's club. 
Get it on the ground, moving the ball, hopping and bouncing around like uh, in an Easter Bunny. 105 left in the football game. There is the onside kicks and is grabbed by Mike Pasatino. Hangs on to it and Sachem does what they have to do. Hang on the football. So it'll be first down and 10 for Sachem. What they've got to do now is run out the clock with 103 left. They lead it 14 to 12. If they run out the clock here, they will have won the League One Championship for the sixth time during the 14-year reign of their coach, who's had a very successful reign here, Fred Fusaro. First and 10 for the Sachem Arrows at their own 47-yard line. Here's another look at the Tigers touchdown here by number 28, James McCabe, and they're trying to pull his head literally off, and McCabe is top. He whips in there, shows us the ball. That means six. Falling on the football is Mike Johnson, and the two-point conversion, it's kind of a basketball pass. The quarterback drops back and tried to hit his six-foot, three-inch wide receiver, Kenan McGowan, in the coffin corner. But he just threw it too far, tried to loop it over the defender. And as we have pointed out throughout the afternoon, the St. Chimaros have a short secondary. I think what uh, Macaluso, Coach Macaluso, was complaining about the replay here, I think his receiver, Jenkins, might have been bumped to hell somewhere right at that point. You see the defender starts to raise his hand as if to say, I didn't touch him, and uh, the defender was number 80, Jack Johnson. But I think Coach uh, Macaluso thought that he was interfered with. I think you're absolutely right. I think that's what he was calling. So when he wanted pass uh, interference, he did not get it. And so with the clock winding its way down, two seconds, one second, this ball game is history. And the Sachem Arrows have defeated the Northport Tigers 14 to 12. And they are dancing and jumping on the Sachem side, not only because they won this football game, but they have won the League One Championship with a record of six and one of the season. But the Northport Tigers give them a lot of credit. They were down 14 nothing. They could have easily quit in this football game. They did not. They came back and made a contest of it. This is Channel 21, WLIW, Garden City, New York. Mission 1 title game, the Saging Flaming Arrows, battling the Walt Whitman Wildcats. Our telecast is being brought to you by Apple Bank, we're good for you, and by Adelphi University, where real learning is an art. Hi again, everybody. I'm Barry Landers with Emerson Boozer on a beautiful Saturday afternoon in late November. Temperatures in the 50s, slight wind blowing, and just a great day for a great rivalry. Sachem and Walt Whitman, what do you look for, Emerson Boozer? An outstanding football game, Barry. There are two clubs that have played well all year. For Sachem, they've gotten by barely each ball game, be it 7 nothing, 14 nothing, 21 14. But on the other side, Whitman has been the kind of club that has been very explosive. They will beat you by 20 points, 10 points, 15 points. Yet uh, both clubs uh, on the defensive side look very much alike. They can play the strong defense. Most people don't run well against them. So uh, we'll see. I think both clubs go to the passing attack a little bit more than would like to because uh, against the run, they are very tough. Well, the weather conditions ideal to throw the football went from around the about seven miles an hour from the west. And let's talk about Sachem because we had them on earlier this year against Northport again. They struggled, as you said, winning 14 to 12. Mike Body had an outstanding game. He's had another outstanding year, well over a thousand yards. Tell me about Mike Body. Mike Body is the kind of guy that uh, most college coaches look at and says, gee, this guy could be a running back, he could be a wide receiver, he could be a defensive back. He's just an all-around athlete. But coming out of the backfield, he's uh, a, a guy that's not going to impress you with any flashiness. He's a guy that picks a hole very well. He has a deceptive, lo deceptively long stride, and he has power. He's the kind of guy that can run 120, 30 yards on him before you know it. Well, they've got an injury to Don Leo, their fine fullback, who was really coming on late in the season. Joe Crespin, a fullback sophomore, is going to be starting at
at that spot, and there's a lot of pressure on him. But as we mentioned earlier, they can throw the ball, say, to Mike Johnson has some outstanding receivers, Passantino, Coyle, the likes of several. Yes, they can. Uh, I think uh, Leo might play, the, the Leo loss might play a big part. As you might know, he's out with a with an ankle injury, out playing a little one-on-one uh, -on -one basketball, hurts, hurts an ankle, so that's got to hurt Stacey quite a bit. But uh, Gaspin coming in, he could be the key. Uh, if he can maintain the kind of poise that he's shown at the JV level, a junior high level, and play that way in a championship ball game, he could make the big difference because most people don't know much about him. Yeah, a lot of people feel that Whitman's uh, excellent defense, a 6-2, will force the ball to be thrown a lot more today by Mike Johnson and Sachem. Talking about Waltwin, a very balanced attack offensively. They can throw the football with Matt Walsh. Uh, they've completed 51% of their passes. They've got outstanding runners led by Eric Moore, the fullback. Uh, yes, they can. They can throw the football, but they can rely on the workhorse, big number 20, Eric Moore. He's, uh, he's a real load. The guy's about 6 feet, 230 pounds. It reminds me of Phillips from Bay Shore. Both uh, huge ball players, outstanding college prospects as far as a runner. Uh, so when we see the football being run, we'll see the big guy carried a lot, but uh, they don't only use Eric Moore. They've got two other runners back there that can run also. Uh, the other runners, Richie Spadaro and Mike McGinley, and outstanding wide receivers like Sean McCauley, Kirk Murphy, and Darrell Felder. All burners, and it should be an exciting game. Our colleague, uh, Carl Reuter, is standing by. He'll be back in just a moment with his pregame notes. You're watching the Long Island Sports Network. This may come as a surprise to you, but money does grow on trees. It grows faster at Apple Bank branches all over town, in high-interest CDs, money market accounts, free checking accounts that pay interest. For all you need to help your money grow and grow and grow, visit any full-service Apple Bank branch. Who says money doesn't grow on trees? Apple Bank for savings. We're good for you. I never ran before I came to Adelphi. Now I can't imagine not doing it. It really helps having the kind of encouragement I've gotten here. It makes Adelphi feel like a small college. But I'm glad it's a big university with lots of courses and career options because I'm making choices that will affect my whole life. I'm excited about my future. In fact, sometimes I can't wait to graduate. It's sort of like running. Once you get started, you want to see how far you can go. Adelphi University, where the advantages of a major university and a small college meet. We're down here on the field before the start of today's game between Walt Whitman and Sachem. A story to be told maybe about Walt Whitman. They have a bunch of guys. It's basically a senior-oriented team. This is the same team that has only won three games over the past two years. You talk to Coach Rich Caritti, he says, same kids. It's just the results are a lot different this year. Something else interesting about this team. Walt Whitman last week, to get into this game, had to beat West Islip. They beat him by a score of 13 to 7. Sachem's lone loss this season was to West Islip. So a little bit of uh, some byplay could come into this encounter for the uh, Suffolk Division I Championship. Also, it'll be the first playoff game in some 10 years for Walt Whitman. Another thing that they have going for them at this point. They're eager, they're ready to go, and the field conditions are exceptional at this point. This, the turf is really solid. There should be some good traction. On the other hand, for Sachem, it's a game in really which they have to win rather impressively if they want to capture the Rutgers Cup. The last time Sachem captured the Cup was in 1977. The only thing standing in their way right now would be Comsawag and Bayshaw, who are going to battle it off in another Suffolk County game. If Comsawag was to beat Bayshaw and Sachem was to win here, well, you never know what really happens with the Riders. So Sachem really is going to have to win handily this afternoon. And we're going to be back with Walt Whitman versus Sachem for this Suffolk County Division One championship game following this time out. You're watching the Long Island Sports Network. NBC's young researcher, Bob Siegel, probes Washington for straight answers to tough questions. Bob's a total media person and credits his skills to Adelphi University and professors like Paul Pitkoff, an award-winning filmmaker who prepares his students to solve communications hey, problems. The answers Bob got at Adelphi helped prepare him for his career. Maybe you'll find your answers at Adelphi, too. Hi, I'm Barry Landers with Jerry McDougall, president of Apple Bank. Jerry, we're just delighted to welcome Apple Bank as a member of our LISN family this year. 
great, Barry, and we're certainly happy to join with LISN in encouraging the participation and honest competition in these sports events, which we think is good for our youth and good for Long Island. Apple Bank for Savings. We're working hard for you with five Long Island locations. Call 757-6100, member FDIC. We're back at Walt Whitman High School where the Wildcats have won the toss and will be getting the footballs. The excitement starts to build here, Emerson Boozer, on a magnificent day. And as Carl Reuter alluded to, I guess the series, uh, the last time they won was 1980. And of course, last year, Walt Whitman remembers that 43-0 shutout. A lot of people felt, including the Walt Whitman people, perhaps say to the score up, and teams remember those kind of things. Yeah, most folk have had that kind of conversation around town for about a year now, but I just don't believe that. No one coach, uh, Freddie Rosario, he's not the kind of guy that would like to run the score because he's had good teams every year. So there was no reason why uh, you would run the score up here against women because he grew up in Huntington. Mike McGinley is deep to get the kick here as uh, Sachem will be kicking off going from left to right. There is a slight wind blowing at Sachem's back. As you see, the Walt Whitman Wildcat cheerleaders, they've been waiting for this game. One and seven last year. They won two games the year before Sachem, perennial power. They've been League One champ six of the last eight years. As we're getting set for the kickoff coming up here, Peter Sato will be doing the kicking off, number 43, on a glorious day for football. The Suffolk County Conference One Division One Championship game is underway. McGinley will take it at the four-yard line. To the 10, 15, 20, 25, and is down at the 26, 27-yard line, where Walt Whitman will put it in play first and 10. Let's run down that Walt Whitman offense for you because a very diversified offense. The quarterback will be number 10, Matt Walsh, 6 foot 160 pound senior, who's completed 51% of his passes, 51 for 100, for 890 yards. That's almost 20 yards of pop. And uh, the running backs will be Eric Moore, number 20, the fullback. Splitting time at the tailback spot will be number 33, Richie Spadaro, who's in there right now, and Mike McGinley, number 32. Chris Montanero is the tight end. Kirk Murphy, the split end, number 83. And the handoff going to uh, Spadaro as he cracks off the left side of the line, taken down by Jim Isernia, the right cornerback. That's Sachem defense, Emma, 5-2-4, and they're very tough. Nobody has run the football on them all year. They are a good, sound defensive unit because uh, they play well together. They know how to play the game. And uh, we'll see them uh, stop this running attack by Whitman at times. There are times when teams are going to look pretty good on the run, but overall not that productive. Well, set that Whitman uh, offensive line at the moment. They send out two wide receivers to their side. Sean McCauley lined up wide to the left at the bottom of your picture. The handoff to the big fullback Moore, and he tries to get the first down, doesn't have it. He stopped after a two-yard gain. Todd Drost, the left tackle, number 76, 6'3", 215-pound senior, and Ray Kirk, number 53, gained on the stop. Officials working this championship game. There's the referee, Joe Dooley. The umpire, Tony Fiorentino, the linesman, Joe Brady, the line judge, George DeMatteo, and the uh, fact judge is Frank Luce. Third down, M, short yardage, what do you look for here? I think uh, they would throw the football, but uh, since it's opening series, they might play it uh, a little carefully and keep it on the ground. Third and three for the Whitman Wildcats, and the handoff going to number 33, Spadaro. He has the first down and falls forward across the 40-yard line, down at the 41 by, again, Jim Isernia, the right quarterback, and the strong safety, Jack Johnson, number eight. This is being uh, careful here. Opening series of the ball game, giving the ball to uh, Rich Spiritti. Spiritti gets a good block by his fullback, but 20 yard more gets to the outside. Shows a lot of power from Luca. So Spadero picks up the first down up to the 41 yard line. Whitman scored more points and gave up the fewest points than any club in conference division one. And a handoff up the middle, breaking into the secondary. Number 32, Mike McKinley, who has the blazing speed, runs to daylight, 5 to 175 pound senior, who's rushed 93 times from 450 yards coming in, finally stopped by Kelly Smith, number 36. Watch number 20 here, Eric Moore gives him a good little block, and uh, McGinley finds a crack from his offensive line between uh, Robinson and uh, Hanson up the field for a big gainer. And they're close to the first down. They'll bring the chains and give us a moment to talk about that offensive line. The right tackle, Zaro Propati, number 76, 6'2", 215 pound senior. The right guard, Joe Grella, number 53, 5 ton, 85 pound senior. As you can see, another first down for the Wildcats. The center, Peter Hansen, number 50, 6 feet, 205 senior, two-year starter. Chris Robinson, who you mentioned, the smallest guy there, 5'10", 170, but very, very quick. He'll pull a lot. And number 72, Chris Kammer, 6'190", uh, pound, two-year starter, very consistent player. 
but Propati and Grella are the leaders on the right side of the line. Handoff going this time to uh, number 32 and driven back that time as Gary Butel made the stop as they unpile. It'll be a short gay check. It was number 33, Richie Spadaro on the carry, but Gary Butel stopped him. And it's a short pickup. Let's call it a round two and make it second down and eight. It's it's probably the stingiest uh, piece of yardage this station has given up in this series. Thus far, the Wildcats has come out feeling evidently that they can run the football against a very stingy station by Arrow. Working out of the eye formation, Walt Whitman. And faking, now play action. Throwing the ball, Walsh to the side, incomplete. Chris Montanero, the tight end number 88, the intended receiver. And uh, Walsh threw it over his head. Chris has caught 12 passes for almost 200 yards, an average of 16.5 yards, and a touchdown and a two-point conversion. We take here another look here. Walsh comes out, play action, and uh, tries to find number 88, Chris uh, Montanero. Just throw a little bit too wide. Now Jack Johnson setting up defensively in that strong secondary that St. Jim's had all year. Kelly Smith, John Piero, number nine, and Jim Isernia, number 22. On third down, and let's call it a Kirk Murphy lines up at the top of your picture, wide to the right. In motion is Richie Spadaro. Out of the eye, pitch goes to Spadaro, cutting to the right side. He's downfield, has the first down as he's driven down at the 35, taken down by Ray Curtin. So the man in motion, the pitch to Spadaro, and he turned the Jets on, has deceptive speed, doesn't look as fast as he is, according to a lot of people, 5'8", on 65-pound senior. We take another look, you'll see... Uh... Uh, Spadaro comes back in motion, gets a little pitch from Walsh, and really turns a corner when he gets up field. The reason uh, Spadaro doesn't look fast, he's got a long stride like, like Mike Body has. So we've got now first and 10. Their third first down on this drive. Spadaro's gained 25 yards at four carries. This is McGinley, and he cracks forward for around three, four tough yards before Scott Crean, number 51, and Jack Johnson, number 80, combine to stop him. But a smart-looking drive for Walt Whitman, almost primarily on the ground, as now Richie Spadaro replaces Mike McGinley. When you have two tailbacks like that, and you can uh, alternate, and you don't lose much, you have a very, very strong club. All right, the key right, the key has been coming in. Uh, you're looking at big number 20, Eric Moore, and when you've got two tailbacks that can run the football, it sets up that the counterattack, and that's what they're doing right now. Right now, Murphy lined up wide to the right, McCauley wide to the left and trying to fall forward and dive for a couple of extra yards was McGinley. A second Spadaro. Spadaro picks up about four yards, setting up a third and let's call it three. Todd Gross, the left tackle, 6'3", 215 pound senior, who's uh, done an excellent job as a nose for the ball made the stop. And another big third down play for Walt Whitman as they've driven the ball inside the 30 down to the 28 yard line. No score here in the first uh, quarter. Looking for a clock here. We try to find it and uh, We'll pick it up for you. 8.05 to go here in this opening quarter. Back to throw. Walsh with plenty of time. Looking sideline. He's got McCauley out there. Great catch. And he's in for the touchdown. Check it. Kirk Murphy was the receiver. Number 83, 6'3", 175 pound senior. And they're going wild here at Walt Whitman. Murphy had caught eight passes for an average of 30 yards a catch and three touchdowns before that one. Excellent hands and speed. A basketball player had to use some of that basketball ability to go up to that one. Yes, that was about a 22, 23 yard touchdown pass. And I'm talking to uh, Coach Fuzzaro just before the ball game. What were his biggest fears coming from these Wildcats? He said the passing game. Uh, Walsh can throw the football. The receivers have excellent hands. And uh, he was more fearful of the passing game than that running. Nice touch on that ball. Beautifully thrown ball. He had an excellent game last week against West Islip. Here's the try for the extra point. It is up and it is good. So Scott DeManthe boots it through. He had kicked 13 of 19 previously. Now 14 for 20 in extra points. And Walt Whitman with an excellent drive and goes 74 yards on eight plays. And this 34-yard Walsh to Murphy touchdown pass capped the drive. You won't see a finer pass thrown here by number 10, Matt Walsh at the high school level. He finds uh, one of his favorite receivers, the split end, number 83, Kirk Murphy. Good reception, stays in bounds, tight ropes, six points. Couldn't have asked for a better play anywhere on both ends. So they're going to mark it as a 29-yard touchdown pass, not a 34-yarder. But Walt Whitman has struck first here. Now, mind you, this Sachem Club does not give up a whole lot of points. In fact, uh, they came in averaging just about uh, giving up about eight points a ball game. 
Their only loss this year to West Islip, six to nothing. They've beaten Lindenhurst, 12-7, Ward Melville, 14-6, Patchogue, 49-28, Connecticut, 14-7, Brentwood, 28-7, Northport, 14-12, Half Hollow Hills East, 28-14, and Hopog, 14-7. Walt Whitman, on the other hand, beat Newfield, 43-0, North Babylon, 29-6, Smithtown East, 21-2, Longwood, 26-0, Lindenhurst in a thriller, 14-13, West Islip 13-7, and they're only lost to Hopog, 12-0. The team last week that St. Jim defeated, and of course they beat West Islip 13-7. Short kick taken upfield by Bauer, who had that big kickoff return against Northport. He's not going to go anywhere, taken down at the 25-yard line. A good defensive coverage by the Wildcats. They got down, it looks as though Bauer at one point might get outside, but the Wildcats were able to corral him. So it'll be first and 10 for St. Jim's Flaming Arrows. The quarterback, Mike Johnson, number 11, six foot on 75 pound senior 64 for 119 for 961 yards and six touchdowns the fullback will be Joe Gressman the sophomore number eight six one 180 pounder Mike body the brilliant tailback six two 185 senior who's averaged to over a hundred yards a game rushing this year has over a thousand this year had 1350 last year they line up in a pro set in the backfield slot left formation and a handoff going to body off the left side of the line and he shoved right back by that fired up Walt Whitman defense as he was stopped that time by Chris Hammer, the left foot in that 6 2 defense. And let's talk about the top of the 6 2 defense and what's the key to it. Right now, you want to, you want to try to attack it from tackle to tackle, as you saw. Uh, with uh, Sachem opening up, trying to go at their tackles immediately between left guard Brian Long and number 72, Chris Chambers. They're trying to crack the corners. You don't want to come inside between guard, center, and guard because you've got those two uh, linebackers setting inside, and uh, they're just sitting there waiting like a mousetrap. They're little guys, Richie Spadaro and Mike McGinley at 5'8", 165, 5'10", 175, and you operate that 6'2". Walt Whitman went into it late last year to kind of protect the linebackers. Teams have been running on them using a five-man front. They shut teams down this year with that six-man front just did a tremendous job as they've held opponents to just seven uh, points a game. Those two linebackers are the same two guys that uh, were instrumental in that running drive in the last series by the Wildcats, both uh, Sp uh, Spadaro and McGinley. Second and eight. Johnson handing off inside and body again short game, maybe a two-yard pickup once more. Chris Cameron and Mike McGinley combined to stop him 72 and 32. Rest of that Sachem offense, the flanker, and they'll be alternating guys. Chris Cascone has just checked in the lineup number 26, and he is in the ball game right now. The tight end, Bobby Venturo, 88. The split end, Mike Passantino, number 38. The right tackle, Mark Joe Wojciechowski, number 74. Right guard, Scott Bonavicino, number 73. Center is Todd Crust, 76. The left guard, Vinny Yacono, number uh, 54. And the left tackle, Adam Weinstein, 75. On third down, Johnson to throw. Looking to the sideline, and it it's complete. And out of bounds as he found his receiver open, Chris Casco, the six foot on 65 pound senior. He had caught 15 passes for 321 yards coming into this game and two touchdowns. Kirk Murphy drove him out of bounds, but a nicely thrown ball by Mike Johnson. Uh, and the replay again, we see Mike comes out, number 11. He finds uh, number 26, Chris Casco, running the next one out outside to pick up a big first down. He's a good receiver, can catch in the crowd. None of these Sachem receivers are breakaway threats uh, like Wild Walt Whitman, but they're all all have good hands ever since. And that's what you want uh, more than anything. You want uh, to the, catch the football first. Out of the pro set. Flanker to the left side and to the right side. Two tight end formation. Johnson to throw on first down. Now will run with a gaping hole up the middle across midfield. He's at the 40, at the 35, still on his feet and dragged down and around the 22-yard line. Kirk Murphy ran him out, but what a hole opened up right up the middle for Mike Johnson, the quarterback, who has been running a lot better lately. He's done an outstanding job, ran for 70 yards last week against Hop Park. Uh, this is what can happen to a club, as you'll see number 11, Mike Johnson, rolls back. Look for an opening, but the uh, Wildcats are covering very well downfield, so Mike took, took no time taking off, picks up a big gainer, and he has the uh, station arrows in scored position. 37-yard run for quarterback Mike Johnson. What an explosive opening to this uh, championship game. Now working out of the eye. Grespin, number eight, the fullback. The tailback is body 31. Wide to the right is Chris Caputo. Flags go down. Body up the middle for about three tough yards. But we will have an illegal procedure call against the backfield in motion call against Sachem. And it'll set up a first and 15, as I'm sure they'll take the five-yard walk-off. Then we could pick up the penalty as the movement in the backfield. Long count, and they 
sophomore fullback, Joe Grespin, who's got to be a little bit tight end. He played a few downs last week, but with Leo out with that uh, broken ankle, suffered that basketball uh, accident last Sunday, what pressure on a sophomore coming into the championship game just up from the JV? It's kind of tough on Joe Grespin because uh, uh, he's got to be excited about being with a varsity club and coming in this time of year, I think just coming in last, last week or early this week, coming in uh, to fill a slot in a championship game. The pressure has to be tremendous. Bobby Venturo comes out as a tight left end. Passantino as the tight right end. Full house backfield now. They've got Grespin in there with John Pirro, number nine. And body 31. And a fake handoff. Johnson screen pass out to Grespin. And the sophomore drops the football. He had a couple of blockers out there. But also a couple of Walt Whitman Wildcats are defending in the area. He had number 75, Mike Sansada over there. And it'll set up a uh, third down situation, rather second and 15, as they huddle back at the 35-yard line. In case you're just tuning in, Walt Whitman went 74 yards in eight plays. A 29-yard touchdown pass from Matt Walsh to Kirk Murphy capped the scoring drive. Now 5.55 remaining in this first quarter. And Sachem on the drive, but they've got second and 15 at the 26-yard line. Now Johnson motioning to Grespin where to line up. Split backfield. Long count here. Nearly didn't get that play off in time. Johnson floods to a side, drops it off now to Body. Juggles. He's got it at the 20. Down the sideline and driven out of bounds at around the 15-yard line. It should be shy of the first down. Rich Spadero drove him out, the linebacker, an all-league performer, quick, fast, and aggressive. But he picked up a good 10 yards on that one. Here are two screens in a row. The first one dropped by Gessman. This time, uh, uh, he comes right back and throws the football. As Mike Johnson throws this time to number 31. Body, body gets a good block outside and almost gets away on one little tackle here. It's third down and about, uh, let's call it four, as the football is at the 14-yard line. They've got to go make it to 15. They've got to go to about the 10 and a half, 11-yard line. Big play for the Sachem Flaming Arrows, trailing 7 nothing. As out over the ball comes center, Todd Drust, as you see from our end zone camera. Line up in a house backfield, full house backfield, three backs behind the quarterback. Long count again by Johnson. He'll option it off to Body. He's got openings, falls down, but he may have slipped for the first down at the 10. Nope, they're going to mark his foot going down at the 12, which would be just about maybe a half yard shy of the first down. Body fell forward to the 10, but his knee went down. A tough break for Body because he had the first down with that speed, 4-6-5. And he ran last year for 170 yards and two touchdowns against Walt Whitman, and they remember that very well. Yes, that time, Body number 31, not had the first down. It's just that uh, losing his footing and uh, looking in the likes of number 31, Darrell uh, Felder, uh, lost his footing. Excellent uh, Wildcat secondary. Felder, 31. Kirk Murphy, 83. And Sean McCauley, 87. As you see, they're going to measure. And it is very, very close. Just about three or four inches shy of the first down. And I'm sure Seiching with Mike Body and company is going to go for it. Bobby Venturo has come into the play from the sideline from coach Freddie Fusaro. I think uh, right now we'll see uh, uh, a little time call and the Mike Johnson will go out and go right behind number 76, Todd Gross, number 73, Bona Vincio, Bon Vincino. They're and, big uh, boys, 215, 210, and Wojciechowski, of course, is the biggest at 230. Power eye formation, fourth and inches. Johnson to Grespin, and the sophomore gets to the 10-yard line and should have the first down. It is a first down. It should be goal to go. The nose of that football inside the 10 as they unfile. Let's give you that Wildcat defense. The left tackle or left defensive end of the 6-2, number 42, Jack DeWitt. Very aggressive, has eight sacks so far, 6'1 on 75 pound junior. Left tackle number 54, Brian Long, 6'1 on 95 senior, a transfer from Holy Family. The left guard, as you see Sachem lining up. Left guard is Chris Cameron, number 72. The right guard, Zaro Propati, 76. Right tackle is Mike Sansada, 75. And the right end, Joe Grella, 53. On first and goal from the 10 yard line, power eye formation. And a handoff coming to number 33. That's Mike Matlack, and he's stopped dead cold by that Walt Whitman defense. Linebacker Mike McGinley 
getting in there very quickly to stop Matlack, 5'7", 145 pound junior, who's carried uh, 65 times for 350 yards and two touchdowns coming in. As you see McGinley come back inside, uh, that's the other thing you don't want to want to do. It looked to be number 76, Zaro Propata, and uh, he was able to shoot that thing down right now. You're running into the jaws of a defense like that. Johnson inside. will probably have to throw against his Whitman defense. That's 6-2, packed in tight now, almost an eight-man front. Long count again by Johnson, and flag goes down. Another illegal procedure penalty. Boy, they can kill you on a drive. Walt Whitman, or rather Sachin, was able to overcome one on this drive downfield. Now they get another one, and that moves the football back to the 14-yard line. Looked like Joe Gressman again. The sophomore was the one who moved. Yes, you'll look again, you'll see the up man here, the fullback, just a little squinch there, and a uh, body goes off key a little bit there because of the squints, and you just can't do it. You've got to be able to set steady in the boat, even though it's a little bit of rocky, you've got to be steady. Now timeout has been taken, I believe, as uh, you see Lou Antonati, the coach, the defensive coach of the Wildcats, who've done such an outstanding job. And this is basically the same Walt Whitman club that went one and seven last year, won only two games the year before, but what a difference this year. You know, uh, they say uh, sports, or football especially, uh, is a game of repetition. Uh, you do it long enough, you learn how to do it very well. And I think uh, having come out of that one and seven season last year, these guys did it for a long time, they did it in a losing effort. Uh, they're all coming back this year as seniors. Now they know they learn how to do it in a losing situation this year let's make it win now well, they believe in themselves they had a tie this year against Brentwood blew a 21 nothing lead almost came back to win it as you see Lou Antonetti who's also the uh, Smithtown East lacrosse coach and he's been working with Rich Caritti who's a good friend of his they play college ball together they've been working the last six years Walt Whitman by the way had a Rutgers Cup back in 1974, and Sachem has a Rutgers Cup in 77. And Rutgers Cup very much on the line on this final day. Football, as we take a look at the Suffolk rankings right now, Comsawag, they're playing uh, Bayshore in a great football game today. Sachem, of course, ranked number three. Central Islip upset by Belport in the Shocker so far this year. St. John the Baptist, the Catholic school winner. They'll be playing in the Metro Bowl next week. Walt Whitman ranked sixth. Huntington seventh. They lost a heartbreak at a Bayshore last week. John Glenn playing today against... Uh, uh, another club, West Islip. John Glenn, by the way, playing Hampton Bays, I believe. And West Islip, number nine, and Riverhead, number ten. It's going to be very tough for either Sachem or uh, Whitman, rather, to uh, get the Rutgers Cup, depending upon what uh, Comstock does. Well, if Comstock wins, you'd have to feel undefeated and just a tie that they would get it. Now it is second down and 15 from the 15-yard line. Second and goal. Out of the power eye formation. The handoff to Grespin. And uh, Grespin, oh, check it. Uh, it is a quarterback keeper Johnson going inside. I was following Grespin up the middle, but Johnson on a keeper, a brilliant run. Sean McCauley finally stopped him, the safety, and not before he picked up a big gain, and Kirk Murphy also helping out, but he picked up about 11 tough yards on that one. And we watch again. This is what number 11, Mike Johnson, does very well. It comes down on the option. Now he sees that he has a, a bit, the uh, chance to pitch out, but he decides to keep the football himself, moves it inside. Excellent piece of running, and he gets the ball down inside. To five. So let's give him a pickup of round 10. It is still third and goal from the five yard line. Beautiful run by Johnson as he faked me out up here in the press box. Johnson down low on third down. Looking for the end zone for Cascon. And it's going to be complete for the touchdown. Is it Passantino? 38 over there. Yes, Passantino was the man who caught the football. Mike Passantino, the leading receiver, 25 catches for 425 yards, three touchdowns, and the 6'1", 200-pound senior comes up with a dandy catch to make it 7-6. I know, uh, <laughs> I know Rich, Coach Rich Green has gotten to be a little bit perturbed a bit because after watching him work Wednesday, he had them working against that very same play all afternoon in that defensive session, rather, and then the first time they use it, they score. Well, the punt, the extra point try by Pete Sato, it's 7-6 now. Whitman moving in the line, and uh, they're going to be offside, I believe, here. Unless they were drawn offside. It is against Whitman. Now, let's see if they'll go for two here. They're going to move the football from the three-yard line to the yard-and-a-half marker, and they might go for two here. It's a decision for Freddie Fusaro. Should this game go into overtime, by the way, or should it end in a tie, we will have an overtime. The new rules this year, one team will get the ball at the 10-yard line, have a series of downs to get it in. And the other team will have the option, of course, right after that to try to score as well. They're going to still go for it. Peter Sato 
who is a fine kicker, but had his problems earlier in the year with a holder and center. Soccer style kicker, 5'8 on 50 pounder, will be attempting the kick here. Ball is down, the kick in the air, looks good, and it is. So we're tied with 3.15 remaining in this first quarter at 7-7. I like what has happened here. Uh, it shows that both of these clubs are championship quality. The Wildcats take their opening drive, go down, punch it in for seven, and then the Station Arrows come right back. Long drive, take it in for seven. We'll look at the Mike Johnson to Mike Pasatino touchdown play here, five-yarder. Uh, Pasatino works his way down to the end zone. We saw him do a lot of this this year, and uh, Mike Johnson, with lots of pressure, was able to get the ball out to number 38, Mike Pasatino. Two men were over there defending on the play. Pasatino, the best receiver, had a big catch in last year's uh, East Islip Championship game, that controversial game that resulted in a championship tie between the two clubs. That drive, a 75-yarder in 10 plays, very similar to the Walt Whitman drive, which went 74 yards in eight plays, and Johnson's six-yard pass to Passantino, the closing play, the key play, that 37-yard run by Johnson, and also that 10-yard run by Johnson that set it up at the five for third and five. They are both both good football clubs. They both are well-coached, and uh, we'll see a fine ball game this afternoon. Now we'll have the kick coming from Peter Sato. 3.15 to go in this championship game. And of course, we want to congratulate some of the Nassau County teams. Cold Spring Harbor, big impressive win over Mineola to win the League Four, the small school championship. And last night, Hempstead, Buddy Krumenacher's club, defeated uh, that tough Baldwin club 22-0 to win the Conference One championship. This is Eric Moore at the 10-yard line at the 20 and driven out of bounds at around the 25-yard line, where it'll be first and 10 for the Walt Whitman Wildcats as we're deadlocked at 7-7 here. Walt Whitman averaging 21 points a game, giving up just seven per game. And again, it'll be Matt Walsh, the quarterback, Eric Moore, number 20, the fullback, Richie Spadaro, 32, 33, and Mike McGinley, 32, alternate at the tailback spot. The flanker, 87, Sean McCauley. The tight end, Chris Montanaro, 88. And the split end will be Kirk Murphy, number 83, alternating with Darrell Felder, number 31. Now Murphy lines up wide to the right, and Moore gets the call and gets short yardage, maybe to the 26-yard line. Todd Grost, number 76, uh, made the stop. Todd's dad, by the way, played for the University of South Carolina. He's 6'3", 215, and has the kind of frame that could fill out. A lot of people feel that he might be a Division I or 1AA prospect. Yes, uh, I like Gross, too. He's got that same kind of build that his father had. He's, he's got the good range, good height, and a well-built body. I think somewhere now, Gross is pressing somewhere around 330, 40 pounds. McCauley lines up wide to the left. They've got a slot left formation. Back to throw wall, drilling it to the side. It is complete to Kirk Murphy. Murphy close to the first down, taken down at around the 34 or 35 yard line. Let's see where they mark the ball, but another smartly thrown pass by Matt Walsh, who's two for three right now in the passing department for 37 yards. John Pirro, number nine, the left cornerback, defended on the play. He has a couple of interceptions. At Sage of Defense, the coordinator, Steve Hackett, Tony Patillo handles the line, Frank Luisi the ends, and offense, Steve Tuttle, along with, of course, head coach Fred Fusaro. It's third and about a yard. What do you look for here, Ed? Big pullback? I, I would say come back with the tailback, but Gidley and uh, uh, Spadaro have run the ball very well. Little movement on the line. Looked like the left side of the Walt Whitman line moved quickly, and that will be a costly penalty. A legal procedure will move the football back five and make it a third and six instead of third and one. That's exactly what has happened. The uh, offensive line for the Wildcats uh, got off the mark just a little bit too soon. And if you watch off to the right there, you'll see number 60 there come out of the starting gates just a little bit too soon. That's Chris Robinson. Oh, that moves the football back. And I give you Sachem credit. They had a couple of penalties on that drive. They were able to overcome those penalties. That's the mark of a good football player. Right. They were able to uh, regain their balance and uh, set steady in the boat and gone down the river. Now it's third and six. Walsh in a passing situation. Pitches to Moore. Moore trying to turn up field and is close to the first down. It's going to be very close. Jim Isernia, the right quarterback, finally brought him down along with number 51 defending on the play. St uh, Scott Crean. And I believe they're going to bring the chains in to measure him because it is going to be awfully close to a first down. I'm going to say from my good eye here that, uh, not, uh, not my bad eye, my good eye, that it's a first down. <laughs> All right, they'll bring it in, and we'll see if M's good eye or bad eye is working. <laughs> <laughs> We've just had a great football season, Em and I, and this is our final telecast on the LISN of high school football. It is a first down, so the good eye is there. I tell you, I work with a couple of guys with great eyes. Sean Fontana does the hockey broadcast. 
with me on the Islanders and Emerson Boozer. Nine times out of ten, Em, you, you're right. Well, see, being an extra trotter myself, uh, you, you know, you, <laughs> you squirm, you wiggle for that extra first down, or the extra yardage, rather, and Eric Moore at that time was pressing for the first down and got it. McCauley and Montanero will line up in a slot left formation. On first down, the handoff going to Spadero, and he's not going to turn the corner. Number 80 with a super defensive play. Jack Johnson, the strong safety, quick and big at 6 2 180, makes big plays. And he ran down the ball carrier very, very well. Now here, uh, the ball carrier gets a little bit too anxious. He should have been coming right inside behind his big fullback, number 20, Eric Moore. And had he come inside, he wouldn't have had that four or five-yard loss. He might have picked up three or four. Spadero, who's an excellent lacrosse player, an attackman, an excellent student, maybe uh, going up to Amherst or St. Lawrence. Driven down for a five-yard loss. Let's make it second in about 15. 34 seconds to go in the quarter. The handoff going to Moore. He blasts up the middle and drags a couple of tacklers before he's taken down shy of the first down. But a good pickup of about 12 yards. Kelly Smith, the free safety, finally draw, dragged him down. But you saw the power of Eric Moore at yep. six foot 230. You also saw something else. You saw his acceleration right away. And look at those big legs get the turning. This guy can really take off. They say he's about a 4-7, uh, 40 yard man sprint. He's uh, run for 777 yards, 135 carries, about five yards of pop, nine touchdowns. And that'll do it for the first quarter as the first quarter's come to an end. We'll be back in just a moment. Our county championship Division I football game. You're watching the Long Island Sports Network. This may come as a surprise to you, but money does grow on trees. It grows faster at Apple Bank branches all over town, in high-interest CDs, money market accounts, free checking accounts that pay interest. For all you need to help your money grow and grow and grow, visit any full-service Apple Bank branch. Who says money doesn't grow on trees? Apple Bank for savings. We're good for you. Hi, I'm Scott Miller, inviting you to spend the middle of your day with me. We'll share some coffee break concerts and get the latest dope on the soaps. I'll turn your lunch hour to gold with a midday special and make you a dinner winner with the 106 song. And as always, maximum music and maximum prizes. Join me weekdays from 10 to 3 for Miller Time on WBLI. WBLI, FM 106, Long Island's best radio. Maximum music, WBLI. You're tuned to Viacom Cable Vision of Long Island, TV6. As we begin the second quarter, Matt Walsh, number 10, with his club huddled around him. Walsh has uh, thrown the ball well so far today. He has a two for three for 37 yards and a touchdown. And a third and two situation up at the 43-yard line. What do you look for, Emerson Boozer? Uh, I think right now they should go back with that running game. And they pitch it to Moore, trying to turn the corner outside as the first down as he gets close to midfield. Again, that acceleration for the big guy. At six feet, 230 pounds, he can run inside and bang away, and he can run outside. He's broken some long ones this year. Kelly Smith finally stopped him along with John Pirro, but again, he broke into that secondary. Right, uh, the big guy got outside. That's what I like about this big fullback. He has the speed to get the ball outside, and once he turns up, he is murder on a cornerback. Well, he's much more disciplined, much more serious about his football and his school, Eric Moore, this year. Five carries, 29 yards, about six yards of pop on first down. Handoff going to the tailback, and Mike McGinley dives for a couple of uh, tough yards before Ray Curtin, the linebacker, in that 5-2-4 uh, defense stopped him. Curtin's their leading tackler with 52 tackles, one interception, 5'10 on 85 powder, plays the run very well, good lateral movement. And he and Scott Crean very similar as linebackers, both not exceptionally big, uh, but real tough football players at 185, 195. Yeah, Curtin had a head-on-head uh, head -on -head, uh, collision with number 20, Aaron Moore, but Curtin was able to uh, fall off as the ball carrier tried to go by. Two-yard pickup at second and eight at the 49-yard line. Fake. Walsh pitches back. 
And Spadaro turns the corner and fumbles the ball out of bounds, but got across the 45. It'll be shy of the first down. Let's see where they mark his forward progress. It'll be around the 42. Scott Crean eventually ran him out of bounds, number 51. Nice little uh, pitch out here by Walsh as it comes down. He sees that uh, he doesn't have a running room, so he throws the ball back to his tailback, number 33, Rich uh, Spadaro. And Spadaro picked up about seven on that one. Let's call it third and one. Important play here early in the second quarter. We're tied at 7-7. Barry Landers and Emerson Boozer. Walt Whitman and Sachev playing in the Conference One Championship game, the Division One Championship, as they like to call it out here at Suffolk. The right end is uh, Sean McCauley flank wide to the right. A little bit of a mix-up. Moore trying to fight off the tackle. Does it once, but can't stop the rest of the group. He initially stopped, uh, was stopped by number 39, Paul Fitzpatrick, then fought off the tackle, and Ray Curtin and Todd Russ stopped him. Let's go to the sidelines with Carl Reuter. Thanks very much, Barry. Uh, flanked by two former Rutgers Cup winners here uh, for Walt Whitman, Marty Riccio and John Walsh. And Marty, the last time Walt Whitman made the playoffs was 10 years ago you played on that team. That's correct. We had, we had some team then. This big guy over here, John, you played offensive and defensive line. How does it feel coming back 10 years later? Well, we've been back uh, for the past couple years watching the team, and this year is by far the best team since 74 uh, when we won the Rutgers Cup. We still want Holy Family, though. We wanted them at the end of the year, and we still want them. All right, you got it from two guys, Marty Ricky and John Walsh. Barry? Scott Donati's kick taken upfield around the 10-yard line, and running to the far side trying to get to the open territory was number 33, Mike Matlack, finally driven down at around the 32-yard line, or 30, where it'll be first and 10 for Sachem as we're tied 7-7. Some two minutes gone here in the second quarter. Walt Whitman took the lead, and that Sachem came back to tie, and both clubs going about 75 yards on their respective drive. That was a 36-yard punt and a fine 20-yard return by Matt Lack. Yes, it looks as though at one point if one of those linebackers looked to be either uh, Spadaro or McGinley that got a hold of him to stop Matt Lack, he'd have gone a long way. So Sachem, a club with a record of 8-1. and one. Last year, they went nine wins, no losses in one tie. That tie in the final game. Looks like we have a new quarterback in there for Sachem, and we'll pick it up for you in just a moment as number 16 is checked into the lineup. And a handoff going to Body up the middle, and look at him go for 15 yards as he busted like lightning through that hole and finally was dragged down from behind and was stopped there. Let's see if we can pick up that uh, new quarterback for Sachem in there, number 16, and it is a uh, pound sophomore, Ken Windenbank. We don't know what's wrong with Johnson. Maybe Carl Reuter can try to find out, but Johnson is not in the ballgame right now. There is Windenbeck, and what a spot for him. He hasn't played much, I'm sure, this year. Maybe Johnson got hurt running the football a couple of those plays in. Windenbeck handing off to Body up the middle, and he gets close to midfield as he picks up about five. Richie Spadaro made the stop. So with your number one quarterback sideline, a lot of pressure now on Mike Body Emerson. Yes, it will. Uh, Body, that's going to be the body to carry the football because they've depended on him all year. He has been the franchise out of station, so uh, any day, Barty's going to have to carry the ball. A pickup of five on that last play, second and five at their own 49-yard line. They send out a wide receiver to the near side, Chris Caputo, or rather Charles Caputo, number 81. At the bottom of your picture, pitch going to Body. He's got Grespin blocking for him, but Body gets maybe a yard before he's dragged down. Number 54, Brian Long, and number 53, Joe Grella, combined to make the stop. And it'll set up a second down situation here. Actually a third down and about five. And we're going to try to find out. Carl Reuter has run over to the other sideline to find out what happened to Mike Johnson. And there's Johnson on the sidelines talking to one of his teammates. So we're unsure why he's out of the ball game right now. But doesn't appear to be in any great pain or anything. And let's see what happens here. On third and about four and a half. 7.59 to go. We're tied second quarter. Windenbank from the eye formation will throw throwing to the near side for Passantino incomplete as he was defended on the play by Darrell Felder number 31 6 175 pound junior a super talent excellent one on one defender basketball player didn't really have the touch that Mike Johnson has on that ball kind of lofted out there and uh, gave Felder enough time to, to get there to Passantino. Right, Felder, uh, coupled with his ability, his, his quickness and his uh, sense for the football, was able to recover very well. Had it been zipped a little bit quicker, he might have had a more difficult time. So it's a punt.
punting situation for the Sachem Club. The punter, number 38, Mike Passantino. And Sachem has taken time out here on fourth and five from uh, midfield. They've used one of their timeouts. And we'll take time out to tell you that we've got high school basketball starting. And it'll be our first games on December 10th. And uh, we've got a great high school basketball schedule coming your way. Long Island Lutheran will be playing Comsawag in one of our early season games. And St. Mary's will be tangling with Elmont. As you can see on the screen right now, other games in the early season, Glen Cove and Locust Valley and Roslyn and Manhasset. These two clubs you're seeing today in football, you'll be seeing them on the basketball schedule as well. Sachem goes up against their arch rival, the Ward Melville Club. That'll be on January the 14th. And then you'll see this uh, very fine Walt Whitman Club coached by Mr. Gugliotta. They'll be taking on Brentwood, another one of their arch rivals, on February the 8th. So for you local fans, you'll have a chance to see them. And speaking of Brentwood, Stan Kellner rejoins us on December 10th. And we've got a big uh, <coughs> basketball game coming up, of course. And here's a look at the Suffolk football playoff schedule that is being played today. Bayshore is at Comsawag, and a lot of people feel the Rutgers Cup will be decided in that game, perhaps. John Glenn at Hampton Bays. What a season for John Glenn. And, of course, Hampton Bays, the big upset over Riverhead, the team everybody thought was the best small school around. And as far as the other games are concerned, there's uh, one other playoff game taking place today. And uh, Nassau County has a couple of games. Garden City playing Plain Edge. A lot of people have feel that the uh, Rutgers Cup may be decided in that game. Should Garden City win? Undefeated, untied, they're a clear choice. Garden City's had some good clubs there, and uh, no, there are no exceptions this year. And the other playoff game coming up tonight, uh, New Hyde Park playing tonight. Oh. Bad snap, but nobody rushes the kicker, but Pasatino gets it off. Might have been partially blocked. Takes a bounce downfield, will go out of bounds at around the 37-yard line or 32-yard line, that is. And they got a break on that Sachem. Had Whitman come with any kind of a rush, they would have blocked that kick. Yes, they did. Uh, Whitman did not come with a rush at all. And you'll see Mike Passantino. The ball comes down the bowling lane here. He picks it up. <laughs> I don't think that it was blocked at all. It's just that in his haste to get it off, hit the side of the foot, careened out of bounds. A 17-yard kick, no return. So Whitman gets it in very good field position up at the 32-yard line. Plenty of time left, 7.41 to go. The Wildcats are deadlocked at seven apiece. Their quarterback is Matt Walsh, number 10. They work out of the eye, hand off to Moore, the fullback, looking for yardage, trying to turn outside, shrugs off one tackle and falls forward. Excellent bit of running to pick up about four or five yards by Eric Moore. I hate to uh, put superlatives on any running back, or most athletes, but he is the best-looking fullback I've seen all year. All right, let's go quickly to Carl Reuter for an update on the Mike Johnson situation. Thank you very much, Barry. Just talked to AD uh, Tom Sabatell of Sachem. He told me Mike Johnson took a good shot. They just want to rest him. He's okay, and they said he should be back into the ball game. Barry? All right, Carl. Good bit of reporting, checking things out for us on the sidelines. Now Walt Whitman on second and five with seven minutes to go in the second quarter. On the draw play, Moore falling forward, close to the first down. Finally stopped by the St. Jim uh, defense, and again, Jack Johnson having to make a lot of tackles. They're getting through to the secondary, and that Walt Whitman offensive line doing an excellent job at it. Now, in the little crack here, as you'll see, the big fullback, number 20, Eric Moore comes in. Bingo, he runs over a couple of bodies down there. Todd Look, Drost was Todd one Drost of them. there in the crack, along with Scott Crean. A lot of guys just got trampled. Well, that uh, defensive line, Paul Fitzpatrick, as they come into measure right now, number 39, 5'11", 180 pounds, senior, very quick for Sachem. The other wide side end, Jeff Sullivan, 46. As you can see, it's another Walt Whitman first down. Sullivan, 6'1", 180 pounds, senior, similar to uh, Fitzpatrick, but a little taller, a little more uh, pass coverage he provides. The inside people, the left tackle, Todd Rose, 6'3", 215, senior. Mark jo Wojciechowski, who you like very much, Jim, just a junior. 6'1", 230 pounds, big and strong. Has 37 tackles and four sacks. And Gary Butel, only a sophomore, 6'3", 215. He's going to be an outstanding one. This is the handoff going to McGinley. And he has stopped after a pickup of around three. Stopped it around the 45-yard line. Where it'll set up a second down, and let's call it seven. I'm, I'm sure a couple of these linemen from uh, Sation will make all county as linemen. And uh, if I were taking one of the picks, and I'd stick my neck out, number one, not so much sticking my neck out, would be number 74, Mark Wojciechowski. And again, number 75, uh, Adam Weinstein. They've had a history of big linemen. They've got a couple of them now at Penn State, and they, they, they've produced some big boys at Sachem over the years. On second and seven, Walsh handing off to Moore. 
again falls forward. There was no hole there, but just his power able to push forward for two yards, and you like that. I like what I just saw. Number 20, Eric Moore met number, it looked to be number 51, Scott Crean, right in the smack of the hole. And I guess you know the battle was won by number 20, Eric Moore, because uh, Scott Crean is still lying on the ground. Watch right up to the right of your screen. You'll see the two guys meet behind the pileup. Moore keeps coming. Crean stays in the rear. Now, we hope he's not hurt. He's being attended to by Fred Fusaro and uh, some of the officials from St. Jim High School right there. And we have timeout taken on the field with 5.53 to go. You hate to see anybody hurt, of course, in any kind of a sporting event. Green, 195. He's a tough kid, six feet. Plays the run well. He's going to get up. It looks to be up to the shoulder area, and that's the way you teach a runner. Uh, if a guy's going to try to tackle you, you at 200 pounds or better. A guy's going to tackle you with his arm. They want you to rip that arm right out of the socket. Sounds a little, little crude, <laughs> but that's what uh, your coaches want you to do when guys are trying to arm tackle you. Well, it'll be third down and a long five, more like six, as play resumes here. And they'll send out number 87 to the left side, Sean McCauley. Walsh two for three for 37 yards. Hasn't thrown in a while. Fakes. Looking up the sideline here, it's going to be complete, a splendid catch by Kurt Murphy in traffic. Oh, what a catch Murphy had there. The basketball player went up in the air, caught the football, a dazzling catch. You're talking about thread the needle or finding a needle in a haystack. That time, Matt Walsh put it right there in the, in the haystack. We Once again, you see him go back set up. Now, he's thrown into a lot of bodies here. And he finds his big receiver, number 83, Kurt Murphy. And Murphy does an outstanding job holding on to the football. 16-yard reception. Three men were in the area. This is Moore for about three as he gets inside the 30. And finally taken down by Gary Butel, number 78. And Mark Wojciechowski, number 75. But Walsh threading the needle beautifully on that 16-yard pickup. He's three for four for 53 yards and one touchdown. And Murphy has caught all three passes for 53 yards, including, of course, the touchdown. Well, he likes the M Murphy, the target Murphy. Murphy is, Murphy is big. He's 6'3", 175 pounds. So he's a good-looking target downfield. And he has the ability to leap for the football. A lot of scouts here watching this game, and I'm sure they're watching him. Out of the eye formation. On second down. Rolling left wall. She's got room. He tries to run toward the first down marker and is stopped shy at around the 24. Jack Johnson finally drove him down, but it looked like there's a lot of room initially on that bootleg play. Yes, there was. And we'll take another look at Walsh was stopped on that one. And right away, this is a QB roll to his uh, to his left. Uh, he's going to run the football right now, as indicated by him hipping the ball and then turning up field. He tries to get a good block down, and he does get a block, but just not enough to get the first down. Johnson, with good pursuit, stayed right on him. So it's a big third down play, short yardage, and they're going to take time out, Walt Whitman. And Rich Caritti is going to get his uh, staff together and see what they're going to do. Rich, of course, was a head coach uh, for eight years here, assistant at John Glenn, and uh, also played at Island Trees under the famous Joe Martone. Let's take a look at Nassau County standing, speaking of Joe Martone, and the scores from yesterday. Hempstead over Baldwin, 22 nothing. Congratulations to Buddy Krumenacher. What a great season for Baldwin. And a club like uh, Walt Whitman in the downs the last several years came up and it had a great season. We saw him upset Lawrence last week. Yeah, it's, that's what's good about high school football. You see Mineola taking... Uh, taking it on the chin to Cold Spring Harbor. Yes. 36-8, and congratulations. Mineola had been undefeated with a tie going into that game, so congratulations to Bill Piner and the fine program, Coach Crassa at... Uh, uh, Coach Queso, rather, at Cold Spring Harbor. And the two games playing today, uh, Garden City and Plain Edge, and Elmont taking on New Hyde Park. We saw both Garden City and, El and uh, New Hyde Park this year, and here they are in the playoffs. Glenn Goldberg did a super job. We ended up with so many teams <laughs> on our schedule that made the playoffs. Yes, yes. I got a chance to see Coach Joe Martone today. And I asked him, I said, what are you doing here? He says, don't you know that Coach Critty is one of my products? He played for me at Island Tree. So I heard that he was in the uh, championship game. I wanted to come out and see how well he's doing. Of course, the Martone Award goes to the best uh, lineman in Nassau County, named after the, the Martone family. He's been so much involved in football. Long time out here, and Rich Caritti has made his decision. There you see Rich, who M. said played under Coach Martone. And a big third and about a yard, less than a yard maybe. 
Johnson, or rather Walsh, on the quarterback keeper has the first down off the uh, center. Peter Hansen and Joe Grello, the right guard. He uh, pushed forward for about a three-yard pickup. They'll mark it at the 19, where it'll be first and 10. We take another look here. I watch uh, Walsh just come right off center and uh, finds a nice little gator and the first down. Peter Hansen, Chris Robinson, and Joe Grella, the two guards opposite, coming up with the good blocks. Clock ticks away, 3.57 to go. Official time being kept, I believe, up here. McCauley to the right. Rolling to the right side. Walsh throwing, and it's going to be tipped, nearly intercepted. Knocked down uh, by the defense, I believe Ray Curtin, number 53, the linebacker was the man who knocked it down. And uh, also number 65, defending on the play, who had uh, checked in the lineup. So it'll set up a second and 10 from the 19-yard line. And I haven't seen Kirk Murphy in the uh, ball game recently. I don't know, after he made that spectacular catch, you're going to try to check if he's uh, okay. But uh, they've made a couple of substitutions in the lineup right now. Richie Spadero replaced by Mike McGinley. You see Spadero walking off at the bottom of your picture. Sean McCauley, number 87, will be the flanker. Now Chris Montanaro lines up wide to the right. Number 86 is checked into the ball game for Walt Whitman. And a handoff going to number 32, McGinley. Not much doing. Stopped at about the line of scrimmage. Todd Drost with good pursuit down the line. That strong left tackle at 6'3", 215 made the stop. This is just good outstanding defense here by the Station Arrow defense. As McGinley tries to find a little running room, you see uh, Drost and a host of others. Uh, Ray Curtin, along with Drost, they were able to stop uh, McGinley for no gain. So out they come over the ball. Number 86 is checked into the ball game for Walt Whitman. We'll try to pick him up for you. On a big third down play, Walsh to throw, looking, has, running out of time, lofts it for more, but wisely throws it out of bounds as he would have been taken down for a big loss on that play. And it sets up a fourth down play in an interesting situation for perhaps a place-kicking attempt for Scott Demetti. Right here, uh, Walsh just, just not finding a running room. Uh, you give the Whitman defense, uh, rather uh, the Shea Mallard defense, a lot of credit because they covered extremely well downfield. Walsh had to scramble, still couldn't find anybody, elected to throw the ball out of bounds, well over the head of number 20, Eric Moore. Kirk Lemke is number 86, as we're going to have this long field goal attempt coming here from the soccer-style kicker, Scott Demanti. He's 0 for 1 in field goal attempts. The kick will come from the 26-yard line. It'll be a 36-yard attempt. The ball is down. They get in quickly. The kick is on its way. It is going to be good! 36-yard field goal from Scott Devaney. And they're whooping and hollering, as you can see here at Walt Whitman High School as the Wildcats regain the lead 10-7. It was just an outstanding kick. Uh, Devaney had not hit uh, on a field goal all year, only took uh, one attempt. If we take another look at it here, he keeps the head down, uh, high snap, gets it down. Now he gets lots of pressure inside, gets the ball out of the crack through the shoot, you might say, up for a fine looking three pointer. Well, it looked like they almost were going to get in the block dead kick. Number 48 had come right in on the kicker, but good concentration got it off and it made it. And the Wildcats take the lead. That drive covered 40 yards in 10 plays to Matty's 36-yard field goal, giving the Wildcats the 10-7 lead. Now the Wildcats will be kicking off with 2.47 to go. It'll be interesting to see if the quarterback, Johnson, comes back in for this last drive. As you heard Carl Reuter report, just shaking up a little. And they went uh, with the uh, younger quarterback in there, Ken Windenbank. be taken down at the 32 yard line and around the 34 they'll probably spot it where St. Jim will put it in play first and 10 and what do you look for from St. Jim as we check to see if the quarterback is back in the ball game Mike Johnson well, I, I think uh, Station will stay with game plan. What you don't want to do prior to half is uh, turn the football over via either fumble or interception. So you'll stay basically with game plan. If you get the good running attack coming along, then you mix in your bit of passing. So we'll see them play it rather close to the chest, I think. Well, Winden Bank is in there, number 16, so Johnson remains on the sideline. Station lost its starting fullback, Don Leo, with a broken leg. Now they line up with a high formation. 
Man in motion to the near side. Is Chris Cascone. Draw play for Body. Nearly fumbled the football. It was loose. And he did. And the Wildcats have recovered. And you've got a new quarterback in. Uh, not used to maybe making the handoffs properly. Not in communication or timing. Maybe that was the problem there. You don't see Body fumble off him. No, you don't. Uh, it's the kind of thing that uh, we just had mentioned. You, what you don't want to do by playing it close to chest here, and that is to lose the football. Jack yeah. DeWitt, number 42, got the fumble. Watch here again. The ball comes back, hands it off to Body. Somewhere along the way, Body has the football, but he gets hit here by number 42, uh, Jack DeWitt. DeWitt. And with DeWitt, I believe, recovers the football. the football. All right, back to the action here. Walt looking to throw. Sideline for Murphy, who's back in, incomplete. So Murphy he has checked back into the ball game, and he's apparently okay after sitting out a couple of plays. There's the tie. 2.23 to go. And the score, the homestanding Wildcats 10 and the Flaming Arrows of Sachem 7. Remember, Walt Whitman was beaten 43-0 last year by the Sachem Club. They have not won since 1980. They've lost three years in a row. And they're trying to break the schneid and win the conference championship. Rutgers Cup championship team 10 years ago, as you heard Carl Rohn to talk to two of those members of that team. Now they line up with the wide receiver to the left side. Number 31 lines up wide to light and left Daryl Felder. The fake handoff going up the middle is Moore. And he picks up about six on the draw play. Clock continues to tick. 2.13 to go. It'll set up about third and four. As Moore, that quick hitter up the middle, has made some nice gains. So far, Moore, after picking up uh, that five or six yard gain, has carried 11 times for 48 yards. That time, Moore would have gone a little bit further, but one of his uh, lead blockers got in his way. He rammed into the lead blocker, and Sullivan was able to grab a hold of the big runaway train and bring the tackle down. Again, Felder lines up wide to the left. They've got a slot right formation. Rolling to the near side, looking as Walsh has time. Throws it complete for a first down. Number 88, Chris Montanaro, the tight end, 6'75-pound senior, who's caught a couple of passes so far today. Potential Division II player, very intelligent kid, came up with a nice reception for the first down there. This is what the Wildcats can do best to you, and that is find one of their excellent receivers. That time they found the tight end, number 88, Chris Montanaro, but uh, they can throw the football, Barry. Montanaro with excellent hands, a very bright student, an honor student. Hand off to Moore, off the right side, nothing doing. He gets maybe a yard or two. Clock continues to tick. 125 to go. Ray Curtin, outstanding linebacker, one of the captains, uh, made the tackle. You know who else was on that ankle there? Number 74, Mark Wojciechowski had, I think, maybe the left ankle of Moore. <laughs> Once again, Felder lines up wide to the left. Wide to the right now. Number 87 is Sean McCauley from the eye with 105 to go. Pitch back coming to the near side. This is Fidero. And he's down at around the 10-yard line, close to the first down. Had to get to around the nine and three-quarter yard mark. Jim Isernia, the quarterback, finally made the stop. But Spadero, with an excellent bit of running there, picks up about nine tough yards. And timeout taken by Walt Whitman. I believe they have one timeout left. They took one earlier. And it'll set up a very interesting call here. And the, those are the football just outside the 10. They've got to get it inside the 10 for the first down. And we've got 55 seconds left. I would say that you'll see number 10, Matt Walsh, come right back. If you remember, two, two series back, he uh, came with a quarterback sneak in a short yard of situation. On that last play with uh, Spadaro getting outside, he got an excellent block from the tight end, number 88, that sprung him around a corner. And I saw uh, <laughs> Spadaro come back looking for uh, Montanero just to give him a, a congratulatory pat on the back. Montanero, an excellent <laughs> blocker. A lot of people feel, as they said, a potential Division II player, intelligent, tough kid. And uh, he can block as well as catch the football as we've seen the last couple of plays. Once again, we hope that you've enjoyed our high school football season. Em and I have uh, been real happy. I think this is uh, our 10th high school football game of the year. We started it uh, way back with Bayshore and West Babylon. We had some outstanding college football games capped off by that great St. John's and Hofstra game. And by the way, uh, a lot of folks who did not see that game will have another chance to see it on Channel 21, the Long Island Educational Station. That'll be on Sunday, November 25th. Um, a lot of folks uh, may be watching this game. When this is over, you can tune in at 2 o'clock on Channel 21. But uh, that was a great football game. It was an exciting football game, a football game that uh, saw an underdog come in, a good underdog. They weren't uh, losing clubs, uh, meeting the St. John Redmond, but uh, they came in with a good record, got off poorly, 
Uh, eight and two for the year. Just an outstanding year and a great comeback. All right, Rich Caridi has made his decision. He's got three wide receivers. And sends a man in motion, Montanero, to the left side. The handoff going to McGinley. And he may have the first down, but not much more. Might have gotten to the nine. And they're going to measure official timeout, stopping the clock with 50 seconds. They're quickly going to huddle now. Although number 53, Joe Grella, the offensive captain, checking out where they've marked the football. It's going to be close. And how about your eagle eye here? Well, uh, I, I think they do have it with just by a little bit. Uh, but if they don't get it here, they've got fourth down coming here. You see they've already huddled, ready for the next play. So uh, it's just academic at this point. Well, look how close it is. It's an inch. And Rich Caridi has made his choice. An inch to go. Will they go for a field goal or will they go for it? They have a 10-7 lead, 50 seconds to go. They move the ball to the yard marker. And here we go on fourth down. About a couple of inches to go. Last time they had fourth down, Walsh carried and got the first down. Moore and Spadero, the running backs, in the I formation. Double tight end. Hand off to Moore, and he blasts for the first down, down to the seven or six. Off the right side of the line. The power of Eric Moore picking up the first down. Now the clock set back in motion. 44 seconds to go as the officials mark the ball for play. Now Walsh motioning to his backs. He's got Felder wide to the left. McCauley to the right. This is Moore trying to turn the corner. Spins and it ripped down at the five-yard line. Big hit by Ray Curtin. He came back and got that one back. Also helping out on the play, number 36, <laughs> Kelly Smith, 5'10 on 55-pound senior. They line up quickly with 20 seconds to go on second and goal. Looking now, throwing the ball to the end zone. It is going to be battled for incomplete. Number nine, John Pirro, and number 87, Sean McCauley, both had chances to catch that football end. That was uh, just a good defensive play by number nine, John Pirro, and good fighting for the football by number 87, the flanker, Sean McCauley, because they both went at it tooth and nail. McCauley had caught 13 passes for 275 yards and three touchdowns coming into this game. A super student, Princeton, Amherst, Dartmouth, Cornell, some of the schools that he's interested in. 95 average with excellent hands. As you see, quarterback Matt Walsh, who can throw, he can sprint. And they have made a decision here with 13 seconds to go. They've got time to get another pass off and then maybe try a field goal. But they may try to move the football over to the center of the field. They have a timeout left if they do decide to run it and move it closer to the goal post. Yes, they do have a chance here for exactly two plays, and they, but they must throw this one. And now, apparently, they took too much time in the huddle, so that will cost them five yards and move the football back to the 10-yard line. We take another look here. As you see Walsh, he uh, scrambles outside, and he's looking for number 87, Sean McCauley. And McCauley and Piero looks as though Piero, Piero had won the bottle, battle, but right away McCauley goes for uh, the takedown and the, uh, and the uh, interception. Turns offensive defense immediately. Well, he tried to take that ball away, so it would not be an interception. Third and goal from the 10, 13 seconds to go. McCauley to the right. Walsh under deep trouble and down at the 20-yard line. They've got six seconds, five seconds. They better call a timeout here. Three, two, one. And did they get a timeout? No, I can't believe it. They had a timeout and never got a chance to call it. So a real mix-up there in the part of Walt Whitman. I'm sure they had a timeout. There would have been a chance for another field goal from around the 37-yard line again. Well, so that, that might come back to haunt him, Emerson Boozer, as we'll see a little bit later on. Certainly, you want to try for the three points down here. I think with the excitement, probably the quarterback or whomever was designated to act as captain at that moment just did not think clearly enough to get over and make that timeout. So that's the story at halftime here. We've got a heck of a football game. The Wildcats of Walt Whitman leading the Sachem Fleming Arrows 10-7. We've got a great halftime show coming up and interesting interviews with John DeLuca, the athletic director here, and also one of the star personalities from WBLI Radio. Carl Reuter returns with his halftime report right after these messages. You're watching the Long Island Sports Network.
You know, there's nothing trivial when you're getting ready in the morning. And at WBLI, we'll give you maximum morning information with Steve Harper, BLI meteorologist Joe Rayo with your weather, WBLI shadow traffic with Nancy Remy, and me too, Barry Neal, playing your maximum music and trivia too every weekday morning on WBLI. WBLI FM 106, Long Island's best radio. Maximum music, WBLI. Hi, everybody. I'm Barry Landers with Jerry McDougall, president of Apple Bank. You know, Jerry, you and I share something more than just this basketball. We share our concern and interest in Long Island youth. No question about it, Barry. We at Apple Bank feel very much a part of the Long Island community. And as such, we want to show our support for these young people who are not only the future of Long Island, but we think the future of our country. Apple Bank for Savings with five Long Island locations in Manhasset, Syosset, East Massapequa, Greenlawn, and Smithtown. Member FDIC. You're listening and watching the Sachem Flaming Arrow Marching Band. Carl Reuter down here at halftime with my first halftime guest, Walt Whitman Athletic Director John DeLuca, whose team is ahead at halftime by a score of 10 to 7. A very entertaining first half in front of an overflow crowd. This is the finest crowd that I think we've ever had at Whitman. It's an outstanding crowd. Well, I'm sure now, being played this game today against Sachem, you're going to build up some sort of rivalry, even though it is a county playoff game. Well, our kids have always played very well against Sachem when we were in League One, and this year we're in League Two for the first time. It has always been a heck of a game between both schools. John, four years as an athletic director here, what changes have you made, or what changes would you like to be made as long as you're at Walt Whitman? Well, I was fortunate enough to inherit an outstanding athletic program from the previous director, Bob Young, who's now at Section 11. So the changes that we had were minor, and uh, we're adding a few new activities for the kids on a junior high level. And uh, we've restructured our school system. We had two junior highs, and now we have one in the ninth graders up at Whitman. So uh, there have been a great many changes, and we've had a lot of staff changes, however. You've got to be very proud of this football team. Uh, the last two years, they only won three games, and all of a sudden, they turn it around, same kids, but maybe execution is a factor now. Well, maturity is a big part of it. I think these kids, from winning one game last year, uh, knew that they wanted to play good football and go out with uh, a good season, and we were complimented by a good group of JV kids. So we're very happy uh, with the job that the staff has done. Football team isn't the only good program here at Walt Women. A basketball program is a fine uh, established uh, under Frank Gugliotta and the soccer team under Tony Perez. All outstanding programs, and uh, the girls' soccer this year has been outstanding under the leadership of Joe Conforto and Ray Pellegrino. We like to feel that we give uh, a real good comprehensive athletic program to our kids and have good quality all the way through. What about the backing and support of the administration and the community? Second to none. From the district superintendent, uh, Dr. Dominich, to the Board of Education, to the high school principal, John O'Farrell, and his staff, uh, nothing short of 110%. Uh, Was John DeLuca ever a football coach or a baseball coach or wrestling or soccer uh, before he became an athletic director? I was a soccer coach, a wrestling coach, and a track coach. All on the varsity level or at different levels in the school system? All on the varsity level. How do you feel? As a head coach, and now an athletic director walking up and down, you try to get eager and uh, maybe give a little bit of advice? No, uh, the coaches who are at it uh, are a great deal more well-versed in the sports than I was at that time, and they know their business, and uh, the job of an AD is to try to give them service, give them the things they need to get the program done, and stay out of their way. What about sports now on Long Island? Uh, how do you feel that it's coming along here in Suffolk County? We have a genuine problem in, in uh, Suffolk, uh, which is, I think, similar to the programs in the state where we're losing programs in some area. We have a great deal of difficulty in sports like field hockey, where we've dropped the number of program. Numbers are a problem. Getting available coaches is a sincere, uh, serious problem where we have uh, difficulty. If you look at Newsday on any given week, tremendous problem trying to get coaches to service uh, the schools. Many schools have a great number of coaches who are outside the building or outside the district. This compounds the problem for an athletic director in administrating the program. John, it's a pleasure. We really feel welcome here at Walt Women High School. You're happy now. Hopefully in a couple of hours you'll still have that same smiling face. 
Your team is leading. We uh, wish you the best of luck, and thanks for coming on. Thank you, and we appreciate the coverage. All right, John DeLuca, the athletic director of Walt Women High School. We'll be back with more halftime activities following this timeout. You're watching the Long Island Sports Network. I'm Barry Landers with Jerry McDougall, president of Apple Bank. Jerry, we're just delighted to have Apple Bank as a sponsor this year. Tell us what prompted your decision to join us. Well, Barry, aside from the fact that I was born in Lindbrook, Apple Bank has five branches here on Long Island and is involved in each of the communities that we serve. We think Long Island's future is bright because of our youth, and we're proud to support them. Apple Bank for Savings. We're working hard for you with five Long Island locations. I'm Mary Tyler Moore, asking you to become my partner in caring by supporting the North Shore Child and Family Guidance Center. For over 30 years, the center has provided a lifeline of mental health services for children, adolescents, and their families throughout northern Nassau County. We've joined together to provide positive, responsive programs for those in need of help. Won't you join us, too? For more information, please call 516-626-1971. And thank you for caring. What the world needs now is love, sweet love. It's the only thing that there's just too little love. Ooh, ooh, ooh. The world is full of kids who need a grown-up for a friend. Become a big brother or big sister, because little people need big people, like you. Sure do. Back here at Wall Women High School, my next guest is someone you don't usually see because he's on WBLI FM 106, but Rick Summers, you've been on before on LISN. BLI is one of our sponsors. It's great to have you come by again. Well, it's nice to be down. We've got a beautiful day in Thanksgiving weekend. Traditionally, lots of great football, starting with the NFL on Thursday and some great college ball we saw yesterday. And, of course, today, the uh, Suffolk Divisional Playoffs between Walt Whitman and Sachem. Low-scoring game, but uh, an exciting one at that. Is Rick Summers a football fan? Rick Summers is a football fan. I'll tell you, I don't get to get out that often anymore. I never get to the NFL. College games are kind of tough with my schedule. And working with you, the LISN, it's been... A a chance for me to come down and get back involved one way or another with high school football and it's, you know I'm nostalgic it's great to be here it really is nice Rick you're not from Long Island you mentioned you're from Westchester uh, County uh, did you play football at all in high school or college or no as a matter of fact I, that's a that's a dangerous question to ask <laughs> no actually I was a soccer player in high school and I went to Ithaca College and did some I was on your side of the microphone as a matter of fact for um, four years at Ithaca doing some play-by-play -play and some color for football. So, like I said, for me to get back in the cool, crisp autumn air and the sunshine and the pigskin flying around, it's very nostalgic, and it's nice to be here. What about being inside a studio now over the airways? You have, you've got to love it. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. Working in radio, has it's not just a job, it's a lifestyle. You know, it's six days a week, but it's uh, it affords you lots of great opportunities to meet. Uh, lots of new and interesting people and do lots of new and exciting things and it's it can be a grind at times But for the most part, I love it. And that's why I do it. Well, we're talking over the Walt Whitman band now the marching band playing some good music here Rick, when are you on the airwaves? When can we hear Rick Summers? Hopefully in about an hour or so. No, uh, weekdays 3 to 7 p.m. WBLI in the afternoon. And uh, I can't see you, but I'll, I'll wave to you now. And just imagine me doing that on the radio weekday afternoons, if you will. What kind of music does WBLI play now? The best. <laughs> the best on Long Island. We are Long Island's number one radio station playing the hits as we do, old and new. And uh, we do that 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And we've got a tremendous audience. A lot of our Sachem people, we were on their side before, came up to greet us. And we've... Uh, from the folks at Walt Whitman as well. So it's nice to be well received wherever you go on Long Island. Well, you can see this DJ is a very enthused one. He's got to get on the air in, a, in about an hour, as he said. Rick, always a pleasure to speak with you, and nice thanks for coming you. by and thanks talking very to much. Us. My guest has been Rick Summers from WBLI Radio, and we'll be back with some halftime statistics following this time out. You're watching the Long Island Sports Network. <laughs> I never ran before I came to Adelphi. Now I can't imagine not doing it. It really helps having the kind of encouragement I've gotten here. 
It makes Adelphi feel like a small college. But I'm glad it's a big university with lots of courses and career options because I'm making choices that will affect my whole life. I'm excited about my future. In fact, sometimes I can't wait to graduate. It's sort of like running. Once you get started, you want to see how far you can go. Adelphi University, where the advantages of a major university and a small college meet. Hi, everybody. I'm Barry Landers with Jerry McDougall, president of Apple Bank. You know, Jerry, you and I share something more than just this basketball. We share our concern and interest in Long Island youth. No question about it, Barry. We at Apple Bank feel very much a part of the Long Island community. And as such, we want to show our support for these young people who are not only the future of Long Island, but we think the future of our country. Apple Bank for Savings with five Long Island locations in Manhasset, Syosset, East Massapequa, Greenlawn, and Smithtown. Member FDIC. Hi, this is WBLI's Rick Summers inviting you to join me weekday afternoons from 3 to 7 p.m. We've got you commercial-free music marathons each and every hour. The Coffee Break Concert, the WBLI Afternoon Artist, and up to the minute shadow traffic with Nancy Remy. Find out why more people on Long Island listen to WBLI weekdays between 3 and 7 p.m. WBLI FM 106, Long Island's best radio. Maximum music, WBLI. You're tuned to Viacom Cable Vision of Long Island, TV6. Back here at Walt Whitman High School, crowd of, I'd say, over 4,000 on hand to see the Suffolk County Division I Championship. Whitman leading 10-7 at halftime. Here's a look at the halftime statistics. As you can see, the Wildcats have the better of the play. 183 to 109 yards total. Penalties very few in a well-played first half. Turnovers just won that body fumble that they're unable to cash in on him. And as we look at the individual statistics, passing uh, for the Arrows, Johnson, three for four for 31 yards. And the key will be whether he can come back and play in the second half. He left the game in the second quarter with an injury. Rushing, Johnson, two for 47. Body just 30 yards, 16 of those on one carry M as he gained seven for 30. And for the Wildcats passing, Walsh, four for nine, 61 yards. The rushing, Moore, 14 for 54 yards. And Spadaro, 8 for 38. Right now, uh, the Wildcats have shown that they can run the football on this station arrow defense, and uh, we'll wait and see what's going to happen in the second half. Murphy caught three passes for 53 yards for Walt Whitman as we're getting set for the kickoff here. And the kick is away. Down to taking it by Matlack at the 10-yard line. Check it, it's Bauer to the 15. And as he dives forward, he's across the 25 and down at the 26-yard line, where Sachin will put it in play first and 10, trailing in the ball game by a score of 10 to 7. And again, we'll keep an eye on and see if Mike Johnson is out there. Let's take a look at that Sachin touchdown that tied the ball game here. It was a good play here. Getting out Johnson over to uh, Passantino, number 38. That's one of their favorite patterns, working the tight end down to the corner. Johnson is in the ball game. There you see him, Mike Johnson, the six foot 175 pound senior, who completed well over 50% of his passes for 961 yards this year. Pro set in the backfield. Long count. And the handoff going to the first man through. And it looks like Grespin on the carry as he was stopped by Jack DeWitt. As they unpile, the sophomore picks up about uh, four, make it five yards as he's up to the 32. Good opening play for uh, Sachem as they opened up the middle and uh, came up with a four or five yard gain. That's better than an opening drive in the first half. Opening drive, first half, they were able to pick up maybe two or three. This time coming with a young tailback, Grespin, Joe Grespin, uh, looks to be somewhat of a trap play. Picked up nice yardage on. Body with uh, just 30 yards in the first half. The only time he's been held in check this year was against West Islip when they held him to 60 yards. He's had several games over 100. He's gained over 1,000 yards this season. 1,350 last year as a junior. A leading candidate for the Thorpe Award. Pass going to be incomplete. Intended for number 81, Charlie Caputa. And he was really leveled uh, by 87, Sean McCauley, on that little slant pattern. And it sets up a third and about six. Now, Caputo should have caught this ball. Johnson delivered it very well, but a little bit down uh, to his right. We had to turn a bit here, and it was able to scoot off. He should have caught it, Caputo, 5'10", 155-pound senior, who's caught uh, uh, one pass so far for 15 yards this year. Caputo again lines up wide to the left. Number 26 lines up wide to the right, Chris Cascone. Out of the eye formation on third down. In motion comes Cascone to the near side. Johnson, play action. 
In trouble. Screens it off to the near far side to Passantino. Passantino leaps for the first down. And he's down at the 45-yard line. Fine bit of running after he caught the ball by that uh, very fleet 38, Mike Passantino, the 6'1", 200-pound senior. A good look in uh, offensive play here. As you see, Mike Johnson goes back, setting up. He screens off to his right, to his tight end, number 38, Passantino. Gets a good block out in front. I can't actually see who it is, but he gets a nice piece of blocking out front. I heard it was a bit up for the first down. So on that pickup by Passantino, it's first and 10 at the 40-yard line. Now they line up with the two wide receivers to the near side. Johnson calling signals. Long count once again. Back to throw on first down. Looking for a slant pattern. Tip incomplete. As the pass was intended for number 26. However, there's a flag thrown. Chris Cascone was the intended receiver. Sean McCauley may be called for pass interference on that one. The very aggressive 6'1", 175-pound senior who's a basketball, a baseball player. And a fine defensive player, but let's look on the replay. We see a replay here again, as you see Capito, I think, comes inside on somewhat of a post pattern. And you'll see number 87 on the left side of your screen, Sean McCauley. I think he throws his body in just before the ball gets there. You cannot do that. So it sets up uh, first down for the Wildcats. The ball at the 40-yard line. It was an incompleted pass. Now they walk the ball upfield. It'll be a 10-yard walk-off. And as they move the ball up, it'll be down to the 45-yard line. So 15-yard walk-off. First and 10 for Sachem. They trail 10-7. 10, 10 13 to go, third quarter. Barry Landers, Emerson Boozer, and Carl Reuter here. As Sachem makes a change, Bob Venturo checks out of the lineup. As Cascone lines up wide to the left. Dan Coyne at the top of your picture, wide to the right. Johnson handing off to Body, looking for the hole. Now squirts free at the outside and taken down at the 40-yard line as he was dragged down finally by number 53. And that was uh, number 55, Tim Edgerly. Tim Edgerly who had checked in the lineup and also helping out on the play number 53 for the Sachem Wildcats, Joe Grella. So oh, good pickup by Body. Again, the good runners, and even when there's nothing there, somehow managed to pick up four or five yards. Yeah, that time, uh, Whitman had to shut the play down inside. Body bounced a little bit outside, picked up the needed yardage. This time, number 83, Dan Corn, Get wide to the feet. right. On the near side is Cascone. Body and Gressman, the running backs, on second and five. Johnson pitches to Body, fumbles it for the second time. Can't get the handle, loose ball. I believe it was number 32 came up with the football for Walt Whitman and it was Mike McGinley the 5 to 175 pound senior and who would expect Mike body who's got those sure hands people think he's maybe a receiver in college to fumble a football twice but he did and we'll look at it here take another look here this time uh, body was coming out of the fullback slot they had moved uh, Mike body over directly behind the quarterback into the fullback slot and Gressman sitting out on the tailback slot moved out in the pitch could not handle it losing the football well Whitman was unable to cash in on the fumble earlier this is Moore cutting back and gets three yards as he's down at around the 43 yard line and Emma, I know you have a, a wife who has a great rooting interest in this game. Well, you, of course, uh, have a business here in Huntington Station. And your wife, Inez, works for the uh, Walt Whitman School District. Yes, she does. She works for the athletic director of uh, the Whitman District here, John DeLuca. All right, so it is now second and seven. But Emma, you've been quite impartial so far. I have to give you credit. <laughs> yeah. Second and seven, power eye formation in the backfield to throw with time. Walsh. Dropping it to the sideline, diving attempt by Moore. It'll go incomplete at the 40-yard line. It'll set up a third down situation. Third and seven. 8.28 to go, third quarter. The Whitman Wildcats cheerleading squad on the sideline trying to rev up this big crowd. Whitman with a record of seven wins, one loss and one tie. Rich Caridi in his eighth year. Third down, what do you look for him? I think they're going to have to throw the football again here. Uh, they were unable to complete on the second down pass, so you could come right back Hurry with up. it. 
theoretically. Daryl Felder lines up wide to the left. Will play action here, maybe a screen. Drops it off for the near side, fumbling the ball is Spadero. It goes out of bounds. Let's see who they give it to. I believe Whitman was the last team to have possession, and it will be a Whitman ball, but Spadero was really leveled as he got that football, and I believe he is down on the sideline just in front of the rest of his players there, as uh, you'll see in just a moment. Looks like a knee injury as Coach uh, Caridi and the rest of the Whitman staff looking on concerned. It'll be a fourth down situation, a punting situation, and they had that uh, smelled out pretty good, that screen. Yes, they did. The intensity level increased about three folds that time when they recognized that the screen had been set up, and those station arrows really zeroed in. Well, a very hard-nosed young man, Rich Spadero. Good student, versatile, can play anywhere. He's up on his feet, got a pretty good hit. And now it'll be a punting situation for Walt Whitman. Scott DeMatty averaging 38 yards a kick. Longest of 54. Had one blocked last week against West Iceland. Let's see if Sachin will come here. He should get the ball in pretty good field position. The kick will come from uh, around the 35. Now the clock set back in motion. 8.05 to go. Whitman leading 10-7. And, and at the end of the half, we thought that there was another timeout that Walt Whitman had. We said well, they may rue the fact that they didn't call that timeout, but uh, apparently there was none. So can't blame the coaching staff for calling a timeout that they didn't have or the players on the field. Punning situation here. Demani with time. Steps forward. Boots it. Downfield. Bauer takes the ball. Falls down at the 20-yard line. That nose of the football coming down. Bauer made a good play just to hang on to that football. Yes, it looks as though at one time Bauer might drop the football and uh, the Wildcats were covering very well on that play. So luckily he was able to hold on to the football. 33-yard punt. No return. And Sachem takes over for the second time here in the second half. Trailing 10-7 to as you can see. Last time Walt Whitman beat Sachem back in 1980. And again, the other big playoff game today, Bayshore and Comsawak, John Glenn, and Hampton Bays. Those are the three playoff games here. As is that out over the ball comes the center for Sachem Todd Dross. Number 81, wide to the right is Charles Caputo. Man-on-man -man coverage against Caputo. Again, in that six-man front, a 6-2 front, they shut body down today. Johnson looking to throw, has time, eludes one tackle. Throws, and it's going to be incomplete intended for Caputo. A lot of uh, maroon shirts over there. Kirk Murphy with a good hit, number 83, as Johnson had a lot of time. Got out of traffic there. Looked like he might be sacked. And he's shown that ability him to get out of trouble, scrambles well, and waits and waits to the last minute to get that football off. You're right. That was just good uh, defensive movement there by uh, uh, Mike Johnson because he, he, he was trapped into the backfield, was able to elude one of the young rushes and get outside to deliver the pass. I think it was Joe Grella, 53, who had made the penetration in the backfield. It's second and 10. Johnson so far passing this afternoon. Four for seven for 39 yards. Cascone in motion. Pitch coming to that side. Body looking to turn up field, but will get only two yards. Brian Long, that left tackle, the transfer from Holy Family, number 54, the 6 195 pound senior. Very consistent, steady player in on the tackle. Sets up another passing situation for Sachem here. Third and about seven. Let's make it eight. Got to get up to the 30 yard line. And the football at the 23 as a play has come in from the sidelines. Number 83 checking into the ball game. Dan Coyne has caught six for 100 yards. Total average of 18 yards per catch. 6'180 pound senior. Out of the eye formation. Johnson. Has time. Throwing toward the sideline for Casco. Intercepted beautifully by Sean McCauley who plays like a safety, the real brains of the secondary, and boy, he made a super interception right there. Has a great field sense, and he picked that ball off, and again, Walt Whitman threatens him as they take over first and 10 we, inside the 40. We take another look here as you see Johnson sets up a throw outside, and uh, 
McCauley sees this play all the way. Steps right in front at the last minute. Comes up with a big interception. Boy, Cascone was reading the ball right into his hands. In came McCauley. Interception time. Second or third turnover. And let's see if they can uh, take advantage of it. They haven't been able to take advantage of the two previous turnovers on the body fumbles. This is the pitch coming now to McGinley. And he's run out of bounds after a short gain to around the 30-yard line. Stopped by that Sachem defense. It'll be a second down situation. Kelly Smith, who's playing with a banged up Achilles tendon, number 36, ran him out of bounds. Man in motion. Pitch back here from Walsh. He has to find the handle of the football. And when I say he, I mean Mike McGinley. And once he found it, he's able to pick up about three yards. Kirk Murphy, who's had a splendid day, winds up wide to the left at the top of your picture. Slot right formation. Looking to the near side. Johnson with plenty of time, or rather Walsh going deep. Incomplete looking for Sean McCauley as he had gotten behind the defender, but the pass overthrown. And it'll set up a third down situation, third and about six from the 30 yard line. Murray, uh, pretty soon, if uh, Whitman doesn't score on uh, that third turnover, uh, receiving the ball via turnover, you, you think that your, your luck soon runs out. This is the third time getting the football in good field position and has not been able to do anything with it. John Pirro is the man defending on that play, and he'll defend against uh, McCauley as McCauley lines up wide to the right, Murphy wide to the left. Play action now again. Walsh throwing a sideline pass complete to his big tight end, Chris Montanero. It's going to be very close to the first down. Montanero had to get to the 23 and a half yard line, and I believe he's got it. I think they're going to market it around the 23 dead even. So it is a big first down for Walt Whitman on a well thrown ball and a fine catch by Chris Montanero, his second of the day. They're going to have to uh, get the ball in, into the end zone or through the uprights for a three or a six quarter because you cannot uh, continually get the big turnover and not score on it. They've had three so far, and they have not committed any turnovers themselves. Up the middle, Moore, the big fullback, blast for the first down, close to the 10-yard line before Jack Johnson, the strong safety, number 80, made the stop. And Whitman on the move here as they knock on the door. Remember, they got down to the five-yard line just before the first half ended. Had a quarterback sack back at the 20, didn't come away with any points. After kicking a field goal just moments before that, on a 36-yarder by Scott Demani to take a 10-7 lead. That's where the story is right now. They'll bring the chains into measure. It appears that it's going to be very close to the first down if it isn't. On that 10-yard burst up the middle. And it may be a little bit short, and it will be by about a half a foot. Second and inches, and an interesting call here if you're the offense, M. Come right back with a great big fullback or let the quarterback keep it. And uh, get that first down because what you can do now is keep the ball on the ground and work your way to another first down if need be. You don't like to throw that ball, do you? No, not down once you get down into that big uh, inside the 20. You don't have much room for the defense to sag and settle. So I like to see him run it as much as possible once you get inside the 20. There's Eric Moore, 66 yards for the big fullback. Moore bursts for the first down, rips his way out of the grasp of one tackler, and down to the seven-yard line where it'll be goal to go before Ray Curtin finally corralled him. Eric Moore with over 70 yards so far this afternoon. Now, this is doing what you've got to do. You see the big fullback gets the head down, not so much lower in the head, but get it down in a point of tilted position so they can see where he's going and uh, lunge at once he's been hit to get the needed yards. First and goal at the seven-yard line. Felder to the left, McCauley to the right. From the I formation, Matt Walsh handing off to Spadero, and he doesn't get much, maybe a yard to the six-yard line before he's stopped by that Sachem front line. Sets up second and goal from the six. Clock continues to tick, 5.05 to go in the third quarter. As Sachem makes a defensive change. We see Sean, Scott Crean checking in the lineup as they go with an extra linebacker here, take out one of the safeties. McCauley, wide to the left. Montanero lines up in a slot left. Hand off to Moore toward the goal line, and he is down at the one-yard line, just shy of the first down. Ray Curtin and Kelly Smith combined to stop the big fullback. There's the nose of that football. 
very, very close to the goal line at about the one and a half yard line or one yard line. This is what you do. You see a little trap here. I can't see the guards number, but it gives uh, more a little opening there. More wrestle and fights his way down it inside the two. Third and goal at the one. Diving to the goal is he in? More no signal yet. Apparently not. Moore diving to the goal line. It will be shy. And the biggest play of the ball game coming up for both clubs right here. Fourth and inches at the goal line. It's, it's academic at this point what you do. When you see the ball resting. That little white stripe there is the goal line. What you do again, you go back to the huddle. You tell your fullback to butt his chin strap, set a little bit deeper than normal, and give him the football. And Sachem, or rather Walt Whitman, unsure of a play, has taken one of its timeouts. You don't like to use those timeouts, but it's a critical play here, and they want to make sure they've got the right play because if they don't score here, it could be a tremendous boost for Sachem. They trail by only three. Whitman knocked at the door earlier, came away with nothing. They had to go for a field goal another time, and if they uh, don't get it here, uh, it could be, as I said, a real big lift for Sachem. It will be, Barry. When, once you get, uh, once you get the, the bull backed up into the corral like this, you walk away and leave the gate over. He's coming out after you. And Sachem has the offensive weapons to do that. And now Sachem's defensive coordinator coming out to talk things over with his club, as you see. Walt Whitman huddling back at the 15-yard line. They lead 10-7. They led 7-0 on a 74-yard drive. Walsh hitting Murphy with a 29-yard touchdown pass. Sachem tied it. Johnson, a six-yard pass to Passantino, a 75-yard 10-play drive. Then in the second quarter, Whitman on a Demati 36-yard field goal. Took the lead 10-7, to and that's the way it stands right now. I would say, Barry, after all this uh, confrontation, it is to give the ball to the big fullback, let him ram his way into the end zone. Well, what Moore has tried the last couple of times, and they've stood him right up. Well, the first time he took it down to the one, the second time he only got maybe a half, half yard. But uh, you well, give the big guy three cracks at it from down there. Rich Garitti has made his decision, and we'll watch what the play is along with you. Felder comes out wide to the left, but calling wide to the right. Everybody else in tight. Out of the eye. Hand off to Moore, and I don't think he got it. Sachem has held him at the goal line. Great job by Todd Drust, Mark Wojciechowski right in the middle of that line. Gary Butel, the linebackers, Curtin and Crean closing down the hole. And what a play by the Sachem defense. Two straight plays. They stopped the 230-pound fullback. This is what you do with it. You give it to the big guy. And if you can't get it in with him, then you just don't get it there. You've got three big guys coming down in that middle. you got Kelly Smith, Ray Curtin, Scott Green, Drost, and uh, Wojciechowski. They're all down in the anchor. Kelly Smith dove, Emerson, number 36, as you saw, just to make that contact before Moore could get to the goal line. And he's only 155 pounds. It shows you what Hart and Hustle will do. He gave away something like 70 pounds there to the big fullback. Hart, Hustle, and the desire. All right, let's see what Sachem can do from their own end zone. This is Body. Good hole as he's up to the seven-yard line. A pickup of round six by Body. The 40 was stopped by the Walt Whitman defense. That last play was a little bit scary there because it was a trap play up the middle, and uh, Body came very close to going the distance. Now the officials have called timeout with 3.03 to go. The ref apparently was shaken up in the middle of that uh, collision. The referee, what a super job Joe Dooley and his crew have done today. Tony Fiorentini, uh, Joel Grady, George DeMatteo, and Frank Luce. Now, mind you, you get a mad bull backed up into his stable and walk away from him and leave that gate over. He's going to come out. Now, Bonnie's been held in check, but he can break loose any time. And he gets the football again. Tries to go to the 10. He's shy of the 10. They have to go to the 11 for the first down. So important psychologically now for Walt Whitman to hold them, get the football back for the offense here. And, and should they be forced to punt, they should get the ball again in excellent field position. The worst thing that can happen to this Wildcat club right now, having uh, Station taking over the football inside the one-yard line, allowing them to move some 99 and a half yards for a score, could be totally demoralizing. Could be devastating. Now, Sachem has made a change into the ball game. Number four has checked in. We'll try to pick it up for you in a moment. Number four is John Burton at a running back spot. 
Handoff going to Body has the first down as he cracks across the 15 up to the 17 yard line. Another good trap play as Mike McGinley finally stopped him. But when you need the tough yardage, Mr. Body was right there to pick up the first down. Yes, here you'll see it all afternoon. But they've seen it all year as we watch again in a replay. You see uh, the ball being handed off from Johnson to number 31. Body Body fights his way for a big first down. Well, a good fake on the part of uh, the quarterback uh, there. And Mike Johnson faked to Gresspin. As you see, Body now with 48 yards, 18 here in the second half. A little more breathing room. They can open it up now if they want to. Power backfield. Handoff to Gresspin. Sophomore tripped up as he got about a yard to the 18 yard line by the Wildcats. Mike Sansada, number 75, the right tackle, 5'10, 250 pound senior, who's tough and low to the ground and holds that position very well. So it's second and nine, a one yard pickup, 114 to go, third quarter. As we've had two substitutions, Cascone has checked in on the lineup, number 26 at a flanker spot. Along with number 81, Charles Caputo. Cascone lines up wide to the left. Caputo wide to the right. Rolling to the right side. Johnson has a big hole. He's into the secondary. Still on his feet and down across the 40-yard line. So Mike Johnson with his second big run of the day. That one of over 20 yards. And Sachem now, it's quickly moved up from the one-half yard line up to the 42-yard line. Take another look here as you see Mike Johnson comes out on the option, and he sees right now there's all kinds of real estate in front. He takes off trying to get a block down in front, which he does from uh, number 81, Charles Capito, and just couldn't get around him. Kirk Murphy finally stopped him. Otherwise, he might have gone all the way for a touchdown. Johnson, their leading ball carrier so far, three carries, 74 yards. 44 seconds to go, third quarter. Sachem on the move, trailing 10-7. Throwing deep down the sideline, incomplete. It been a tough ball to catch. Well covered, Kirk Murphy, as he well covered the receiver, Charlie Caputo. But, Emma, I think they're looking back into the sun. The sun's setting, of course, in the west. And when you turn back to look, you could be blinded right there. Absolutely. You, you're taking a chance when you throw up against that sideline, uh, especially having to look over your shoulder. So it's second down. The clock stopped with 40 seconds to go. Sachem has never led in this ball game. They trailed 7-0, tied at 7-7, now trailing 10-7. As we approach the end of the third quarter. Johnson on second and 10. Option. And a beautiful play in the open field by number 32, Mike McGinley. Showed his speed, and as he pursued down the line, what you want a linebacker to do on that option, he played it well. Yes, uh, plus you're looking at uh, the Wildcats' leading tackler, uh, number 32, Mike McGinley. He only has 61 tackles now for the year that I can account for, and it's probably about 65 at this point. A couple of sacks to go with that. Excellent hitter. And uh, as we said, these two linebackers, Spadaro and McGinley, do a super job. Now, Sachem faced with a big third down play here, third and nine. They've done, they've done one thing very well this afternoon, and they've done a lot of things well. But one thing that I've noticed that they've done extremely well as we see the change of quarters come, I think. We're into the fourth quarter. All right, and we'll be back. We'll talk about that in a moment. We'll return for the fourth quarter. You're watching the Long Island Sports Network. NBC's young researcher, Bob Siegel, probes Washington for straight answers to tough questions. Bob's a total media person and credits his skills to Adelphi University and professors like Paul Pitkoff, an award-winning filmmaker who prepares his students to solve communications problems. The answers Bob got at Adelphi helped prepare him for his career. Maybe you'll find your answers at Adelphi, too. Hi, I'm Barry Landers with Jerry McDougall, president of Apple Bank. Jerry, we're just delighted to welcome Apple Bank as a member of our LISN family this year. Right, Barry, and we're certainly happy to join with LISN in encouraging the participation and honest competition in these sports events, which we think is good for our youth and good for Long Island. Apple Bank for Savings. We're working hard for you with five Long Island locations. Call 757-6100, member FDIC.
You're tuned to Viacom Cablevision of Long Island, TV6. Big third down play for that young man in the Flaming Arrows, Mike Johnson, third and nine. St. Jim trailing by three as we begin the fourth quarter. Play action, back to throw, Johnson looking deep for Casco, and then it's batted away by Kirk Murphy. Casco wanted a pass interference call, but Murphy at 6'3", 175, using his height, Emerson, fine basketball player, as is Mike Johnson, by the way, who's a fine point guard, but Murphy at 6'3", just batted it down. Well, Mike, uh, Mike went to the right receiver, had the receiver open, but in throwing, sometimes you can't really put it the way you want it, but had he put it out in front, it would have been possibly six or a big game because the play was well designed, well run, just didn't get the ball there the way it should have been. Sean McCauley and Kirk Murphy are the deep safeties to take the kick here, and it's put it away by Peter Sato. Downfield, they're going to just let it bounce. They don't want to take a chance of fumbling, and it'll be at the 20-yard line where Sachem will be defensively and where Whitman puts it in play first and 10. Whitman leading 10 to 7. And then they've had three chances to score. Not able to cash in on a couple of those. 35-yard kick. And if you'd like to write and give us a couple of your comments on our football coverage this year, we'd certainly like to hear from you. Barry Landers and Emerson Boozer. And here's the address. The LISN. Care of Cablevision. One Media Crossways, Woodbury, New York. 11797. Don't forget after the game to stay tuned for our Apple Bank Player of the Game Award. Right now, Matt Walsh barking out the signals. Pitch coming to the near side to Moore. And Moore taken down after about a two-yard pickup by Jim Isernia, the right cornerback. It'll be second and eight, as that play was slow in developing in the backfield. So it'll be second and eight with 11.17 to go in this fourth quarter. Now substitution in the ball game for the Wildcats. Mike McGinley replaces Richie Spadaro in the backfield. Leading rusher so far has been Moore, 21 carries, 76 yards. Spadaro, 9 for 40. McGinley, 7 for 25. And Walsh is carrying twice for 9 yards. Walsh looking sideline, complete to buy Chris Montanero, and he has a first down. That ball was tipped, and Montanero had the presence and cool calm of mind to have good concentration and come up with a football, and we'll take a look at it on the replay. Good concentration here as you see Walsh throws down over the head of a couple of defenders, and the ball was tipped a bit, but uh, that shows that uh, it was tipped by number 51, Scott Green, but it shows that the receiver had good concentration on the football. And that is a very big first down for Whitman. You've got to kind of regain the momentum. The other team stops you at the one-yard line. They move the ball up to about the 45-yard line, and there is a player down on the field. We're trying to pick up who it is. Apparently is a Walt Whitman player. We cannot see from our vantage point as the Whitman staff is huddling over him. And we'd like to thank all the fine people associated with the Walt Whitman program here for their splendid hospitality. And it goes from everybody, including the superintendent of schools, Dr. Daniel A. Dominich, the principal, uh, John O'Farrell, and the athletic director, uh, John DeLuca. I've known John for many years, dating back to 1972-73, when he was out at Longwood High School, a super guy, as is Tommy Sabatel, the athletic director at Sage, and we couldn't have had more splendid cooperation from either school. I think uh, both, guys, both schools have done an outstanding job in helping us put on these uh, productions, and uh, we've enjoyed it as much as they. Well, apparently the player who is down is a Sachem player. It is Kelly Smith, number 36, who came into this ball game with a banged up Achilles heel. And he is down. We'd like to also thank Charlie McGuckin, the coordinator for Suffolk County football, the fine athletic director at Half Hollow Hills High Schools. And uh, so many people to thank him, the uh, coaches associations for the respective schools, and they've done a great job this year. We've been delighted to have some of the finest football teams uh, in Suffolk County on. We had Central Islip going up against East Islip. We had West Babylon and Bayshore. We had Bellport and Sayville. And we're having this uh, outstanding championship game, Northport, of course, and Sachem earlier. Well, a 
as the players attended to, we'd also like to remind you that that fellow up there was worked such a splendid season for us. Don Palumbo, our cameraman, leaving us after this game today. It's his final game as a cameraman. Then we don't really credit the people behind the scenes very often, but without their splendid work under some tough conditions, it sometimes uh, <laughs> is a little uh, difficult. We get bad weather. They're up there and uh, doing a great job. Yeah, we sit here sometimes, many times, sheltered by a, a roof over our head, but these guys are sometimes up in a high perch somewhere, uh, always braving the elements, and they do an outstanding job. We just can't say enough for the work to do. Well, as the player is up, Kelly Smith, he is going across the field to his uh, sideline, apparently okay, and we're happy to report that. And of course, we may be cold, Glenn Goldberg, you and I, but Bob DePoto, Larry Roth, they're in the warm truck inside calling the shots. So hats off to them. They've done a splendid job, too, this year. And the 1984 Suffolk County Football Coaches Association, while we're handing out kudos, President Nick Schroeder from William Floyd, Vice President Frank Luisi, who is an assistant coach here at Sachem, Secretary Vinny DeRiggi, and from Brentwood, the treasurer John Hogeland from Comac North, as we're set to go here. First down, you see Whitman almost twice as many on first down to throw. Up the middle is going to be nearly intercepted and nearly caught at the same time. Number 83, Kirk Murphy, as that ball was tipped, almost came up with it. And we'll take another look at that one. Now, here's a case of uh, a receiver not concentrating on the football as Walsh delivers down the middle. It looks as though it's going to be intercepted, yet it was tipped. And the receiver, number 83, Kirk Murphy, took his eyes off of it. So it sets up second and ten. There's Murphy on the sidelines. He's had an outstanding day, Murphy. He made a couple of brilliant catches and has caught the only touchdown of the day. But lost concentration on the last play. On second and ten from the eye. The handoff going to Spadero, and he's going nowhere. That Sachem defense on the right side. Gary Butel caving in the play quickly. Number 78, the outstanding sophomore, and also number 51, Scott Crean. We watch the replay here, Barry. Number 78, Butel, as you mentioned, a sophomore. Now, here's a guy that's going to anchor this line for another two years, and he's going to be difficult to handle. And also help uh, on that side from number 64, Lance Laviano, who comes in in certain situations at a nose guard spot in that 5 2 4. Now, a big third down play for Whitman if they want to keep the drive going with 9.55 to go. They have not had a turnover yet today, and this would be an ill time to have one for them. Play action. Walsh in trouble. Holds onto the football as he's taken down for a sack at the 30-yard line. So the Sachem defense again, the last two series that Whitman's had the football has been awfully tough. Yes, they have. Uh, guys uh, like uh, number 64, Lance Leviano, uh, he's one of those little guys that are quick, but yet uh, big. He's got good size to him. Uh, weight at 200 pounds, 5'9", but quick. He's in there, number 64. Punting situation here for DeMatty. Oh, again, we remind you, he had one block last week. He does all the kicking. 38-yard average. Whitman has seven, eight men up at the line as they may try to block it. High snap. He has time as they do not come. And now, flag goes down. It's going to be a roughing the kicker penalty as Bauer picks it up at the 40. Sachin will lose the ball back. And I believe it was number 46 for Sachin will be called for the penalty. And we'll try to show that number out. Going to be Sullivan. Yep, Jeff Sullivan, 6'1", an 80-pound senior. And the ball will be brought back. You watch along with us. This is not uh, the kind of thing you want to see happen when you're trying to get the football. But uh, as a punter, get that left foot out there. He hangs it up there a good, good, good while. And here comes Sullivan, number 46. He got a piece of a good a piece of foot. And so Whitman will retain possession, a very costly penalty to Sachin. The ball moved up to the 45-yard line, where it'll be first and 10 with nine minutes to go. Whitman clinging to a three-point lead. As Scott DeManny, the man is smiling a little bit. He made his biggest play of the game. Of course, he has the biggest play right now of the game. He's the difference with his 36-yard field goal. Now, DeManny calls it a little bit because he hung that left foot up there for quite a while. Good bit of acting from the <laughs> Method School. <laughs> Walsh on first down. They've given a new life here. Moore 
He's been stopped the last few times by the Sage of Defense. Gets three yards before Butel again stopped him. Butel starting tackle the last five games knows where the ball is. That's something you can't teach him. It's almost intuition for a defensive player. Yes, a lot of coaches call it nose for the football, but it's instinctive, I think. Uh, and plus a good ability to understand what's happening in front of him. There's Freddie Fusaro, a bit concerned right now. His club last year did not lose any games. They've lost only one this year. They've lost one game in two years. And now they're trailing with Whitman holding on to the football on second and seven. Little mix up in the backfield. Walls will pitch it back. Mm. And McGinley driven down. Finally stayed on his feet for a moment, but taken down uh, for a loss at the 45 yard line. Again, a little bit of a mix up in the backfield. That's happened a couple of times in the Whitman backfield. Right. That time we saw number 10 Walsh and number 20 Eric Moore, as you'll see, uh, as we missed here at pickup. They collide in the backfield earlier. Now you see Walsh comes down. He throws back to McGinley. McGinley takes a big hit from Jack Johnson, bounces off, bounces off. But Jack Johnson catches him on, re on the return. So it's third and big yardage here as the clock sets back in motion. Let's call it third and 10 back at the 45 yard line. 7.40 to go. Whitman with the ball and a three point lead. Walsh, maybe a screen up the middle. It will be complete to Montanero. Montanero trying to get to the first down is stopped shy at the 49 or 48 yard line. It'll be about three yards shy of the first down. And Demandy should be coming back in the ball game. He is in a punting situation. This is what we call a tight end screen or a tight end drag across. As you see, number 88, Chris Montanero, comes on a good piece of running here, but he's got to turn it up strong immediately as he does, but just does not get the first down. Montanero's caught four passes for 36 yards. Murphy has caught three for 53. So Demandy will get another punt away here from about the 40-yard line. Let's see if he hangs his leg this time. As the deep backs are Bauer and Matlack. High snap, he steps forward. They don't rush. End over end kick, bouncing down the far side. Takes a bounce for Sachem. Bounces upfield to be down at about the 23 24 yard line. Where the Flaming Arrows with 6.41 to go put it in play, trailing by a score of 10 to 7. Lamerson, it looked like this was going to be an offensive show. The first time each club had the football in the first quarter, they marched them 75 yards for scores, but we talked about the defenses of uh, both teams being so strong. Sachem's come up with a goal line stand. They stopped them at the five yard line another time. And uh, credit Walt Whitman. This is an explosive Sachem team offensively at times, and they've been able to shut him down. Yes, uh, both clubs came out in the opening quarter flexing their muscles, showing their offensive strength, and that they did by scoring right away. Johnson pitching to Body. He's got two blockers with him. Body trying to turn up field is down at the 27 yard line after a pickup of around four or three. Good pursuit again by Joe Grella. There's a look at Rich Caritti. Played a little bit at post, a little bit at North Carolina. He went down there, ended up playing at Adelphi, and he and Lou Antonetti were teammates. And uh, they've been over here for the last six years together. Concerned look on his face as he suffered the last couple of years. But Whitman on the rebound this year. Did he ever suffer last year? One and seven. Yeah, they paid their dues, so to speak. Second and seven. 5.49 to go. Johnson, play action, has time. Looking for Passantino. Deep the sideline. It is going to be complete. Passantino or check it. Venturo making the catch. Number 88, or was it Passantino 38? Both were there, uh, and it was 38 Passantino. Yes, so Passantino, another outstanding catch, a 32-yard pass. Mike Passantino has tremendous hands. Show that on that catch. Right, here is a mistake by the quarterback, number 31, Darrell Felder. Felder's got great position. He stops instead of continuing to run. He was relying on his elite picking ability to go up for the interception. Went up for it, was not able to reach it over the heads into uh, Passantino's hand. Big gainer. Passantino's got three passes for 46 yards and one touchdown. First and 10 at the 39 and a half yard line for Sachem. Again, play action. Looking sideline, screens it out, but number 42 is right over there to make the hit for the Wildcats. Good defensive play by Jack DeWitt, the left defensive end, very aggressive, hard hitter, who has eight sacks to his credit and a number three tackler. 
just an outstanding play here by number 42, the left defensive end, Jack DeWitt. DeWitt comes over and makes a good hit on the fullback, number eight, uh, Joe Gaspin. So Gaspin stopped there. It'll be a loss of three, setting up second and 13. 4.52 to go as the shadows start to take over the field. Uh, as it's becoming late in the afternoon here at Walt Whitman High School, the big crowd draped around the field, watching the Suffolk County Division I Championship. Johnson rolling under pressure. Has some room, and now running out of room as he's taken down. Good defensive play by Mike McGinley as he was being chased all over the field by the Whitman Wildcats, and finally McGinley ran him out of bounds. But again, Johnson didn't put the ball up for grabs, showed the poise him. He didn't have the play there. Rather than throw an interception, which could cost his team the game, uh, he took the loss there of a, of a yard or so, setting up third and long. And that's what a good leader or a good captain has to do. Rather than the bat and ship, he's going to have to stay with it. And that's how uh, Johnson stayed right with it, even though he barely got back to his original line of scrimmage. Let's call it third and 12, as Bobby Ventura lines up as a tight end to the left side. Passantino at the right side. Full house backfield on third and 12. They line up in a running formation, but it's a passing situation. Play action here. Johnson throwing. He's got a man open. It's Passantino close to the first down. The first down. He had to get inside the 30 at the 29-yard line, and I believe he has it, although they may measure here. And the officials say, let's have time out here. But another well-thrown ball by Johnson and an excellent catch by Mike Passantino. Now, this is the bread and butter guy in tight situations. You'll see number 38, Mike Passantino, cross over from his right side all the way across the field. He gets hit right about there. Number 84, Tony Milano. Milano makes a stop, but it's a first down. His brother uh, was the quarterback two years ago. He's now up at Albany State. Milano, 5'11", 160-pound junior. So we're coming down to a great finish for our high school football season. Sachem trailing 10-7. They've never led in this game. 4.15 to go. As they try to take the lead here. Of course, should the game end in a tie, we will go to an overtime. We'll talk about that later. Johnson handing off. This is Body. Nowhere to go for Body as he's stopped by Brian Long, number 54, and number 53, Joe Grella, the right end. So it sets up second and about eight. Pick up of, uh, let's call it two on that last play. 3.58 to go. Now the clock stopped the official four minute warning in high school football. Both teams are being told about the time remaining. Now checking into the ball game is Casco, number 26 at a flanker back spot. Substitutions being made now for Sachem as Tony Milano checks back into the ball game, replacing Chris Cameron, number 72, and big number 75, Mike Sansada, at 250 pounds, comes off the line. They want some more quickness in there. Now the clock will be started back in motion. It's been stopped at 3.58. Second and eight. They've called the time. And they'll go back and re-huddle again. So, I don't know what that was all about. <laughs> Here that they had their play called. Now, well, this game started over two hours ago. Well, two hours and ten minutes, and we still got four minutes to go. Johnson, out of the eye formation with Grespin and Body. He's got a slot right formation. Looking to the right side, under some pressure, throws the ball to the sideline, out of bounds. Did they catch it complete? Oh, it looked like he was out, but they say the receiver dragged his foot in bounds. Danny Coyne, number 83, I believe, was the man who made the catch, and we'll look at it again. This was just an outstanding play, both by the quarterback, number 11, Mike Johnson, and number 83, uh, Danny Coyne. Danny Coyne. Now, what he does down, down the, near the sideline, he hangs both feet in bounds, leans a little bit to make sure he's got the football and falls out of bounds. Just an outstanding maneuver. The ball at the 14-yard line where it is first and 10. So Coyne, the 6'180-pound senior who came in catching six passes for 100 yards, comes up with a fine reception. 3.41 to go. Sachem down by three. They've got the football. Power eye formation. 
fake to Grespin. Now the keeper and Johnson not going to go anywhere. Smothered by the middle of that line. Chris Kammer, 72, and Brian Long, 54. Uh, number 76, Zaro Perpati was the first man to get there. As we watch again in our replay, look off to the right of your screen. See number 76 there? He comes off, fights, he finds the quarterback. Mike Johnson holds on first, and then he gets the help from the rest of the guys like number 72, Chris Cameron. No gain. It is second and 10 with 3.10 to go in the fourth quarter. Venturo split left end, Passantino the right end. Wide sets between the linemen. Pitch coming to Body. Body looking to throw. He's got Casco in the end zone. Incomplete. Oh, that was close. Kirk Murphy defending on the option pass as Body was looking for Casco. A uh, trick play there, and you got to admire Fred Fisero for calling it there. I didn't mean to step on your toes there, but right about here, I noticed that Body's going to throw it, so I'm screaming. He's going to throw the football, and that he does, and he just barely misses Chris Cohn. Kirk Murphy with the man defending third and 10 at the 14, and now Sachem has taken one of its three timeouts. And Freddy Fusaro with the decision. As you see, time remaining, 2.55. The referee, Joe Dooley, talking things over with the young quarterback, Mike Johnson. Johnson, the point guard on Sachem's fine basketball team. Had an outstanding game running the football today. He's passed only for uh, 90 yards, 8 for 14 for one touchdown and one interception. But he's run for 77 yards and six carries. All right, Emmett, it's third and 10. Let's put you in that Sachem huddle right now. As you see Johnson, what do you think Freddie Fusaro is uh, going to be talking about? I think he's going to throw the football again. Uh, down here, he's uh, moved down there by the throwing of Mike Johnson. So I, I, would, I, would, I would say that he would go right back and rest on the passing round of number 11, Mike Johnson. Well, as you watch the crowd here, that's the Walt Whitman side of the field. Big crowd. This is probably the biggest crowd Whitman's had for a football game in a long time, Emerson Boozer. I'm sure of that, uh, because we guesstimate roughly 4,000, but it could be closer to five. Yeah, the whole South Huntington community has uh, really gotten behind the club in the last few weeks. Yes, that's what winning does. Winning brings out the best. And we know this out the court. Losing keeps everybody in. Well, folks in the Huntington area delighted, and we're delighted to have this football game for you. Cascone lines up wide to the left. Wide to the right is Charles Caputo. Single setback. It's body in motion. Passantino. Long count Johnson. Looking for the end zone. He's got a man out there. And it's going to be complete for a touchdown. Passantino with a great catch. And Sachem with 2.48 to go has taken the lead. At 13 to 10. That's just uh, one of those things that you expect. You know they're going to throw the football and who they're going to throw it to. None other than the guy they look for most times in tight situations. Number 38, Mike Passantino. And that time he came across in motion. Normally he's a tight end, but he lined up in the backfield. Motion to his left, turned up into the end zone. And uh, Johnson was able to get the ball over the defenders to his favorite receiver, number 38, Mike Passantino. 14-yard touchdown pass, his fifth reception, second touchdown reception of the day. And Sachem will try the extra point here that will give them a four-point lead should they make it and, of course, negate the possibility of a field goal that would have tie, would tie the game and send it into overtime. So a very important try for Peter Sato. 2.48 remaining. Casco, the holder, the kick on the way. It is partially blocked, but it goes through. So the Flaming Arrows, who never led in this football game up until moments ago, have taken a four-point lead, 14 to 10. And it'll be up to the Whitman Wildcats, who have the offensive explosion power, to come back as we look at the touchdown by Sachin that put him in front. Here it is again. Uh, you see Mike Johnson. You can't see Passantino at this point because he's already come across in motion. He's working down to the down the uh, right sideline into the end zone. Goes up, makes just an outstanding catch. And you got to credit a well-thrown ball by Mike Johnson. He laid it right out there. And there are the Whitman fans hoping their club can turn it around. That last drive, 76 yards, 10 plays for Sachin. The key play, the 32-yard pass to Coyne that set up that 14-yard pass to Passantino. And now we'll see what Walt Whitman has made out of. 
They have been unable to move the football the last couple of times. Twice they had the ball inside the 10, once at the 5. A sack moved it back at the end of the first half to the 20. They were stopped with Moore twice at the goal line from the yard line. All right, we're set up for the kickoff, and there are the deep backs as they're back to take the kick here. McGinley, number 83, is uh, back to uh, take the kick for uh, the Walt Whitman Wildcats. We'll pick them up for you in a moment. It's Kirk Murphy. Moore is also back there, number 20. He's the short man. And Mike McGinley, as we said, 32. And Richie Spadaro, 33. Spadaro will take it and down it inside the end zone. And it'll bring it back to the 20-yard line. Where it'll be first and 10 for the Walt Whitman Wildcats. Well, Whitman's dream of a conference championship, division championship, riding on the line here. As they'll put it in play with Matt Walsh at quarterback. What do you look now, for him with 2.48 left? We're going to see them throwing a the football, but uh, you talked about Whitman's dream. This club has uh, worked uh, together for the last two years. Both that, that, both that offensive and defensive line, they're the same people that played there last year. This is their last shot. They're all seniors. They want to win it. Now's the time. Back to throw, looking for Felder. Sideline pass is complete. Short game. It's about a five-yard pickup to the 25 as Felder was taken down by Jim Isernia, number 22. There's Rich Caridi. Second and five, 2.34 to go. And there's Rich Caridi on the sideline. Second and five. Felder this time wide to the right. They've got a slot left formation. Looking to throw Walsh. Complete to Felder. He has the first down at the 32-yard uh, line. Clock will stop now with 2.15 to go. Again, Walt Whitman has two timeouts remaining. They used one of their timeouts on a drive earlier in this third quarter. In the third quarter. Now Richie Spadaro checks into the ball game, replacing Mike McGinley. So Walsh has thrown two passes. They should be conceding the short passes here. Keep in mind, uh, the Wildcats had three big turnovers that they were unable to score on. And uh, we mentioned that once you let the bull in, out, of the, out of the gate, he comes out and haunts you. Now this time McGinley, or rather McCauley, wide to the left. Looking for McCauley, drops it shorter, incomplete. Looking for uh, McGinley coming out of the backfield, or rather Spadero. It'll be uh, second and ten with 1.59 left of the clock. Walt Whitman trailing 14 to 10. As you see, the sideline, the Whitman Wildcats. They have led virtually throughout the start of the game. They jumped in front early in the first quarter, 7 0, taking the opening kickoff and going 74 yards. And they're going to have to move it 80 yards here as they took over from the 20. It can't be done. If they're giving you the short step, take that five drop and make sure you get out of bounds. Murphy with single coverage to the near side. Looking for Murphy down the sideline, looking deep. Murphy out there, makes a splendid catch. First down at the 40-yard line. Kirk Murphy having a, quite an afternoon. For Murphy, it's his fourth catch, and he picked up over 20 yards on that one. This is the second time today that he's gotten a hold of number 22, Jim Isernia. Uh, watch Murphy as he comes down, he runs a corner-type pattern. Nice throw by Walsh, and big catch by number 83, Kurt Murphy. Well, Sachem was involved in a barn burner last year with East Islip. Sachem scored in the closing seconds to earn that tie. East Islip was upset about the play in that game. Right now, it's first and 10 at the 40 with 150 to go. This is Moore down the side. football does for you. Just about a minute ago, this Walt Whitman side of the field had gone to a dead silence when uh, Sasha had gone for the lead, but now their club, the Wildcats, are on the move again, Barry. The ball at the 20-yard line, slot right formation. McCauley lines up in the slot with Montanero. Handoff going to number 32, McGinley, and he holds onto the football after getting one tough yard to the 19. 139 to go. And Whitman still with two timeouts will exercise one of them. So they've got one remaining as they went to the run that time. And nothing was doing for Mike McGinley. So timeout taken with 139 to go. And what a fitting end 
for our high school football season, Emerson. It's going to be one of those uh, tight finishes or fantastic finishes, as we might say. Uh, just as we saw yesterday, those of you that saw the Miami-Boston uh, College game, what an outstanding finish for a college football game. It was indeed. And we've got a barn burner on our hands here. Again, if you've enjoyed the coverage, we'd like to hear from you. Barry Landers and Emerson Boozer, drop us a line. Here on the Long Island Sports Network, Cablevision, one media crossways, Woodbury, New York, 11747. As we told you earlier, we've got a great high school basketball season. Some 25, 30 games you'll be seeing from Nassau and Suffolk County schools, including both the Walt Whitman and St. Jim will be on. Second and nine, and what do you look for as Rich Caridi is continuing the discussion on the sideline? We're going to see them throw the football. We're down to a minute 39 seconds before the completion of the ball game. Uh, what they have done well all year is throw the football along with running. So but we will see them throw it down here. Again, they line up with a slot right formation. Felder to the near side at the bottom of the uh, picture. You'll see in a moment. He's back to the left side. Walsh looking over the line. The ball marked for play here on second and nine. Bobbles the snap. Has time. Now running out of time. Throws in the crowd. Intercepted Jack Johnson right in the middle of things. The strong safety number 80. That was almost the end of the season for this young man, uh, number 10, Matt Walsh. And Walsh rolls off to his right, gets a lot of pressure, and throws it back right into the uh, just a bunch of ball players there. Uh, even though he has a lot of his players there, but an awful lot of season arrows there too. The ball at the 19-yard line. It is third and nine. 1:34 to go. Whitman with one timeout remaining. As the officials call time for a moment. Whitman was starting to line up. Now let's see what the call is going to be. Apparently they motion toward the Sachem sideline. Something the officials. Apparently somebody is interfering with things. The band, apparently the band was making noise. They couldn't hear the signal. And they asked him to quiet down the Sachem band on the far side. So number nine, John Pierre went to the other side to have a conference with the Pizarro. Murphy lines up as a split right end. McCauley wide to the left. Play action. Throwing. It's complete. Montanero driven down, shy of the first down. A short pickup. However, he got inside the 15. It'll be to the 14-yard line, setting up fourth and four with a minute 18 on the clock continuing to run. We look at our replay again. Montanero drives across from his tight end slot, comes over to get hit by Jack Johnson, stopping the first down. Well, they're using plenty of time here. The clock down to 105 and ticking away. The season riding right here on fourth and four from the 14-yard line. They've got to go just outside the 10 for the first down. Pitches. Reverse around the near side to Felder. Speed. Felder has the first down. Can he get out of bounds? He's driven down. I don't think he has the first down. Wait, I thought he yes, had it. Yes, oh, it's yes. going to be close. He was taken down at the 10. Let's see where they mark the progress here. It's going to be very close. Sachem thought they had stopped him. Whitman thinks they have the first down. The good eye says they've got it, Barry. And hold everything. Our cameraman. <laughs> Greg Raman in the middle of things right there, and that's where Greg likes to be. The good eye says they have it. And we'll look. Sachem thinks no. Whitman thinks yes. They're going to bring the chains in, and we'll know in a moment. As tension builds here at Walt Whitman High School. As they pull that chain as far as it can go, it is a first down.
trailing 14 to 10. Down over the ball comes Peter Hansen. Again to the right side, McCauley and Montanero. Back to 12. No, the handoff going to Moore, and they stop him cold. And the clock ticks down to 37 seconds, 36, and they call a timeout. That's their final timeout, Evan. Shades of the St. John's uh, Hofstra game here. A running play in the closing seconds when you're down at the 10-yard line. Big play by number 76 that time, Todd Gross, uh, because had he not gotten out of the big guy, he would have been down near that end zone. But uh, as we mentioned before, as you mentioned just then, the shades of the St. John's Hofstra game, it's kind of difficult to call a running play when you're out of timeouts and you're down inside that territory. You've got to almost take a pass all the way. Now you've used your final timeout. Should the quarterback be sacked here, trying to pass? It could be all she wrote. The ball resting outside the 10-yard line. And Whitman has called its final timeout. The sun just about setting in the West. Now at this point, Barry, uh, your, only, your only survival is to, if you're going to run the football, it has to either go into the end zone for a six-pointer, or you have to take it out of bounds and stop that clock. So uh, you've got to think mainly pass here. And when you run, you've got to think running to the outside. Well, the Sachem defense being talked to right over there by their fine defensive coordinator, Tom Dunn. Or, uh, check it, Sachem defensive coordinator, Steve Hackett. And now Whitman with 36 seconds left in the season for one of these two clubs, actually for both of them. One's going to go home a champion, and one's going to be a hard luck loser. We'll watch and see along with you. This club took over at the 20-yard line. They moved it down to the 10-yard line. They moved it 70 yards. They've got another 10 toughest yards into the end zone. The whole year rests on this uh, play coming up of this series. Now the lifetime for all these seniors. 36 seconds to go. Walsh with time. With time throwing up the middle. It's going to be incomplete. No flags. And number 87, Sean McCauley, got his hands on it. He was hammered by the goalpost, and he appears to be hurt as the officials have motioned for help from the sideline. It looks as though at this point here, as Walsh gets the ball, a little soft floater over the heap here, and uh, goes up. The ball goes into his hands. He just doesn't hold on to it. And McCauley looks like he got hit by the goalpost as he was reaching up for that pass, and he may have hit his head, but he is uh, being attended to. The clock, of course, stops with the injury there with 30 seconds left. It'll be third and 10 from the 10-yard line. And let's take another look at uh, You'll see him get hit and not do the goalpost here. Okay, now the ball goes through his hands. He gets pushed and hit. Oh, yes, the head bangs right up against the goalpost as he's hit by number 51, Scott Green. Well, he is being helped up, and he will go to the sideline. So a very important receiver out of action right now. Let's see who Rich Caridi will replace him with. He's got Daryl Felder, Kirk Murphy as his wide receivers. He's got Chris Montanero. And Richie Spadero will check into the ball game, replacing Mike McGinley. He's got a couple of guys enlisted behind him. Tony Aguido, number 14, and number 22, Marvin uh, Shittick. Aguido, number 40, of course, is the brother Alex Aguido, a former basketball star here, went to Penn State and left there after a year or so. Down to this, 30 seconds to go. It's third and 10 for Walt Whitman at the 10-yard line. No timeouts remaining. As Kurt Lengby, number 86, is in the ball game as a wide receiver to the right side. Walsh looking deep for the sideline. He's got a man out there. A touchdown! Complete to Kurt Murphy and the Golden Wild in Walt Whitman High School. And the Wildcats have gone 80 yards in the final two and a half minutes. And Kurt Murphy is the man of the hour. Just a couple of minutes ago, the play was going wild. Side. This time it's almost Lake Placid on their side of the field. Whitten 
just been an outstanding day for both these clubs, both the Sachem Arrows and the Whitman Wildcats, because they have fought right down to the wire, and the ball game was not over until it's over. And if you believe in uh, saying that it's not over, just wait and see what these uh, Sachem Arrows will do with the football as soon as they take over. Murphy has caught five passes for 88 yards and two touchdowns, and Walsh has thrown 12 for 22 for check it. Uh, 13 for 24 for 139 yards and two touchdowns, including this potential game winner. Look at Walsh here looking for number 83. A big guy all day long in for the touchdown. I don't know. Uh, that was Bobby Golini, number five, Golini. who was in there for the first time, I believe, this afternoon. Maybe an injury to one of their deep backs, the regular backs, but he got turned around by Murphy on that play. So we're ready to go with the kickoff. Mind you, County Bowen had a 55 yard kickoff return against Northport in a game we televised earlier here in the LISN. But again, as we say, what a fitting comeback for Walt Whitman. They had the lead all the way, they blew the opportunities, they showed the pride, the character, the togetherness to come 80 yards marching up this field on a very tough Sachem defensive part. Yes, right now, whoever gets the ball is going to have to either, either uh, down it right away or run the ball out of bounds to stop the clock. But keep in mind, too, that uh, Sachem has a couple of explosive receivers, mainly number 38, Pasentino. And, of course, Body, I'm sure they're putting Body back to receive the kick. He doesn't normally take him. And here's number 31. Keep your eye on that guy because they want him to have the football. A all-county performer this year. Wind up his career in the final 26 seconds and probably be a Division I player as a receiver. Here's the kickoff coming by Scott Devaney to the near side, taken by the St. Jim player. Tries to cut outside. Still on his feet, but the clock ticks away as he gets across the 30 to the 32 yard line. The clock stops with 18 seconds as that St. Jim player was uh, number 20 returning the football. It'll be first to 10, and that player was John Driscoll, number 20. So now St. Jim takes over. They really don't have the deep threats in, exception of Body, who has the great speed at 4-6 to, to get out there, although Pasatino has had a tremendous game catching the football. Now line up Body as a wide receiver to the right side. Rest of the single setback, 10 seconds. The clock set back in motion. They didn't call any timeouts. This could be the final play of the game. Back to throw Johnson. It will be the final play. It is going to be intercepted by Darrell Felder. Felder, the game is over. The game is over as he runs out of bounds into the arms and he wants to keep going. Pushed down by a Sage of player, which was a dirty play, and he runs across the field. They're going to grab the player, the officials, and that should not have happened. It's been a great game, a clean game, but the Sage of player maybe got carried away with himself, and Walt Whitman has done it dramatically coming from behind a win, 17 to 14. Darrell Felder with the interception. It was Felder who got the first down on the end around reverse. And the Wildcats have done it. They have shocked the football world. What a crazy year it's been in Suffolk County football. Said nice to upset by Belford on their way to the Rutgers Cup. And now Sachem denied once again, this time by Walt Whitman. The man that came out of bounds to hit Felder was number 54, Vinny Yakano. And uh, you really can't fault Yakano for it. Here's something that you've worked for since early in summer. You went to summer camp, you come back, you start training all year, you fight to become, uh, and to get into the playoffs, then you get to the championship game, and to lose it, uh, it's really heartbreaking. Both guys, uh, I'm sure, will have no hard feelings. And it was a well played game. We had few penalties, we had no incidents between the clubs, and uh, well, it's history right now. And for the Whitman Wildcats, their first championship since 1974, and well deserved, and we'll be back. Him and I and Carl with our Apple Bank Player of the Game and a chat with winning coach Rich Caridi right after these messages. You're watching the Long Island Sports Network. I'm Barry Landers with Jerry McDougall, president of Apple Bank. Jerry, we're just delighted to have Apple Bank as a sponsor this year. Tell us what prompted your decision to join us. Well, Barry, aside from the fact that I was born in Lindbrook, Apple Bank has five branches here on Long Island and is involved in each of the communities that we serve. We think Long Island's future is bright because of our youth, and we're proud to support them. Apple Bank for Savings. We're working hard for you with five Long Island locations. 
I'm Mary Tyler Moore, asking you to become my partner in caring by supporting the North Shore Child and Family Guidance Center. For over 30 years, the center has provided a lifeline of mental health services for children, adolescents, and their families throughout northern Nassau County. We've joined together to provide positive, responsive programs for those in need of help. Won't you join us, too? For more information, please call 516-626-1971. And thank you for caring. What the world needs now is love, sweet love. It's the only thing that there's just too little love. The world is full of kids who need a grown-up for a friend. Become a big brother or big sister, because little people need big people, like you. Sure do. We're back here at Walt Whitman High School. It's a delirious scene. The players are all gathered around us, and a sensational game, Emerson Boozer, and our Apple Bank player of the game, the gentleman on your left, Kirk Murphy, uh, with a super, super job. He caught two touchdown passes, and I know that uh, he just had a splendid game. You got a quick question for Murphy. Yes, Murph, you had an outstanding day, but at 6'3", 170-some pounds, it's kind of tough for most defenders that are about 5'7", five, 5'8", five, uh, to stay with you. Uh, this is true. Um, well, on the play, in the end zone, I just, it wasn't a planned play. I just told him to merely throw it up. I had the obvious height advantage over him, and I uh, just came back down with the ball. All right. Kirk Murphy, our Apple Bank player of the game. The fellow who threw the touchdown pass is going to be long remembered here at Walt Whitman High School, Matty Walsh. Matty, let's talk about that. Moments before that, it was, of course, a third and ten. You tried a running play with Eric. They stopped it at the ten. Let's talk about that touchdown pass, what the play was, and as you saw it develop. The play was up. We were supposed to flood the, flood the right zone, but uh, no immersed height and going to more game. We decided to just put it up in the left corner and just came down with it. It was we checked off. We checked off with it. All right, you're cool now. When you saw the ball wafting towards Murph in the end zone when he caught it, what was your reaction? I said the owl father. <laughs> <laughs> Matt Walsh, Kirk Murphy. Kirk, now... That was a different defender. I don't even know if you noticed. Bobby Gallini, number five, had been in the ball game just briefly. You had been playing against, I think, Piero, number nine, for quite a bit of time there. I had a feeling that he was a little inexperienced, um, seriously. And uh, I figured I'd just, you know, take him to the corner, and uh, that was it. Number nine was defending me most of the game. And uh, number five, you know, showed his obvious inexperience, and I took advantage of that. M, what a ball game. And I know Eric Moore had a super game, rushed for over 90 yards. The whole team, defense shut down, Sachem pretty much all day. Congratulations to Kirk Murphy, Eric Moore, Matt Walsh. It's a big day in South Huntington. It's been an outstanding, outstanding day. These guys were all seniors, and it's, it is their day. They will bask in the sunshine forever. Well, from uh, from the right now standing by, as it's been a little while down here, our colleague Carl Reuter to talk to Rich Caritti, who remembers what it's like losing the last couple of years, but is in enjoy the victory right now as his club comes away with a big, big victory. Thanks very much, Barry. Uh, Rich, BC Miami all over again, or what? Well, I don't know about that. We had good weather today. All right, let's 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 go back and, and reminisce a little bit. The last couple of years, the club only had won three games. This year, you come back real strong. What's the difference? Well, as far as personnel, there isn't too much difference. We have the same boys out here. They're a year older. Uh, we won this game today not only because of the talent, because of the discipline that we showed out there. That's what won the game today. How much preparation went into this week's game? I mean, you beat West Islip last year. Sachem's only loss of the season was against West Islip. Preparation every week, and uh, this week hasn't been any different. We've been preparing. We have three coaches, Coach Antonetti, Coach Dunn, myself, and, then, uh, you know, we're up 12 o'clock, just like any coaching staff is. You know, an awful lot goes into it. The boys were prepared this year. Uh, what I'm saying is they were certainly prepared prepared for this game it meant a little bit uh, an awful lot to them uh, we lost 143 nothing last year to station they got good memories is this a payback I don't know if I'd call it that. They played real well. Sachem did. Uh, you know, you don't want to... The fact that we have two teams that make it the final, you got two winners. Uh, we ended up on the right side of the score, and we love it. But uh, the fact that you make the finals, you don't have any losers out there. In this moment of glory, what are you actually thinking about now? Is it going to take a couple of hours to really settle in that it's division, uh, Suffolk County Division One champs? Well, we... <clears throat> 
it's settled in right now, but uh, right now, when I, I don't want to come down. Let's just stay up there and enjoy it for a while. We're going to stay all the way up there. All right. This is, you got it from the coach here. Now let's go back to Barry Landers and Harrison Boozer for a final word. Okay. All right. As you can hear, it's a wild scene here as they shout Rutgers Cup, Rutgers Cup, M. Number one for uh, Division One, uh, they earned the victory with a great come from behind triumph. We understand that uh, the late word is that Bayshore was beating Comsawag by two touchdowns going into the fourth quarter. Bayshore, of course, has already lost this year, so maybe Walt Whitman has a chance. And fellas, who's number one in your mind? So on that note, Emerson Boozer, we wrap it up. A great football season as Walt Whitman comes away with a stunning 17 to 14 victory. It's just been an outstanding year for the Wildcats and Coach Joe Caridi. I mean, Rich Caridi. So I'm sure he's got to be elated from all the hard hours of work, the long days, the yelling, the screaming to put this thing all together. Ammon, and thanks to you for another splendid year. It'll wrap up our football coverage this year. Hope you enjoyed it. We've had some great college and high school games. For Emerson Boozer, Kyle Reuter, Glenn Goldberg, for Dougie, Greggy, Jan and Paul Fjordstad. This is Barry Landers wishing you a very pleasant good afternoon. The final score, it was Walt Whitman 17 and the very fine Sachem team 14. Cablevision's Long Island Sports Network is getting ready to bring you our third season of high school basketball. Here's just some of the great matchups we have scheduled for December. Elmont takes on... Let me see you get a meal, son. Who wants to get a meal?